Chapter 9 Stripped to the waist, sabres in our hands, we faced one another. Ahmed was a hulking brute. His body seamed with the scars of many such encounters. His reach considerably longer than mine. My only hope was to wear him out with my greater agility and defensive skill. Weeping, the girl cried out to me. The following is an excerpt from Letter Collection B. Dear Leah, I don't know whether you will ever receive this, but I must tell someone now, this instant. I must talk about him to someone. And there's no one here but Horus, and he's not a very sympathetic listener, especially considering we'd put him out of the room last night, and the Professor and Aunt Amelia haven't come back. And anyhow, I promised I'd wait for him so we can tell them together. It's been less than an hour since he left me. It seems like days. How did you bear those endless weeks and months when you and David were apart? Especially that awful time when you feared you would never be together. Do I sound completely insane? I am. Head over heels, madly, passionately. Perhaps writing it all down will clear my head. I hope you can read this. My hand is as unsteady as my heart. It was all Percy's doing. Isn't that strange? You'd never have supposed a man I detested as much as I did Percy could be responsible for making me so blissfully happy. I was alone in our sitting room yesterday afternoon when Percy came calling. Aunt Amelia and the professor were to spend the night in Cairo, she to indulge in friendly social intercourse at Shepherd's, and the professor to consult someone at the German Institute. And Ramses had gone to a tea to talk to Selim about some supplies the professor wanted. Percy didn't wait to be announced. He came straight up, with Fatima fluttering after him. A brisk knock was my only warning. When I saw him posing on the threshold, with poor Fatima behind him, expostulating with him and apologising to me, I was tempted to throw the inkpot at him. Why didn't I? Because I was a coward and a fool? A coward because I dreaded what Ramses would say if he ever learned I'd betrayed him? A fool because I believed Percy had some of the instincts of a gentleman? Whenever I'd happened to run into him, there'd been meaningful glances and little nods of understanding and a general air of mutual confidentiality. Rather sickening and worrisome, but not threatening. I didn't believe Percy would really tell the truth and shame the devil, i.e. himself. That he would use the threat of self-exposure to blackmail me seemed too ludicrous to contemplate. So I told Fatima she could go and offered Percy a chair. With a sweeping gesture, he offered me a seat on the divan. He was dressed with that extra smartness that is all wrong somehow. No single detail can be faulted, but altogether they're a bit too much. I remained standing. I really am rather busy, Percy. What do you want? A goozy little chat. He smirked at me, and then I realised he was drunk. Not drunk enough to stagger or slur his words, just enough to weaken his brain even more. I dipped into my collection of clichés. You are not in fit condition to be in the company of a lady. A little Dutch courage, Percy mumbled. Don't be angry, Fred. I've kept my part of the bargain, haven't I? I don't recall striking a bargain. You'd better go before Ramses comes back. I expect him any moment. Another miscalculation on my part. But honestly, who would have supposed he'd be stupid enough to make the same mistake twice? He called Ramses several rude names and lunged for me. He had me wrapped in a clumsy but temporarily effective bear's hug before I could skip aside. I said irritably, let go of me. You don't mean that. All you high-spirited women are alike. What you really want is a man who can master you. I managed to avoid his clumsy attempts to kiss me while I got one arm free and shifted my weight onto my left foot. I was trying to decide what part of Percy to hit first when the sitting-room door opened. I'd lied to Percy. I hadn't expected Ramsay's back so soon. The sight of him paralysed me, and Percy managed to land a kiss on my mouth. The next thing I knew, there was a kind of soundless explosion. It lifted Percy clean off his feet and sent him flying over a chair and against the wall. I stumbled back and would have lost my balance if Ramsay's hadn't grabbed me by the collar. Then I took a good look at his face. 
I threw myself against him and hung on with both hands. For a second or two, I was afraid he was too furious to care about hurting me. Then the fingers that had gripped my ribs relaxed, and he said, Get up and get out. I don't know how much longer I can hang on here. I didn't know how much longer I could hang on. That cool voice hadn't deceived me. I got a tighter grip on his shirt and leaned hard against him. I didn't dare raise even my head, which was pressed against his shoulder. I had the feeling that if I relaxed the slightest little bit, he'd move me aside as impersonally and efficiently as if I were a piece of furniture. And then what he would do to Percy, I didn't dare think. I could hear Percy wheezing and groaning, but he wasn't much hurt. When he finally moved, it was at a trot. His footsteps faded into silence. Ramses lifted me off my feet, and his... I was standing on them. Holding me in one arm, he walked to the door and slammed it. Unhand me, he said. Don't bother pretending you're about to faint. You've ripped my shirt, and I think those sharp points in my neck are your teeth. Put me down, then. Oh, sorry. He lowered me to the floor. No, you aren't. I raised my head and examined his throat. No blood. Would you care to try again? Stop it! I put my hands on his shoulders and tried to shake him. Can't you admit for once in your life that you're a human being with human emotions? You wanted to kill him. You would have killed him. I had to prevent you the best way I could. Why? The question took my breath away. I fumbled with my feelings like a clumsy-handed servant rummaging in a bureau drawer. When I understood, or thought I understood, I stepped back and swung at him. My wrist smacked into his raised hand. I suppose that can be taken as a reply. His eyes moved from my face to my throat. My shirt was open almost to the waist. I hadn't noticed. Did Percy do that? he asked. You did, I think, when you pulled us apart. It might have been true. Sorry. Please don't. Apologize. He raised his eyebrows and curled the corners of his mouth. Whatever you say. You appear a trifle agitated still. Sit down. I'll get you a glass of brandy. Not yet. I mean, I couldn't stand to look at him. That travesty of a smile turned me cold. I pulled the edges of my shirt together. I'm going to change. Will you stay here? Don't go away. I'll be here. He crossed to the window and stood with his back to me. You know how your eyes can deceive you at times? How a group of shapes and shadows can take on a certain form and then shift into another? It wasn't really like that. There was no physical change in him. He was exactly the same as he'd always been. I knew every line of his long body and every curl on his dishevelled black head. I'd just never seen him before. You know what I'm trying to say, don't you? The changes in the heart. I must have made some sound. A gasp, a wordless breath. He spun round, and there it was again. The features I knew better than I do my own were the same. But now I saw the tenderness those stubbornly set lips tried to hide and the refined modelling of temples and cheekbones and his eyes, wide open and unguarded for once, all his defences down. He stood quite still for a few seconds, watching me. Then he held out his hand. Come here, he said. I couldn't move. I felt as if I were standing on my head instead of my feet. The world had turned inside out and upside down. It's too late, you know, he said, in the same muted voice. Too late for me, whatever you decide. Can you at least meet me halfway? I don't remember any interval between that rather heartbreaking question and the moment when his arms pressed me close and his lips settled onto mine. Why hadn't I known? How could I have been so stupid? Why didn't someone tell me? 
He laughed at me when I said that. I love to see him laugh, Leah. His whole face changes. His eyes light up and his mouth softens and... I told you I was head over heels. Not until Fatima scratched at the door and asked when we wanted dinner did I realise how much time had passed. We were sitting in the dark. He kissed me again and put me gently away. I I'll tell her ten minutes. Will that be time enough? Yes. No. Tell her... Tell her we don't want dinner. Tell her to go away. I stopped writing because I heard Nama bark and hoped, but it wasn't he. I can't stay here any longer. I'm going out to wait for him at the door. A few steps closer, a few seconds sooner. I'll pop this in an envelope and leave it on the table with the rest of the mail. I hope you don't think I broke off at that interesting moment for literary effect, or because I was ashamed to admit what happened. I'm not ashamed. I didn't know it was possible to be so happy. Unless you are already on board ship, you will miss the wedding. I won't wait an extra day, even for you, my dearest friend. Not that I care about the conventions, but the professor would be scandalised, and Aunt Amelia would lecture. They don't understand. There's a different world. And my poor darling is so in awe of them, he might lock himself in his room and refuse to open the door. Then I'd have to climb in the window. I would, too, to be with him. Thank goodness I had Ibrahim hinge the screens. He couldn't help himself last night. It was all my doing. Mostly my doing. When I remember, I feel as if my bones are melting. That's not the only reason I love him so much, Leah. He pretends to despise the gentleman's code of his class. But he is everything they claim to be and seldom are. Gentle and strong and brave and honourable. Thus ends this excerpt from Letter Collection B. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses didn't need to ask Ali who the visitor was. The horse was sweating and showing the whites of his eyes. Percy's horses always looked as if they'd been ridden hard and handled clumsily. He delayed only long enough to tell the stablewoman to water it and rub it down. There was no one in the courtyard. He was almost running when he turned down the corridor toward their rooms. Even as a child, there'd been something about Percy that made his skin crawl with an emotion stronger than dislike and stranger than detestation. What he had learned about his cousin a few weeks ago made the very idea of his being alone with Nefret unendurable. He didn't doubt she could take care of herself, but when he saw her in Percy's clumsy grasp... Pure murderous rage drove every other thought and sensation out of his mind. It felt wonderful. The pressure of her body against his and the fingernails digging into his skin brought him back to his senses. Her face was ashen. Slowly and carefully he removed his hands from her waist. He hoped he hadn't hurt her. He hadn't meant to. Percy had hit the wall with enough force to knock several photographs from a nearby shelf and was now on his knees, clutching his midsection. A few carefully chosen words got him to his feet and out the door. He had better sense than to speak, but the look he gave Ramses was fairly eloquent. Well, they made quite a pretty picture, Ramses thought. The fainting girl clinging to her rescuer, her golden head against his breast, his manly arm supporting her. Percy was probably in no condition to notice that the arm around her waist was not embracing but lifting her. She was standing on his feet. She had accomplished what she meant to do, anyhow. He hadn't broken Percy's neck. That was probably a good thing. She knew he was inclined to get himself worked up about killing people, and murdering a member of the family would have been unpleasant for everyone concerned. It had been kind of her. Now, if she would only go away and stop talking and stop touching him and give him a chance to get himself under control. She said she didn't want any brandy. She asked him to wait while she changed. Her hair was coming down and her lips were trembling and her dress was torn. Another wave of murderous fury darkened his vision and he went to the window, unable to look at her. 
Then he heard an odd little sound, half squeak, half sob, and turned. When he saw her face, his breath stopped. There was no mistaking that look. He had waited long enough to see it. He knew that if he went to her then, she would come unresisting into his arms, but he forced himself to hold back. One more step, the last, must be hers. Her choice, her desire as great as his. When finally she moved, it was in a stumbling rush. They met halfway. In the still darkness before sunrise, as she lay in his arms, he felt a drop of moisture on his shoulder and asked why she was crying. I feel like Sinye. He laughed a little and drew her closer. Not to me, you don't. A breath of answering laughter warmed his skin. You know what I mean? I think I do. But I'd like to hear you say it. Like an exile who has finally come home. She slept then. But he lay awake, holding her, until the dawn light strengthened, and she stirred and smiled. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. When Emerson and I returned to the house that morning, they were waiting outside the door, an old man and a veiled woman holding a small, very dirty child. I took the woman for one of Nefret's pathetic charges. She was decently covered with a threadbare dark blue taube, outer robe, without which no woman of any class would have dared appear in public, but the black eyes visible over the veil were heavily rimmed with coal, and the cheap ornaments dangling from face and head veils betrayed her profession. The man, whose dusty grey beard reeked with scented oil, wore a silk caftan, striped in gaudy colours and girdled with a coloured shawl. Either they'd not had the courage to ask for Nefret, or Ali had refused to let them in, for which one could hardly blame him. I was about to speak to the woman when Emerson addressed the old man by name. How dare you dirty my doorstep, Ahmed Kalan? You know where the clinic is? Take her there. The woman shrank back. The old man caught her by the arm. No, father of curses, no. And do not send me to the kitchen as if I were a servant. I come as a friend to spare you. <laughs> said Emerson. You vile, contemptible old... Words failed him. In fact, I was sure they did not, for they seldom did, but the words he would like to have employed were too inflammatory for my ears, much less those of an innocent child. For all his bravado, Kalan was not willing to risk the wrath of the father of curses. With a muttered oath, he snatched at the child, whose face was hidden against the woman's shoulder. She clung desperately to her mother, for so I assumed the woman to be, but Kalan's claw-like hands pulled her away and held her up so we could see her face. Her skin was brown, her curly hair black, her features rather delicate, and, at the moment, almost witless with fear. She was a typical Egyptian child, except for one thing. See, si, see, si, Kalan gabbled. Good Lord, Emerson gasped. He looked at me. Peabody, what? Though I was shaken to the core, I am accustomed to react quickly in a crisis. This was unquestionably a crisis. I said, we cannot pursue this matter in the open street. Bring them in at once. Ali, open the door. Kalan's face split into a gargoyle grin. He thrust the child back into her mother's arms and strutted after me. Fatima, who was in the courtyard, let out a cry of protest at the sight of the trio. Sit, Hakim. Where are you taking them, Sit? If it is Nurmi Sur they want, she is here. She wishes to see you and the father of curses. Is Ramses here? Emerson asked. Aywa, he came just before you and went with Nurmi Sur to his room. Do you wish? Not now, Fatima, I said and closed the sitting-room door, almost in the poor woman's face. 
Callan selected the most comfortable chair, lowered himself into it, and smiled insolently at me. He was in control now, and he knew it. He gestured brusquely at the woman, who came to him cringing like a dog who expects a beating. Her veil had been pulled away by the child's frantic grasp. She was younger than I had realized. Even younger than she looked, perhaps. For the life she led ages a woman quickly. Sit down, my dear, said Emerson to me. He was holding himself in such rigid control, I trembled for his health. Before he could say more, the door of the sitting room opened. Nefret did not bother to knock. She seldom did, and she had no reason now to believe we did not wish to be disturbed. She was holding Ramses by the hand, tugging at him as she did when she was excited about something she wanted us to share. They were both smiling. The old man pulled the child roughly from her mother and stood her on her feet, holding her so that she faced Ramses. Salam alaikum, brother of demons. See, I have brought your daughter. Do you accept her? Ramses shook his head. No, he said hoarsely. His face gave him the lie. The colour had drained from it, leaving it white under his heavy tan. The little girl slipped out of the old man's grasp and ran toward Ramses, holding out her arms and calling to him in a high, quavering voice. She was too small to talk plainly. I understood only one word. It was the Arabic word for father. His involuntary recoil stopped her as brutally as a blow might have done. She spread dimpled, dirty hands over her face and crouched down like a threatened animal trying to make itself smaller. But before the child hid them, Nefret had seen what we had seen earlier— Wide, dark grey eyes of an unusual shade and shape, the exact shade and shape as mine. Until that moment, Nefret had not moved or spoken. The sound that came from her parted lips was wordless, a sharp cry like that of a wounded animal. Her blazing blue eyes shifted, first to the woman in her shabby garments, then back to the child. She did not let go of Ramsay's hand, she flung it from her and ran, stumbling from the room. Nefret, wait! Ramsay started to turn. The child must have been watching him between her fingers. She let out a little whimper. I am not a maternal woman, but I could bear it no longer. I would have leapt to my feet if Emerson's hand hadn't held me back. His unblinking eyes were fixed on Ramsay's. The old man cackled with laughter. You see? You say no, but who will believe you if they see her face? For a price, a very small price, I will find a home for her among her own people, where she will be loved and desired, and hidden forever from the eyes of Inglisi. Perhaps the child did not understand the unspeakable promise in the leering voice, I prayed she hadn't, but it was clear to the rest of us. I had thought Ramses could go no whiter, but I was wrong. He dropped to one knee and took the child's hands in his. His voice was steadier than mine would have been. Don't cry, little bird. There is nothing to be afraid of. I won't let him have you. She threw her arms round his neck and buried her face against his shoulder. Holding her, he rose to his feet. I claim her, he said formally. She is mine. Get out, Callan, while you are able. Callan licked his lips. What are you saying? Do you know what you're saying? You have dishonored this woman, who is my... Uh, my poor daughter. Give me money, and I will... No, Emerson said gently. I think if you start now and move very quickly, you may make it out of the room before I lose my temper. The old villain knew that purring voice. He scuttled toward the door, giving Ramses a wide berth. The woman crept after him. She did not look at Ramses, nor he at her. After they'd gone, Ramses said, Excuse me, mother and father. 
I will be back shortly. He went out, carrying the child, who clung to him like a little monkey. Emerson sat down next to me, took my hand, and patted it. But neither of us spoke until Ramsay's returned. I left her with Fatima, but I promised I would return in time to watch over her during the terrors of the bath, he explained. What do you want to know? She is not yours, Emerson said. No. Then who? I did not finish the question. There was only one other man in Egypt through whom the child could have inherited my father's eyes. Perhaps he does not know, I went on. Should we not tell him? Ramses dropped into a chair and reached for a cigarette. He has no legal responsibility. Do you suppose he would admit any other kind? Hmm, Emerson said. Peabody, my dear, let me get you a whiskey and soda. No, it's too early. But I might try one of those cigarettes. They are calming to the nerves, I've heard. Ramses raised his eyebrows, but he provided the cigarette and lit it for me. It provided a distraction, at least. By the time I had got the hang of the business and had stopped coughing, I was ready to hear Ramsay's explanation. She approached me one day in the souk, tugging at my coat and asking for bakshish. When I looked down at her, I saw... You saw it too. Something of a shock, wasn't it? Once I had recovered, I asked her to take me to her house. She thought I wanted... His even voice caught. Then he went on. Her mother was under the same impression. After I disabused her of the notion, we talked. She claimed not to know who the father was. She may have been telling the truth. Her clients don't often bother introducing themselves by name. Dear God, I whispered. God has nothing to do with it, said Ramses, offering me another cigarette. The place was unspeakable, a single room ankle-deep in refuse, swarming with flies and other vermin. I couldn't leave her there. I moved them to more salubrious surroundings and paid Rashida a sum of money each week on condition that she uh, retire. I got in the habit of dropping by from time to time in order to make certain she kept her promise. When Senia began calling me father, I didn't have the heart to stop her. The other children with whom she played had fathers, she knew the word, and she was too young to understand, and... You became fond of her, I said. I am not entirely impervious to the softer emotions, Mother. After she had learned to trust me, there were times when she would gesture or laugh in a way that reminded me of... of someone else. He smiled at me, and his face was so young and vulnerable I wanted to cry. Why didn't you tell us? I demanded. Should I come running to my mother with every difficulty? Oh, I would have told you eventually. But you had enough to worry about, and this was no more your responsibility than it was mine. It would have been strange if he had acted otherwise, I thought. He had never been in the habit of asking for help. I wonder how Callan comes into this, Emerson said thoughtfully. He is no more Senia's grandfather than you are. Ramses said. You know what he is. But he is a crafty old swine, and he set the stage well. Those rags she was wearing had been supplied in place of the clothes I'd got for her, and I haven't seen her so filthy for weeks. As for what he hoped to gain by this... Money, of course, I said. No doubt he assumed we would want the business kept quiet. Though how anyone... Even a vile creature like Kalan could suppose we would abandon that child, any child, to... It's all right, my love, Emerson said, taking my hand. Ramses put out his cigarette and stood up. I must get back. She was trying not to cry, but I could tell she was frightened. I will come with you, I said. The presence of a woman may reassure the poor little thing. Ramses looked at his father, who said quickly... Where has Nefret got to? She is wonderful with children, and she will want to apologise for misjudging you when she learns the truth. You didn't know the truth either, Ramses said. His face had hardened, and there was a note in his voice that was new to me. But you had enough faith in me to believe, 
even before I explained that I was not a liar or a coward or a... Thank you for that. It means a great deal to me. He strode out of the room without waiting for a reply. Oh, dear, I said. Emerson, go to Nefret. She'll be glad to learn she was mistaken and anxious to make it up to him. I hastened to the bath chamber, from which I could hear cries of distress. Fatima had given it up. She stood watching with a broad grin while Ramses tried in vain to persuade the child to let him put her into the bath. Water dripped from his chin and made dark patches on his clothing. She has been bathed before, he explained defensively. It must be the size of the tub that frightens her. Now, little bird, it is only water. See, I will just lower your feet. No? No. He wiped his face on his sleeve. Mother, have you any ideas? Now, what is this? Emerson stood in the doorway, his hands on his hips, looking sternly at us. What a roaring! Is there a lion here? Where is it? Where is it hiding? He began opening cupboard doors and throwing towels out onto the floor, while the child watched him in wide-eyed fascination. It is absolutely unaccountable to me why small children respond to men like Emerson. One would suppose a voice as deep as his and a form as large as his would frighten them into fits. Before long, she was giggling as he tore the bathroom apart, looking for the imaginary lion. But it was to Ramses she turned when the actual moment of immersion arrived. With my assistance, Emerson pursued the lion out of the room and closed the door to prevent it from returning. My darling girl, he said, and took me in his arms. I'm not going to cry, Emerson. You know I'm not at all a sentimental person. It was just seeing how gentle he was with her and how she clung to him. Oh, dear. Emerson reached into his pocket and pulled out his handkerchief. He looked so surprised and pleased at actually finding it where it was supposed to be that we both started to laugh, a bit damply in my case. Well, well, said Emerson. We'll find room for the little thing, won't we? She'll be no trouble. I fancied she would be considerable trouble. All small children are. But I said, of course, Emerson. You know, don't you, that the old fiend's threats were right on the mark. No one will believe she is not Ramsay's child, no matter how we deny it. Why the devil should we deny anything? Emerson demanded. His chin jutted out. We know the truth. They say, who says? Let them say. That's all very well, Emerson, but this is not going to do Ramsay's reputation any good. It has already suffered unfairly. Some men might take pride in that kind of reputation. That is unfortunately correct, but our son is not one of them. He won't show it. He never does. But this suspicion will hurt him deeply. And the fret will... Where is she? Did you look for her? Not yet. Shall we do so now? Nefret was gone. We were in her sitting room reading the message she had left when Ramses joined us. She says she has gone to stay with friends for a few days, I reported. She must mean the Vanagelts. Ramses, don't be angry with her. If she'd had time to think, she would have known better, but it came as such a shock. Won't you go after her? Ramses stared at the note, which he was twisting in his fingers. Go after her, he repeated. Good God! What is it? Emerson demanded. I ought to have realised. Go after her. Yes, I must. I hope it's not already too late. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. The house to which he had moved Rashida and the child was in Mahadi, some distance away from Rashida's old haunts, and he hoped from a convenient supplier of hashish. It had been one of the way stations he and David had used when they were prowling the souks in various exotic disguises for various illegal purposes. They'd been very young at the time, 
but that was probably no excuse for some of their activities. The old woman who owned the place, thanks in part to his subsidies, was elderly and half-blind, and she'd been profoundly disinterested in their comings and goings. She was kind, though, in her vague way, and he had been paying her an additional small sum to make sure the child was properly looked after. Rashida's maternal instincts had been somewhat warped by her experiences. In her own way, she was passionately attached to her daughter. But she couldn't always be depended upon to do the things he wanted her to do. He had known that sooner or later he would have to introduce Senia to his mother. And he had thought she'd be more likely to accept the child if the little creature could be got used to bathing and wearing clothes and certain modifications of her table manners. Once again, he had underestimated his mother. He ought to have known she'd come through, for the child and for him. The old woman was squatting on a bench outside the door of the house, blinking in the sunlight. She told him Rashida and the child had left early that morning and had not been back. Certainly he could look at their rooms. He was paying for them, wasn't he? Rashida had not been much of a housekeeper, but one look at the room in which they slept told him that this disorder was significant. She hadn't meant to come back. The carved box in which she kept her few treasures was gone, and so were the pots of coal and lip paint and henna. Lying across the bed was a crumpled bit of bright pink cloth, one of the little dresses he had bought the child. He picked it up and smoothed it between his hands. No doubt he'd been a fool to believe Rashida's protestations of gratitude and reformation, but she had seemed so glad to be free of the life she led, even gladder that there was a way out for her daughter. He finished searching the room, half buried in the ashes of the brazier, were a few brown stubs of cigarettes with a faint, unmistakable smell. He waited for an hour, pacing the floor in growing worry and impatience, even as he told himself there was no basis for his fears. Kalan was one of the most notorious pimps in Cairo. He could have tracked the girl down and forced her to come back to him, with no ulterior motive except pour l'encourager les autres. She'd have admitted everything to him. She had been in his power too long to resist his demands or the drugs from which she had been cut off. The idea of blackmailing her protector would come readily to Kalan's pragmatically filthy mind. She might even have agreed to go with him in the hope that the Inglisi would save her child. Ramses wanted to believe that. If that were the case, he would get her back and put an end to Kalan's activities by one means or another. It was his fault she had fallen back into Kalan's hands. If he hadn't been so stubborn, he would have told his parents the truth immediately, and this disaster would never have happened. It was the most likely possibility. The only consolation, and a feeble one it was, was that if his worst suspicions were right, there was no way he could have anticipated this. No way of proving anything, either, unless he could find her before... He could only think of one other place in which to look. By the time he reached Cairo, it was early in the afternoon. The reeking alleys of El Wassa steamed in the heat, and most people were within. The hovel from which he had removed them was occupied by two other women. They took him for a customer at first. The terms in which he corrected that assumption made them cringe into a corner and he had to waste more time reassuring them. They denied any knowledge of Rashida. The sun was setting before he admitted to himself that the search was futile. He might not have abandoned it even then, had it not belatedly occurred to him that he had another responsibility. His first indication of the correctness of that assumption came from Ali the doorman. He was standing outside in the road, looking anxiously up and down, and when he saw Ramses, he came running toward him, white puffs of dust spurting up under his sandaled feet. Allah be praised, you are here. Hurry, hurry. He knew Ali well enough to know that the emergency was not dire, but he was not entirely prepared for what he found when he entered the courtyard, followed by the howls of Nama. His mother, his father, and Fatima were there. His mother was clutching a glass of whiskey. On his father's knee was a small bundle wrapped in tweed. The face atop the bundle consisted of a mop of black hair, a fist, and a pair of enormous eyes, 
grey as storm clouds. Thank God, his father exclaimed. Don't swear, his mother muttered. That was not swearing, that was a prayer from the heart. See, Emerson went on in Arabic, did I not tell you he would come back? I do not tell lies, he is here. She wouldn't go to bed, his mother said. He had never heard her sound so helpless. We had to wrap her in your coat before she would stop crying. Ramses, do something. Ramses felt a sudden insane desire to laugh. He was afraid. He was worried sick. He didn't dare think about quite a number of things, but he felt better somehow. The bundle wriggled and an arm appeared, reaching for him. I can't touch you until I wash, Ramses said, remembering where he had been that day. She took her thumb out of her mouth and said something. What? Oh, wash. Yes, of course. Right back, he added. There wasn't time for a bath. The situation was obviously desperate, so he had to settle for washing hands and arms and face and exchanging his European clothing for a galabille. When he came back, she squirmed out of the coat and off his father's knee and ran to him. The little brown body was bare except for a cloth wrapped round her hips. Ramses picked her up, wondering what she made of that item of clothing. Children of the poorer classes just squatted wherever they happened to be. Her face and body were unmarked, except by the scratches and bumps a small child might normally acquire. He'd made sure of that when Fatima bathed her. He wrapped the coat round her and held her till she settled into the curve of his arm and put her thumb back in her mouth. It is time to sleep, he said. You're safe now. Sometimes I must go away, but I will always come back. And when I am not here, they will watch over you. Do you know who they are? They are my mother and my father. We must obey them. His mother coughed. And, Ramses said hurriedly, they are mighty magicians. Now that they are your friends, no one can hurt you. Fatima is your friend, too. Go with Fatima. Fatima held out her arms, and this time she went, unprotesting, her eyes already half-closed. I'm sorry, Ramses said, not quite sincerely. He was absurdly pleased that she had wanted him. Ah, said his father. She seems to have inherited another family characteristic, stubbornness. What about a whiskey, my boy? You look as if you could use it. Where have you been all this time? Wasn't Nefret with the Vandergilts? Nefret, Ramses repeated. The only positive feature of the afternoon's frantic search had been the fact that it kept him from thinking about Nefret. He didn't want to think about her. It hurt too much. I wasn't looking for Nefret. Ah, said his father. He reached for his pipe. Did you find... Uh, what is her name? Rashida. No, I didn't find her. His mother put her glass down on the table. She had drunk every drop, but her chin was firm and her shoulders were squared. It has been, she said, quite a day. I apologise for failing to realise that the welfare of that unfortunate girl ought to have concerned me. One cannot blame her for not contradicting the old villain's lies... A woman in her position cannot afford the luxury of morality. Well put, Peabody, said Emerson, his face softening. We'll find her, Ramses, and I will personally dismember Kalan and hang bits of his anatomy all around El Wassa. I wish I could do the same to every procurer in Cairo, but so long as there are men contemptible enough to use those women, there will be other men exploiting them. She is probably in hiding, you know. It may take a while to locate her. Where did you look? Fatima had come down the stairs. She gave Ramses a smile and a reassuring nod, and then glided around the courtyard, lighting the lamps. The crimson and orange of hibiscus blooms and the green of their leaves shone in the mellow light. The contrast between the quiet, murmurous beauty of this house and the places he had seen that afternoon was almost too much to bear. All at once he was so tired... He could hardly keep his eyes open. The rooms I had taken for them are in the Mahdi, he mumbled. She hadn't been there. 
I waited for over an hour. The old woman who owns the house promised she would send to me if Rashida came back. Then I went to the house where she'd lived before. How long has it been since you've eaten? his mother demanded. You've had no lunch, at least not here, and I don't suppose you had sense enough to think of it. I don't remember. Fatima, please tell Cook to get dinner on the table. Yes, it, it is ready. His mother was right. She always was. The hot soup revived him, and by the time they reached the main course, he was almost back to normal. What about Nefret's clinic? his mother asked. They were still discussing ways of tracing Rashida. Had she ever been there? No, Ramsay said. She knew of it, but said Kalan had forbidden his girls to go there. I am at somewhat of a loss as to where to look next. He will probably keep her hidden for a while, his father said. Hell and damnation! I should have strangled the old buzzard this morning when I had the chance. Never mind. We'll track him down, and he will tell us what he's done with her. I hope so, Ramsay said. What are you worrying about? his mother asked. One hates to think of her in the power of such a man, but she and many others have been in that position before. Do you believe you will harm her? It was a waste of time trying to spare his mother. I think she might be in danger, he admitted. Fatima let out a hiss of distress. Since her trip to England, she had become emancipated to the extent of not veiling herself in the presence of his father or himself. She was now part of the family, after all, and her plump, pleasant face was lined with worry. He patted the brown hand that was reaching for his plate. It will be all right, Fatima. She is a bad woman, Fatima murmured. But she is very young, Ramesses. It had taken him a long time to persuade her to use his name. She didn't do it often, and when she did, she pronounced it not as the others did, but with an odd accent. When he was in a fanciful mood, he wondered whether that was how the name had sounded in the 13th century B.C. She is not a bad woman, Fatima, only unlucky and unhappy and very young. She wouldn't have done this of her own accord, he went on. She hadn't the guile or the malice even to think of such a thing. Someone made her do it, someone she feared more than she trusted me. Agreed, Emerson nodded. When you went to her house that day, Kalan found out about it. He would, of course. The seeds of the idea must have been planted then, and he saw the opportunity for a spot of blackmail. No good deed ever goes unpunished, my boy. Never forget that. Good gad! Kalan may even have taught the little creature to call you father. Someone may have done. You are worrying unnecessarily, I believe, his mother said. Kalan didn't get the money he expected from us, but he has no reason to be angry with her. She did as he asked. Why should he destroy a valuable piece of merchandise? Ramses pushed his half-filled plate away. His parents were watching him anxiously, their faces warm with concern. If he told them what he feared, they would think he had lost his mind. Maybe he had. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. The following day brought one piece of good news, a telegram from David announcing their arrival on Wednesday next. Emerson and I were at the breakfast table when Ali delivered the cable. Although I had applied myself with my usual efficiency to the innumerable alterations in our schedule necessitated by the events of the previous day, there were still a few matters to be settled. Ramses had not yet joined us. I knew where he was. Immediately upon arising, I had gone to see how our small charge had spent the night, and had found her awake and demanding her abu. We will have to break her of that, I said to Fatima, who had taken the child to sleep with her. What is she to call him, though? Fatima had no opinion on the subject. She had a number of opinions on other matters relating to the child, however, and we were discussing them when Ramses joined us. I left the three together and went down to breakfast. Emerson, already at table and drinking his coffee, was by then sufficiently aroused to be in a querulous mood. 
What are they all doing up there? he demanded. I thought you would bring her down with you. She'll be hungry. Where is Ramses? Patiently, I explained that no child of two, whatever its nationality, is a pleasant table companion, reminded him that Ramses had not been allowed to take meals with us until he was six, pointed out that the little girl had nothing to wear, and added that Fatima would make certain she had a suitable breakfast. The advent of Ali with the telegram distracted Emerson from the complaints he had undoubtedly been about to make. Finally! he exclaimed. They've been long enough about it. Now we can get some work done. I want to leave for the site as soon as possible. Finish your breakfast, Peabody. I don't see how I can come with you today, Emerson, I said. I must do a bit of shopping. The child hasn't a stitch to her name, or a proper child's cot, or a hairbrush, or anything she needs. We must fit up a room as a nursery and find a nursemaid. Fatima cannot look after her and carry out her other duties. Now I must also make certain that Dahabia is ready for Leah and David. I cannot take Fatima with me since the child is getting comfortable with her. So don't tell me about it, Peabody, Emerson growled. Ah, here is Ramses. All right, are you, my boy? He looked as if he hadn't slept a wink. I handed him the telegram and had the pleasure of seeing his haggard face brighten. It will be good to see them, he said. It will be good to have them on the dig said Emerson. All those interruptions have wreaked havoc with my schedule. Yesterday was a total loss, and your mother is planning to waste the entire day in Cairo, and Nefret is off somewhere, and I trust you have no other plans, Ramses. No, sir. Ramses said no more. Emerson's brow furrowed, not with annoyance, but with paternal anxiety. He knew better than to express it. Instead, he attempted a diversion. I have a new plan, he announced. I said nothing. Ramsay said, Yes, sir, in the same polite, disinterested voice. If Vandergilt's idea is right, someone is trying to keep us away from the site. That means, it must mean, that there is something at Zawayat El Arian this chap doesn't want us to find. So, said Emerson triumphantly, we will find it not by random digging or concocting baseless theories, but by methodical excavation that will sweep the site from side to side and top to bottom. Well, what do you say? It will be a long job, Ramsay said. He looked a little more alert, though. We'll hire as many men as we can use. With the four of us, and David and Leah, and Selim and Daoud, there will be ample supervision. Excellent, Emerson, I said frowning at the list I had made out, and adding another item. Emerson looked over my shoulder and read the words aloud. Small in narrow bath. Hmm. The trouble with your mother, Ramses, is that she has no maternal instincts to speak of. I did not mind being the butt of Emerson's little joke, for it actually brought a smile to Ramses's face. Emerson popped a last bit of toast into his mouth and left the room, beckoning Ramses to follow. Ramses paused by my chair, bent his tall frame, and gave me a quick, clumsy kiss on the cheek. In fact, it landed on my ear, but it was meant for my cheek, I believe. When I turned toward him, he stepped back, looking embarrassed. "'Watch over your father,' I said in a low voice. Unobtrusively, of course. He is superbly indifferent to his own safety. But the plan he has proposed is likely to be dangerous. "'I know.' I'll do my best, mother. And look after yourself. Be careful. Don't take foolish chances. Yes, mother. Thank you, mother. Ramses? Yes, mother. Don't worry about Nefred. I will stop by the Vandergelts and fetch her home. I'm not worrying about her, Ramses said. She is a free agent and will do as she likes. I was a trifle put out with Nefred myself. We all sympathised with her feelings on the subject of men who consorted with the unfortunate women she was trying to help, but in my opinion, her behaviour had been somewhat theatrical. No doubt she'd already had time to reconsider and feel ashamed of herself for jumping to conclusions about her brother. I had no objection to making her feel a bit more ashamed. By stopping to see the Vandergelts, I could kill two birds with one stone, since I was anxious to apprise them of the situation. 
Cyrus had caused the Valley of the Kings to be brought to the dock near Giza. It was only a short walk, but I accepted Ali's offer to get me a cab, since I meant to take Catherine and Nefret on to Cairo with me. We would have a pleasant morning shopping for the child and then return for luncheon at the house. Cyrus could meet us there or go to the site. I got it all worked out during the five-minute drive to the dock. One of the ferries was just unloading, so I had to make my way through a throng of tourists to the southern section where the Dahabia was moored. One of the crewmen, lounging in the bow, saw me coming and, of course, recognised me immediately. He hastened to run out the gangplank and emitted a shout that brought Cyrus on deck. "'Why, say now, I didn't expect to see you so early,' he exclaimed. "'Figured you'd be on your way to Zawiat. "'I hope I am not to true, Cyrus.' "'You could never be that, Amelia. Come and have coffee. We're just finishing breakfast.' Cyrus lived in princely style. The table was set with crystal and silver, and every appointment was of the best. Golden damask draperies had been pulled back from the long windows of the salon, admitting a flood of sunlight that brought out the beautiful colours of the Persian rugs covering the floor. Catherine jumped up from her chair and embraced me. "'How lovely to see you, Amelia. We intended to come by this evening, since we hadn't heard from you for several days.' "'We've been somewhat preoccupied, Catherine. "'No doubt Nefret told you what happened yesterday. "'Where is she?' "'Why, Amelia, I've no idea.' "'Catherine's smile faded. "'Why did you think she was here? "'What happened?' "'Oh, dear,' I said, "'feeling as if the breath had been knocked out of me. "'You haven't seen her?' "'Now calm down, my dears,' Cyrus said, "'in his slow, soothing drawl. Let's just figure out what the situation is, and then we'll know what to do about it. First things first. Did Miss Nefret say she was coming to us, Amelia? No. No, what she said, wrote, rather, was that she was going to spend a few days with friends. I assumed. Sure you would. But we're not her only friends. Maybe a young thing like that would rather be with folks her own age. This was yesterday? Mm-hmm. Well, we'll track her down. Don't you worry. Now, tell us what happened. As Cyrus later confessed, he expected the usual disasters you folks get into. He listened with friendly interest and occasional ejaculations of surprise, but when I had finished my tale, he inquired, Nobody dead, wounded, or kidnapped? Well, that's a pleasant surprise. I am relieved it's not serious. Catherine, being a woman, came closer to understanding. I am so sorry, dear Amelia. Sorry for Ramses, too. In wishing to spare you, he only made things worse. But he thought he was acting for the best. Spare me what? Do not suppose for one moment, Catherine, that I doubt his word. He is incapable of doing such a thing. And if he had, which he never would, he would shoulder the responsibility like a man. He nobly and generously came to the rescue of that innocent child. And now, I added bitterly, while Catherine made conciliatory noises and Cyrus patted my shoulder, now he will suffer for it. If you suspect him... My dear, I don't. You misunderstood. Ramses would no more do such a thing than, than Cyrus. You think that nephew of yours is the child's father? He must be. Wait till you see her, Catherine. The resemblance is astonishing. Catherine had poured coffee for me. I took a sip. Excellent coffee, I said. I am on my way to Cairo, Catherine, to get some things for the child. I thought you might like to join me. Cyrus Emerson has gone with Ramses to Zawiat. He has concluded your idea was correct, and he is determined to clear the site to bedrock. If that isn't just like Emerson, Cyrus exclaimed, Tell him there's a rattlesnake in the bushes, and he goes straight for it. I guess maybe I'd better get along over there and sit on a rock with a rifle. Cat, my dear, you going with Amelia? I would love to. It will be delightful buying things for a child again. How old is she, Amelia? We will discuss details on the way, I said, finishing my coffee. We will lunch in Cairo, I think. It is later than I realized. You will both dine with us this evening? We have much to talk about. We sure do, Cyrus muttered. I'll just get my coat and be on my way. 
and I will get my hat and handbag, said Catherine. She fixed her steady, compassionate green eyes on my face. Amelia, later, Catherine, you and I have much to talk about, too. Men are very well in their way, and even more useful than women in other ways, but they are simply incapable of comprehending certain things. The long ride into Cairo gave me a chance to converse privately with a woman on whose intelligent advice I relied. I hadn't realized how desperately I yearned to confide in a friend. By the time we reached the musky, I was hoarse from talking. I do apologize, Catherine, I remarked in some embarrassment. I hadn't meant to say so much. You could pay me no higher compliment, Amelia. You are my dearest friend. I owe my happiness to you. I only wish I could do more to help. It is hard to see one's children in trouble and be unable to relieve them. They are not children. They are young men and women, and must solve their own problems. I deplore Ramsay's unfortunate habit of reticence. He's always been like that, and probably always will be. But just between you and me, Catherine, I am very proud of him. It isn't a fret with whom I am vexed at the moment. Really, life was much simpler when I had only murderers and thieves to deal with. Men may jeer, and they do. But shopping does have a salutary effect. I'd never bought clothing for a little girl. Nefret had been thirteen when she came to us. It proved to be unexpectedly pleasurable. Catherine gently intervened once or twice, pointing out the impracticality of the garment I was considering, and mentioning certain practical items that hadn't occurred to me. We were loaded with parcels when we returned to the cab, and I had ordered a number of articles to be sent on. We took luncheon at Shepherd's. Catherine saw my eyes wandering. You're looking for Nefret, aren't you? Foolish of me, I confessed. It did occur to me, though, that she might have come here. She hasn't many friends, you know. She and Ramses and David have always been so self-sufficient. Too much so, perhaps. It would be a great relief to have Leah with us again. I know Nefret talks to her more confidentially than she does to me. That is only natural, Catherine said. Yes. So you aren't going to call on her friends this afternoon? It is too awkward, Catherine. How can I go round asking if they've seen her without admitting that she's run off and I don't know where the devil she is? Curse the girl. She has no business worrying us this way. Not that I am worried. Not at all. Gracious, look at the time. We still must stop by the Amelia. So we did, and found several of Fatima's nieces, including the much maligned Karima, already hard at work. A brief discussion with Karima convinced me there was little for me to do. I knew Fatima would insist upon inspecting the premises herself and adding the final touches, including rosebuds in the wash basin and dried petals between the sheets. Not even Emerson had dared object to these procedures. In fact, I rather think he liked them, though he would never have admitted it. I dropped Catherine off at the Valley of the Kings, since she wanted to bathe and change before coming on to us. Ramses and Emerson had not yet returned, but the house was full of people, all women. One of them was Dawood's wife, Khadijah. The others, sitting meekly in a row in the kitchen, appeared to be prospective nannies. It was as well the men were late, for they would undoubtedly have complained about the unnecessary fuss that ensued as I inspected and approved the quarters Fatima had selected for the child and her attendant, unloaded and unwrapped my purchases, interviewed nannies, and greeted Khadija. Khadija was a very large, very dark-complected, very silent woman. At least she was usually silent with me. Nefret insisted she had a wicked sense of humour and could tell extremely amusing stories. On her mother's side, Khadija was of Nubian blood. From the women of her mother's family, she had learned the recipe for a certain magical ointment, which she and Daoud smeared on everyone who required healing. Nefret had become a convert to its efficacy, so I had stopped objecting to it, though it turned the skin of the user a horrid shade of green. I do not believe that child had set a foot on the ground since I left... Khadija was carrying her when I got there, and was only persuaded to put her down when I insisted she try on some of the garments I had purchased. Senia did not want to wear a dress. 
The little slippers were rejected even more forcibly. The enamel bath was well received, however, since splashing quantities of water about the room is a favourite occupation of the young. And so were several inconsequential objects I had just happened to acquire. We, Khadija, Fatima, and I, and Basima, the proud winner of the contest for nursemaid, were sitting on the floor of the new nursery watching Senia play when we heard voices down below. The child had been listening. She made a beeline for the door. "'Catch her, Khadija! She is unclothed!' I exclaimed. Khadija's big, gentle hands intercepted the fugitive and held her fast. "'Now that you have come to live with the Inglisi, you must wear clothing,' she explained. "'Put on a pretty robe. You want him to be proud of you, don't you?' Ramses came straight up, as I had thought he would. Khadija's appeal had done the trick. We had barely time to get the anxious little creature into one of the new frocks before he appeared in the doorway. After he had admired the result, she insisted on showing him her new possessions one by one. Every frock, every bit of underclothing, every ribbon and toy had to be examined and approved. Ramses was dusty and sweat-stained, but the lines of weariness in his face smoothed out as she trotted back and forth, and when she dragged the doll onto his lap, he actually laughed. Mother, whatever possessed you, is almost as big as she is. None of them had dark hair, I said disapprovingly. It really is shameful. One would suppose flaxen curls and blue eyes are the only acceptable style of looks. Go in chains, Ramses. Now that you've made your presence known, I presume she will allow you to absent yourself for a time. After he'd slipped out, I had a few words with Fatima. She wanted to know how that worthless Karima was getting on with the cleaning of the Dahabiya, and assured me she would herself supervise the final arrangements. Realising that I could do with a bit of tidying myself, I betook myself to my room, where I found Emerson had finished his ablutions and gone to the courtyard. When I joined him, he immediately handed me a whiskey and soda and led me to a settee. We had a great deal to say to one another, but for some reason neither of us felt like talking. Emerson pulled up a hassock and lifted my slippered feet onto it. Then he sat down next to me and put his arm round me. Whatever difficulties lay ahead, and there were sure to be many of them, we would face them hand in hand, side by side, and back to back. I said as much to Emerson, who replied, You are mixing your metaphors again, Peabody, but the sentiment is one with which I am in complete accord. Vandergill told me Nefret was not with them. I take it you did not find her. You may take it that I did not look for her. I didn't know where to start. Emerson, there is not the slightest possibility that she can be in danger, is there? She certainly left of her own accord. Emerson took his pipe from his pocket. Ali the doorman said she had a small valise with her. He asked if she wanted a cab, but she said no. She set off on foot in the direction of the tram station. If she doesn't come home tonight, we will begin tracing her tomorrow. But I cannot believe she is in danger. At least, he added glumly, I wouldn't believe it if I could make any sense whatever of what is happening. The howls of Nama proclaimed the arrival of our friends. Catherine did not waste time. Did the frocks fit? How did she like the doll? May I see her? You women, Emerson growled. Is that all you can think of? Frocks and toys and babies? Um, suppose I just go and fetch her. I persuaded him to serve beverages to our guests instead, and before long, Ramses came down the stairs carrying the child. She was wearing one of the frocks I had bought, a nice little white garment with just a touch of broderie anglaise on the collar, and the red leather slippers. At the sight of so many people, she burrowed into Ramses's shoulder. I went to sit with Catherine and Cyrus, who had tactfully withdrawn some little distance, leaving Emerson to make a complete idiot of himself as he tried to persuade Senia to talk to him. The deep rumble of his voice blended oddly with her brief, high-pitched replies. She really did sound like a little bird. 
At least she condescended to perch on Emerson's knee while he fed her bits of biscuit. It wasn't until that moment that Catherine got a good look at her face. She sucked in her breath. I begin to understand, Nefret, she whispered. The resemblance is uncanny, Amelia. She even has your chin. I fear she will one day, poor unfortunate child. Emerson, no more biscuits. They'll spoil her appetite. What are you going to do with her? Cyrus asked. There can hardly be any question of that, Cyrus. Even if Percy admitted his responsibility, he is no fit person to take charge of a child. He would hand her over to a randomly selected Egyptian family, pay them a small sum of money, and stroll away. She might be better off with an Egyptian family, Cyrus argued. You could, with complete confidence, let Selim or Daoud or any one of them adopt her. They will be part of her family, Cyrus, as they are part of mine. Khadija would take her in a second. But she is half English, and I will not be a party to the sort of irresponsible callousness so many English persons of the male gender demonstrate toward the infantile victims of their brief encounters. It is a matter of principle. Cyrus raised his glass in salute. His eyes were twinkling. And a certain amount of bullheadedness? You're going to outface the gossips and tell them to go to the devil? We're with you every step of the way, Amelia, but, well, isn't this going to be a little hard on Ramses? I have given that full consideration, of course. Ramses is of my opinion, I know. He is even more bull uh, determined than I. There is no concealing her existence now, and you may be sure gossip will spread whatever we do. Cyrus, would you be good enough to get me another whiskey and soda? Thank you. Emerson, I said no more biscuits. I do not approve of bribing a child with sweets. It's time she went to bed. Growing children need a great deal of sleep. No, Ramses, do not take her up. She must learn to go with Basima. A certain amount of protest followed this decision. It ended when Emerson slipped a biscuit to Basima, and she held it in front of the child as she carried her off, as one leads a donkey with a carrot. I pretended not to see. Catherine, chuckling, said, She has quite a will of her own, hasn't she? Remarkable for an infant who's lived as she has. Amelia, what are you going to do about her mother? That is a difficulty, I admitted. The unfortunate creature seems to have disappeared. Ramses has been looking for her, without success thus far. If we can find her, we will, of course, protect and assist her, but... I dare not think what the child has seen and heard and experienced. Can we ever eradicate those memories? Children that age learn quickly and forget easily, Amelia. I have a feeling she has been sheltered from the worst of it. A mother can do that, or try to do it. Catherine's first husband had been a drunkard and a wife-beater. I did not doubt she knew whereof she spoke. During dinner, an idea occurred to me that I was anxious to investigate. I saw no reason to explain it to Emerson in case I was mistaken, so I simply informed him that I hadn't seen Jack Reynolds for several days and felt I ought not neglect that duty. He's been doing quite well, but men often relapse, unless someone keeps after them, I explained. Catherine will go with me, won't you, Catherine? We declined the offers of the gentleman to accompany us, for I was afraid that if we did find Jack in a state of inebriation, he might remember his old grudge and behave badly. Escorted by two of our men carrying lanterns, we set out on foot. It was a beautiful night, and Catherine had said she would be the better for a bit of exercise. We found Jack alone and in full possession of his senses. He was in his study, from which he emerged to greet us, carrying the book he'd been reading. I was glad to see the book was not a yellow-backed novel, but the first volume of Emerson's history. The sitting-room was neater than it had been on the occasion of my first visit, but it could have done with dusting, and there was a faint whiff of that strange odour. If Jack was not pleased to see us, he was faultlessly polite, offering us chairs and refreshments, 
the latter of which we declined. We were out for a stroll and decided to stop by for a moment, I explained. Even a few days without the dire effects of alcohol had restored the young fellow to his former healthy looks and intelligence. You stopped by to see if I'd gone back to the bottle, he said bluntly. The cure has begun, and you need not fear I will give way again. As you yourself reminded me, I have obligations to carry out. His jaw protruded, and his teeth were bared. I could almost see Mr. Roosevelt leading the charge on San Juan Hill. I am delighted to hear it, I said, hoping I spoke the truth. We will not keep you longer, then. Is Geoffrey here? I no longer need a nursemaid, Mrs. Emerson. You misunderstand my meaning, Mr. Reynolds. I asked after Geoffrey, as I would ask after any friend. Well, then he's not here. He went off yesterday. I don't know where. He left a message saying he'd be gone for a few days. I was away from home. I see. Good night, then. He insisted on seeing us to the door, and when I gave him my hand in farewell, he held on to it. If I was rude or abrupt, Mrs. Emerson, I hope you'll forgive me. I will always be grateful to you for your help. What was that all about? Catherine asked curiously, as we started back toward the villa. I found his manner very odd, Amelia. Men are very odd, Catherine. I cannot say for certain what is on his mind. I thought I detected some resentment of Geoffrey, but I wouldn't care to say whether Jack was angry because his friend had deserted him, or because he'd come to his assistance in the first place. The poor creatures do dislike admitting they are dependent on others for help. I must confess that concern for Jack was not my primary reason for calling on him this evening. You thought Nefret might have gone to him? To Geoffrey, rather. She is better friends with some of the young men than with the young ladies of Cairo society, which is not surprising, considering that the latter are empty-headed ninnies. It is surely more than a coincidence that Geoffrey went off leaving such a vague message. If she was in some distress, as I believe her to have been, he would have offered himself as escort to, well, to wherever she wanted to go. Nor would he have betrayed her confidence to Jack. Yes, that must have been what happened. I confess I am relieved to know she is not alone. He is not the sort of man to take advantage, I suppose. Of Nefret? I couldn't help laughing. He is a perfect gentleman, and Nefret is not the sort of woman who is easily taken advantage of. Depend upon it, we will hear from her soon. We did hear, the following evening. The letter was handwritten and delivered by messenger. I hope you haven't been worried about me. We will be home in a few days, Geoffrey and I. We were married this morning. Chapter 10 Ah, the wonder of those chill desert nights. How often have I laid wrapped only in a blanket, looking up at the canopy of stars and thinking of him who made them. A man whose thoughts and acts are not ennobled by such experiences is beyond redemption. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. The Amelia's gangplank was out, and David was on deck, leaning on the rail and smoking his pipe. His thin brown face broadened in a smile when he saw Ramsay's, and he came with long strides to meet him. I hoped we'd see you this afternoon, he said. You weren't at the train station this morning. I'm sorry. There was something else I had to do. He gripped David's outstretched hand. I've missed you. I can't say that you have been foremost in my thoughts the entire time. Ramses laughed. Had that been the case, I would question your sanity. So, so stop behaving like an Englishman. David held out his arms. Embrace me as a brother should. The landing stage was used by the steamers that carried tourists from Cairo. Only Emerson's prestige, and, Ramsay suspected, a judicious application of bakshish from Rais Hassan, had won the Amelia permission to use it. The location was within walking distance of the house, and the convenience of this outweighed the disadvantage of the crowds that filled the area several times daily. 
Some of them stared and whispered at the sight of two men in European dress embracing one another. The devil with them, as the professor would say, said David, sketching an impertinent parody of a salam at a staring woman. He was looking well, Ramses thought. His face was fuller, and there was a new firmness in the set of his well-cut lips. Ramses had looked forward to this moment for weeks. Now there was so much to say, he didn't know where to begin. David saved him the worst of it. Aunt Emilia told me about Nefret. Do you want to talk about it? No. Why are we standing here? I haven't said hello to Leah. She can wait, said Leah's husband. For God's sake, Ramses, don't pretend, not with me. What happened? Mother told you about the child? Yes. I won't ask why you didn't write me about her. You never tell me anything. It must have been a frightful shock, having her turn up out of the blue with that filthy swine, Galan. But there has to be more to it than that. Even if Fred wouldn't rush off and get married unless... unless she loved him. Do you believe that? What I believe is immaterial. It's over and done with. The desire to pour out his anger and bewilderment to the one person who knew most of the truth was almost overpowering. He couldn't do that, though. Not even to David could he admit what had happened between the fret and him. A man who had just had an arm or a leg amputated might feel the same, he supposed, the wound too raw to bear the slightest touch. It was clever of Garland to approach you instead of Percy, David said thoughtfully. Trying to blackmail him would have been a waste of time. And, of course, everyone in Cairo knows you and your parents by sight and by reputation. That's the logical explanation, Ramsay said. If one were charitably inclined, one would assume Galan didn't know the truth either. But the woman must know. Aunt Emilia said you've been searching for her. Not to force a public confession out of her, if that's what you suppose. No one would believe her anyhow. The damage is done. Indignation furrowed David's broad forehead, but Ramsay's cut him off before he could protest. It's done, I said. We have several more pressing problems to deal with. I wish I could leave you and Leah in peace for a while longer, but you know the family too well to hope for that. What else did Mother tell you? Quite a lot. David knew when to stop asking questions. He put his hand on Ramsay's shoulder, and they started back toward the boat. What the deuce has been going on? Murder? Assault? The usual sort of thing, Ramses murmured. Yes, quite. Like the forgeries? She told you about that, too. David grinned reluctantly. When she stopped for breath, the professor started in. I felt like a boxer reading from a series of hard hits to the jaw. Well, you know, mother. He stopped to greet Rais Hassan and went on. When she decides to confide in someone... She lets him have it all at once. I prefer it to her former habit of never telling us anything. Ramses hadn't been on the Amelia since they moved. The saloon looked strange without the clatter of books and papers that had always filled it. David hadn't had time to scatter his drawing materials and reference books about. The place was almost too neat for comfort. Leah was sitting on the wide curving divan under the windows. The setting sun framed her golden hair like a halo. One of the servants must have delivered the messages and letters that had come for them over the past weeks. A stack of envelopes was on the divan beside her, and her head was bent over the letter she held in her hand. He noticed, because he had got in the habit of noticing things, that it was several pages in length, and that it absorbed her to such an extent that she failed to observe his presence until he was actually in the room. Thrusting the letter into the pocket of her skirt, she ran to meet him, when she freed herself from his hearty embrace, he saw there were tears in her eyes. "'I'm glad to have you to ourselves for a bit,' she said, taking his hand and leading him to the divan. "'We're dining with the family this evening, and you know what that'll be like, everyone talking at once.' "'I'm afraid you're in for several days of exhausting celebration,' Ramsay said lightly. "'Selim has been organising a fantasia to which the entire village is invited.' and Mother spoke of giving a ball or dinner party in your honour. She can just forget that, Leah said emphatically. I refuse. What's so funny? You look exactly like Aunt Evelyn when she's in a temper, a nice little domestic cat pretending to be a tiger. 
She's not pretending, David said. The look he gave his wife made Ramses wish he were dead. I mean, Leah went on, that we haven't time for balls and dinner parties and no interest whatever in outfacing Cairo society. I find it hard to forgive you for not telling us, Ramses. About what? Anything, she gestured emphatically. It was bad enough concealing the business of the forgeries from us, but you might have mentioned it when people started shooting at you. Mother, Ramsay said meekly. Not me. Mother. Oh, well, that's all right then. I'm sorry. She turned toward him and took his hand in hers. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be scolding you. You've had enough to worry about. Do people really think you were responsible for that girl's death? Ramsay's blinked. Leah was always taking him by surprise. Like her mother, she looked fluffy and sweet and naive, but she had the same gift for going straight to the heart of the matter regardless of tact. I remember her from last year, Leah went on. I don't know her well, and I didn't like her very much, but she didn't deserve to die that way, at the hands... Oh, Karima, yes, thank you, we will have tea now. It took a while to arrange the trays and dishes to Karima's satisfaction. When she'd gone, Leah picked up exactly where she'd left off. At the hands of someone she knew and trusted. Did Mother tell you that? Ramses asked. We don't know for certain. It's obvious. She was a frivolous, overly confident woman, but she wasn't stupid enough to wander around alone at night. She was meeting someone, and that someone was not a lover. I'm afraid to ask how you arrived at that conclusion. Ramses murmured. She was in love with you, Leah said coolly. It wasn't you who was with her that night. Therefore, Leah, David exclaimed. It's true, isn't it? I don't know why men find these things so embarrassing. There are only two things that could have brought Maud out of the house that night. An invitation from a man she loved, or a threat from a man who had some hold over her. Good God, Ramses said helplessly. His face was burning. Perhaps it was his mother who had mentioned poor Maud's infatuation, but he feared Leah had got the information, along with a plethora of embarrassing commentary from Nefret. I, I don't know what to say. Something sensible, I hope, said his cousin. You didn't do anything to encourage her, did you? I thought not. Then why do you feel guilty? Is my syllogism right or not? Was that a syllogism? He got a grip on himself. All right, I see where you're going. You've overlooked something, though. What if she received a message purporting to be from me? Unlikely in the extreme, Leah said, shaking her head so decidedly that her bright curls sparkled in the sunlight. You saw a good deal of one another during the daytime and evening hours. If you wanted to arrange a rendezvous, you had only to whisper a word in her ear... She'd have to be pretty stupid to respond to a written message. Anyhow, she went on, before either of the men could object to this dubious generalization. Too many other unpleasant incidents have occurred for this to be unrelated. I think she knew something about those incidents and their perpetrator. Maybe she threatened to expose him. Maybe he realized her loyalty to him had been weakened by her love for another man. A man whom he had already attacked. Loyalty to whom? David demanded. You can't be referring to her brother. Why not? She turned to Ramses. Her eyes narrowed. You thought of it too, didn't you? He put his cup in the saucer and leaned back. Allow me to commend you for having a mind almost as suspicious as mine. I suspect everybody, including Jack. He wouldn't even have to lure her out of the house. She might have been killed in her own room or in the courtyard. No one looked for bloodstains. The servants don't sleep in the house, and the aunt wouldn't notice a full-scale war. He had all night to dispose of the body and return home. That would mean Jack was the one who shot at Aunt Emilia and arranged the other accidents, David said thoughtfully. Any idea why? Mr. Vandergelt suggested one possible motive, Ramsay said that the accidents were designed to drive us away from Zawai at Alaryan. It was pure luck that none of them resulted in a serious injury. Had one of us been killed or badly hurt, father might have cancelled the excavation. 
that suggests that there is something at the site this person doesn't want found. A tomb? Zawayat isn't the Valley of the Kings, or even Giza, David. It's one of the most unpromising sites we've ever explored. There's nothing there but an empty, collapsing pyramid and cemeteries of poor graves. Evidence of a crime, perhaps? Mother does have a gift for finding corpses. Every year another dead body, as Abdallah used to say. Leah's face softened. Dear Abdallah, Aunt Amelia is even more determined to clear his name than David's. We've rather lost sight of that issue recently, Ramses admitted. I'm still not entirely convinced that the attacks on us are unrelated to the forgeries, but I'll be damned if I can see how they're related. We were getting absolutely nowhere with our investigation. The point about the Wyatt is that Jack worked there for several months last year. He is one of the most likely persons to have found something or buried someone or, or God knows what. He wasn't the only one, David pointed out. Mr. Reisner and his crew were there too. Mr. Reisner isn't there. Jack is. Only two other members of that crew are presently at Giza, Mr. Fisher and Geoffrey. The Nefret's... It was the first time he had said it. Nefret's husband. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I am indebted to you and Cyrus for rallying round this evening, I said to Catherine. I am afraid it may be a bit sticky. We were alone in the courtyard. Everything was ready, the dining table set, the flowers arranged. Cyrus had gone up to join Emerson in his study. I had no idea where Ramses had got off to. For the past few days, he'd spent all his spare hours in the filthy alleyways of Cairo, trying to find the miserable girl whose silence had supported the untruthful accusation against him. He hadn't even accompanied us to the railroad station to meet David and Leah. A rumour had reached him from one of his sources that Rashida had been seen the previous night, and he had gone immediately to investigate. When he returned to the house later that day, he said only that his informant had been mistaken. I hadn't seen him since. I feel certain you're worrying unnecessarily, Catherine said in her comfortable way. You said you had seen Nefret this morning and told her about the child? I had already written her. I knew she and Geoffrey were staying at Shepherd's. I ought to have called earlier, but I took the coward's way out by writing first. You were still angry with her. Yes, I admitted. And not only on Ramsay's account. I'd always believed we were close, Catherine. Why should she keep her engagement to Geoffrey a secret from me? They were engaged? They must have had an understanding, if not a formal engagement. A woman doesn't turn to a stranger when she's in distress. Not unless the foundations of her world have been utterly shattered, Catherine murmured. What do you mean? I don't believe I know myself. It was only a passing fancy. She gave herself a little shake and returned to the subject at hand. The understanding may have been quite recent. She didn't question your explanation, did she? No. She said she ought to have known, and that she hoped he would forgive her, and... That was odd. She never mentioned his name. Ramses, I mean. She kept saying he and him. Geoffrey wasn't there. I don't know whether that was due to tact or his fear of facing me. You don't dislike the young man, do you? Quite the contrary. He's of good family. Not that that sort of thing matters to me. Well-bred, cultured, and a first-rate archaeologist. That does matter, you know, especially to Emerson. No doubt it will work out for the best. But we have a number of things to decide. Geoffrey is committed to Mr. Reisner for the rest of the season, and you may be sure Emerson won't allow Nefret to shirk her duties on account of something as inconsequential as a honeymoon. And where are they to live? Harvard Camp is a bachelor establishment, and I don't like the idea of them staying with Jack Reynolds. They'd better come here to us. You might wait to see what they have to say on the subject, Catherine said with a smile. A sharp but abortive yip from Nama informed me of the identity of an arriving individual. Only Ramses and Nefret could get the confounded dog to hush, and it usually took her longer than it did him. My deductions were correct as usual. 
Seeing Catherine, Ramses raised his hand to his head, discovered he was not wearing a hat, and lowered it again. David and Leah will be along in a few minutes, he announced. She couldn't decide which hat to wear. They all looked much the same to me. Oh, is that where you were? Did you have tea with them? Yes. Are you ready for your usual, Mother? Or will you wait for Father and the others? I will wait, thank you. Mrs. Vandergilt? Thank you, Ramses. I'll finish my tea. I watched him walk to the sideboard. Except for his wind-blown hair, he looked quite neat and tidy, in a nice tweed suit and a tie. It wasn't like him to begin drinking so early, though. You'd better go up and see Senia, I said. Otherwise, she will come looking for you. Of course. He put his empty glass down and mounted the stairs. Another outburst from the dog, this one of longer duration, brought Emerson and Cyrus out of the former's study. Damn dog, said Emerson. He went out of the house, and I heard him and Nama barking at one another. The dog appeared to regard Emerson's shouts as an attempt at friendly conversation. The barks faded into frustrated yelps when Emerson issued Leah and David in and closed the door. Leah was laughing as she brushed at the dusty paw marks on her frock. It's good to be home, she declared, and hugged everyone in turn. I rather expected Emerson would try to carry them off to his study to show them the plans of the site and explain at tedious length what he meant to do, but he seemed not quite himself. He hadn't gone with me to the hotel that morning, so this would be his first meeting since her precipitate marriage with the girl he loved like a daughter. I wondered if he'd been hurt. No, I knew he'd been hurt by her failure to share her feelings with him. Not that Emerson would ever have said so. I only hoped he would behave himself and not take it out on Geoffrey. He and the fret were so close on the heels of Leah and David, I wondered whether they had lingered until after we were all assembled. Both of them had reason to expect remonstrances or expressions of resentment, and there is safety in numbers. Nefret flew into Leah's arms, leaving the rest of us to converge on the unfortunate youth she had espoused. He carried it off quite well, I must say. Mine was the first hand he clasped, but it was Emerson he addressed first, with a manful acknowledgement of error. "'I hope you can find it in your heart to forgive me, sir.' I ought to have spoken to you and Mrs. Emerson. I ought to have waited a decent interval. I have no excuse, except that I love her so very much. Well, <clears throat> said Emerson. It was a more gracious response than I had dared expect. Everyone was trying hard to behave normally. Geoffrey continued to command my regard... His congratulations and best wishes to the other pair of newly married persons were nicely expressed, and his manner toward me was that of an affectionate son. I could have wished he hadn't been quite so considerate of my advanced age and female frailty, settling me tenderly in a chair and supplying unnecessary footstools and cushions, but it would take a while, I supposed, before he was entirely at ease with me. We settled down around the fountain, and the entire household staff appeared with food and drink. They were all related to David in some degree or other, and they had been waiting eagerly to greet him and his bride. It was amusing to see Geoffrey stare as David took the tray of little sandwiches from Fatima so that she and Leah could hug one another. David went round the whole grinning circle, kissing cousins on both cheeks and shaking hands with more distant kin— and then Fatima bustled them out with a last fond look at David. The Fantasia is the day after tomorrow, I said. I forgot to tell you, Nefret. You and Geoffrey will come, of course. One day, I thought, I might be able to add his name to hers without having to stop and think about it. Of course, she said, and smiled at me. I had never seen her look lovelier. She was wearing a new frock, and her cheeks were brilliant. Ramses hadn't made an appearance, and I began to wonder whether he was sulking or had climbed out a back window. I ought to have known better. Avoiding awkwardness was not his habit. He had rather waited until he was sure of being the focus of all eyes. He was carrying the child when he came slowly down the stairs. 
The only word that occurs to me is bedecked. Her frilliest frock, her largest hair bow, her most lavishly gilded slippers, and several strings of sparkling beads, which I hadn't purchased, adorned her small person. She looked like a full-blown pink rose. Four new faces were too much for even a child of her astonishing self-possession. She buried her face in Ramsay's shoulder and clutched him round the neck, but not before the others had seen her features clearly. Good Lord, Geoffrey breathed. He was sitting next to me on the settee. I was the only one who heard him. Ramsay's emitted noises suggestive of strangulation, which made Senia giggle and loosen her grip. She's a bit shy with strangers, he said easily. Just ignore her till she gets used to you. Here is the lion, little bird, he went on in Arabic. He wants to speak to you. Whereupon, Professor Radcliffe Emerson, the father of curses, holder of innumerable honorary degrees, scourge of the underworld, and the greatest Egyptologist of this or any other age, growled and tickled her on the back of her neck. It was impossible to ignore him, but we did our best. Leah's eyes were bright with tears of emotion. Nefret got slowly to her feet. I will never know what she meant to do, for at that moment, with the awful inevitability of an omen sent by some inimical deity, the massive, brindled form of Horus emerged from behind a potted plant, tail lashing and teeth bared. We hadn't seen him for three days. He'd disappeared the same morning Nefret left the house, and I would be the first to confess that I hadn't spent a great many minutes wondering what had happened to him. He was heading purposefully toward Nefret when the child's high-pitched chirps attracted his attention. Emerson had persuaded her to come to him, and she was investigating his pockets, for it hadn't taken her long to learn there was usually something in them for her. She and the cat caught sight of one another at the same moment. If a cat's jaw could drop, Horace's did. He stopped dead in his tracks. Staring. Everyone in the room was familiar with the cat's vile temper, including Geoffrey, who still bore the scars of a recent attempt to make friends with Horus. Several of us moved at once. Ramses jumped up. I reached for a pitcher of water. Emerson wrapped his muscular arms protectively about the child, and the fret lunged for Horus. A scene of utter pandemonium ensued as our frantic efforts to intercept the beast countermanded one another. Horus slipped through Nefret's hands, bit Ramsay's thumb, shook the water off his back, most of it had splashed onto the floor, and sat down with a thump at Emerson's feet, still staring. The child compounded the confusion by squirming and demanding to be put down so she could talk to the little lion. "'Be calm,' I implored. "'Everyone, be calm!' Don't get him excited. Emerson, hold on to her. Ramses, can you? I can try, said Ramses. He slipped out of his coat, raised it, and advanced cautiously on the cat. He won't hurt her, Nefret said. Still on her knees, she began edging forward and addressed Horus in a soft, cooing voice. Come to Nefret, bad Horus. Did you miss me? I missed you. Come and say hello. Good boy, Horus. The wretched beast did not even turn his head. I became aware of another sound, loud enough to be heard over Nefret's murmured endearments. It was quite an unpleasant sound, like the rasp of rusty file, but it was unquestionably Horus's best attempt at a purr. Good gad, I said. Good God, Emerson corrected. Peabody. Do you think? Horus flopped over onto his back and waved his paws. He looked perfectly ridiculous. It's a ruse, Ramses muttered. A trick to lower our guard. Nefret, get out of the way. No, don't. She pushed his raised coat aside and reached for the cat. Horus remained as unresponsive and as heavy as a rock when she lifted him up, only twisting his head round at an impossible angle so he could continue to stare at Senia. Nefret sat down next to Emerson, who edged away. 
He won't hurt her, I tell you. He wants to make friends. Ha, said Emerson. I've got him, Nefret assured him, taking a firm grip on the cat's front legs. Then, for the first time, she looked directly at the child and smiled. Hold out your hand, little bird. Pat the lion. Gently, gently. It was a most touching moment, and would have been even more touching if the child, squeaking with delight, hadn't grabbed hold of one of Horace's prominent ears and tugged. Gently, said Nefret, while the rest of us remained petrified in horrified anticipation. She detached the small fingers and put them on the cat's motionless head. So, watching the creature submit meekly to hard pats and prodding fingers, I felt kindly toward him for the first time since I had made his acquaintance. As she attempted to guide the little hands, Nefret was explaining to Emerson that Horus was only vicious with adult animals, including, I would have said especially, humans. He had never put a claw or a tooth into one of the kittens, even when they chewed his tail and jumped onto his back. I turned to Ramses, who stood watching with his usual absence of expression. "'You are dripping blood on the carpet,' I remarked. "'And I suppose you have got it all over your coat.' He had. Horus had not only broken the ice, he had melted it. His unaccountable behaviour formed the primary topic of conversation. Senia had been with difficulty removed to the nursery, and Horus had been, with even greater difficulty, prevented from following her into the room. We left him, lying across the threshold, since he growled and spat even at Nefret when she tried to remove him. "'I will have to acquire another cat, it seems,' she remarked. "'Horus is lost to me.' "'In all honesty, I cannot say I regret that,' Geoffrey said, laughing. You know, my darling, I would not deprive you of anything you desired, but I hadn't looked forward to sharing quarters with Horus. He hates me. He hates everyone, said Ramses, shifting his soup spoon to his left hand. Horus had bit his right thumb to the bone. I had had to bandage it so heavily it stuck out at a somewhat awkward angle. I knew Ramses would have the bandage off as soon as he was out of my sight, but at least I had done my duty. Almost everyone he went on. There's no need for you to give him up, Nefret. You and Geoffrey will be living here, won't you? I hadn't thought, she said. Well, you had better, Emerson declared. I need you back on the dig, Nefret. We've found quite a lot of bones for you, and we are days behind with photographing. Leah and I will take over the photography, David said, and we are ready to start as soon as you like. I feel guilty at staying away so long. "'Tomorrow, then,' Emerson began. "'Emerson, don't be absurd!' I exclaimed. "'They just got here. The Fantasia is the following evening. Selim and the others have been planning it for weeks.' "'I'm looking forward to it,' Cyrus declared. "'I've attended a few Fantasias in Luxor. This should be a bang-up affair.' "'No champagne, Cyrus,' I reminded him. "'Well, I know that.' But there's nothing to stop us having a few glasses beforehand, is there? His eyes twinkled. We parted earlier than Emerson would have liked. He was anxious to show David the photographic studio and would have detained him for hours going over plans of the site had I not pointed out that it had been a long day for David and Leah. Nefret and Geoffrey left at the same time. We stood in the doorway, with Nama barking like a maniac, watching them walking arm in arm along the dusty road, Leah with Nefret, the two young men following. It gave me an odd feeling to see someone other than Ramses making part of that group. He hadn't gone with us to the door, Emerson shouted at Nama, who barked joyously back at him, and put his arm round my waist. It's still early, Peabody. What about a final whiskey and soda? You feel the need of it, do you? Need? Certainly not. Though, Emerson said morosely, as he drew me inside, it gave me an odd feeling, seeing them go. They are leaving the nest, Peabody. I suppose Ramses will be next. I want to talk to you about him, Peabody. Do you think he 
Ah, <laughs> there you are, my boy. I thought you'd retired. No, sir. Did you say you wanted to talk to me? Don't stand at attention like some cursed military moron, Emerson said. Sit down. That is an order, he added irritably. Ramsay smiled and obeyed. He had already removed his coat and tie. Emerson followed suit as he strode toward the sideboard, tossing his nice coat in the general direction of a chair. He missed, of course. Emerson came back with three whiskies. I did want to talk to you, he said. Have you and the fret patched it up? Why, yes, sir, certainly. You know that hasty temper of hers. She apologised very nicely. Oh, when was that? Just after dinner, when I offered my official congratulations to Geoffrey. I hadn't had the opportunity of doing so before. She was charming to Senia, didn't you think? Emerson's brows grew together. He is not the most sensitive of men, except with regard to me, but even he heard something chilling in that even, unemotional voice. Don't get me off the track, he growled. You would not mind, then, if they came here to stay? Why should I? You heard me make the same suggestion at dinner. I repeated it later to Geoffrey. The sweet nefret decorated so prettily will be ideal for them. He accepted with thanks, subject, of course, to your approval. What about nefret's approval? I inquired. She did not object. In fact, I had intended to begin moving my things back to my old room tonight. So, if you will excuse me. One more thing, said Emerson. You haven't found her yet. Ramses had drunk very little of his whiskey. He reached for the glass again. It tipped and spilled. Damn it, said Ramses, glaring at his thumb. I beg your pardon, mother. But it's not just one thing. Father, it's too damned... Don't apologise again, I said wearily. It's too damned many things, isn't it? Have you spoken to David about the forgeries? We've both spoken to him, but neither of us have given him a chance to offer an opinion. Then there's Maud's death and Mr. Vandergut's theory about the accidents and my visit to Ward Dunny. David isn't going to like my interfering, not one damned bit, but I'll have to tell him, and my futile search for Rashida. She's gone, Mother. I'd have located her by now if she were anywhere in Cairo, and alive. If she were dead, her body would have been found, I said. No. Deaths like hers aren't reported. She'd have been swept up and thrown out with the other refuse of the streets. Over his bowed head, I met Emerson's eyes, and in their icy blue depths I saw confirmation of Ramsay's bitter words. What about Kalan? he asked. I found out where he lives. It wasn't easy. None of his women knew they wouldn't, and he doesn't advertise his whereabouts. The house is in Heliopolis, quite an elegant establishment. No one was there. The place was shut up and swept clean. What did you do, break in? Emerson inquired. Well, yes, you might call it that. From the amount of dust, I would say he'd been gone for at least a week, and from the absence of everything except a few sticks of furniture, I'd say he isn't coming back in a hurry. Emerson put his hand on Ramsay's shoulder. We'll find him. We've never been defeated yet, and we won't be this time. How can we lose with your mother and her deadly parasol on our side? Quite right, I said briskly, and patted Ramsay's other shoulder. Go to bed now. Things will look better in the morning. It's always darkest before the dawn. Ramsay's let out a choked sound that might have been a laugh or a muffled swear word, and got heavily to his feet. Yes, mother. I wonder how much Nefret has told Geoffrey, I said. He will have to be taken into our confidence. Of course, Ramsay said. He's one of the family now, isn't he? Ramsay's brought Senia down to breakfast next morning without bothering to consult me. The sight of the child roused Emerson from his habitual grouchiness and reduced him to a state of fatuous amiability I hadn't seen in him at that hour for many years. Horace came with them. He squatted on the floor as close to the child as he could get and never took his eyes off her. Before long, we were joined by Leah and David, 
who had, as Leah declared, been unable to stay away. It was almost like old times, with everyone laughing and talking at once, for David wanted to tell Emerson all about Crete, and Leah demanded a tour of the house, and both of them kept offering tidbits to Senia, while Fatima hovered over the table like a benevolent genie, and the new nursemaid stood shyly in the doorway, afraid to come closer and unwilling to leave her charge entirely to others. Finally, Senia became so sticky with jam that even Emerson didn't protest when I ordered that she be removed. She was borne off in triumph by the nurse. Horace got up and went after them. "'You needn't worry, Mother,' said Ramses, reading my expression accurately. "'I had to rescue him this morning. "'She had hold of his tail with both hands and was trying to eat it. "'He didn't even scratch me when I detached her.' "'How long did you wait before you detached her?' David asked. "'He'd never been fond of Horace either.' A bit longer than was strictly necessary, Ramsay smiled. I was relieved to see that he looked tanned and rested and not so tense. Having David back was good for him. Emerson had been scrubbing ineffectually at the jelly spots on his shirt. They looked unpleasantly like fresh blood. You'd better change it, I said. Never mind that, Emerson grunted. I thought we might just take a little ride and uh, have a quick look at the site. Emerson, I told you. A ride would be enjoyable, David said. I haven't said hello to Asford and Risha. What do you say, Leah? It was obvious that she had anticipated something of the sort, for she was dressed for riding, not in the absurd garments that had once been de rigueur for lady equestrians, but in the short divided skirt and neat boots both girls wore on the dig and her ready acquiescence assured me she was anxious to return to the busy life she had learned to love as dearly as the rest of us did. Did Nefret and Geoffrey say anything about coming round today? I asked, as we made our way through the garden toward the stable. I believe they plan to, Leah replied. Are they really? Is it true they'll be moving in with you? Good gracious, Leah. You sound as if you don't approve. No, not at all, Aunt Amelia. I mean... No, I don't mean to sound that way. Are these the stables? How nice the garden looks. It will be good to see the horses again. Selim has taken excellent care of them, Ramsay said, as David flung both arms around Asfour's neck and she nuzzled his shirt. Shall we take them out, then? Mother, perhaps you would rather not. If you are all going, I am going too, I declared. The mare Selim hired for me in place of that other wretched animal does very well. From the open door at the far end of the stable came a murmur of sounds, squeaks, squawks, and the rustle of straw. I see Nefret has a usual collection of animal patients, Leah said, looking in. What on earth is in that large cage, and why is it covered? Oh, dear, I said. I had forgot about him. I hope Mohammed... He's all right, said Ramses, behind me. He has to be hooded or covered so he won't hurt himself trying to fly. He lifted the cloth covering the cage, and Leah let out a cry of sympathy and admiration. The bird was a young male peregrine falcon, the same species depicted in the hieroglyph for the name of the god Horus. He sat hunched and unmoving his great talons gripping the perch. "'Who's been feeding him?' I asked guiltily. I hadn't given much thought to Nefret's pets. I knew I could count on Mohammed to care for the others, but he had a superstitious fear of the great bird of prey. I knew the answer, though. Like Nefret, Ramses had a well-nigh uncanny rapprochement with animals. Even feral beasts few people would have cared to approach.' He opened the cage and reached inside. The bird stirred uneasily, but did not struggle, as his long brown fingers closed round its body and moved gently along the wings. The wing is healed, he explained. She wanted to give him a few more days' rest before she freed him. She always hates to let them go, Leah said softly. I suppose she's given him a name. Harakti, Ramses replied. She couldn't call him Horus since that repellent cat had already preempted the name. 
It means Horus of the Horizon, I explained. Horus was a solar deity as well as the son of Osiris. After passing through the perils of the underworld, he emerged from the portal of dawn into a new day. Thank you, Aunt Amelia, Leah said. The windows were always shuttered at night to keep predators out. Ramses unlatched the nearest shutter and pulled it back. The hawk let out a strange little mewing cry and stirred, raising shoulders and wings slightly before letting them fall again. The sunlight brought out the delicate tracery of black feathers and the fierce curved beak. Ramses reached into his pocket. He must have stopped by the kitchen before joining us, since the bundle he withdrew squelched and, despite the oiled paper, began to drip darkly. Not a pretty sight, I'm afraid, he said to Leah, as he unfolded the oiled paper. Falcons like their food, fresh and bloody. I hope I can coax him to eat. He's... He broke off, and I turned, following the direction of his gaze, to see Nefret standing in the doorway. Good morning, she said. How is he? As you see. Would you care to do it? Ramses held out his hand. The nasty objects, now fully exposed, reeked with the smell of fresh blood. They faced one another across the cage, and I couldn't help thinking, for I am a connoisseur of the fine arts, that the tableau would have made a splendid subject for one of the pre-Raphaelite painters like Holman Hunt or the great Dante Gabriel Rossetti. On one side the maiden, crowned with the coils of her golden hair, on the other, the tall, dark-haired youth, his outstretched hand crimson with the blood of sacrifice. Between them, the god, the falcon of the dawn, caged in darkness. What rich symbolism, what evocative hints of myth and legend. Sunlight framed the figures like the gold gesso so lavishly employed by the school of painting to which I have referred. Rossetti would probably give the maiden robes of forest green velvet, then the maiden said, Throw the filthy stuff away. It would be a pity to waste it, Ramses murmured. He returned the mess to the paper and put it down on the table. Don't wipe your hands on your trousers, Ramses, I said, a moment too late. The others had come to see what was going on. Stay out, Nefret ordered. Geoffrey, in the lead, gave her a look of hurt surprise. What are you doing, sweetheart? Can I help? I'm going to free him. Get out of my way. Ramses, open the back door. He caught hold of her hands as she reached for the cage. Not without the gloves. The heavy gauntlets had seen hard usage and were streaked with droppings. She took them from him and drew them on. Once in the stable yard, she lifted the bird onto her forearm. He was not full-grown, and she was no fragile blossom of civilized leisure, but I did not see how she could manage the muscular effort necessary for what she contemplated doing. I thought for a moment that Ramses was going to offer to do it for her, or perhaps suggest a more practical, if less theatrical, method. But she turned her head to look at him, and his parted lips closed. She stood motionless for a moment, her free hand hovering over the feathered head, and I could have sworn she whispered to the creature. When she moved... The bird moved, at the same instant and with the same splendid strength. Its wings spread as she flung it up. It rose under its own power and soared, circling and climbing. She stood watching it, her head thrown back, until a great scream of triumph and release floated down from the morning sky. Then she turned and went back into the shed. Geoffrey was standing next to me. Magnificent, he whispered, his eyes shining. She is like a goddess. What have I done to deserve a woman like that? I'm sure I have no idea, I replied, and then smiled as he bent a reproachful look on me. Just one of my little jokes, Geoffrey. You will become accustomed to them in time. No, don't follow her yet. It always hurts her to let them go. We left shortly thereafter, and since everyone was keen on trying the horses anyhow, I could see no objection to visiting the site. The fine animals made nothing of the short distance.
The men were not at work that day. Daoud and Selim were preparing for the Fantasia, which they had assured us would be the most magnificent ever held in Egypt, and the site lay barren and deserted under the rays of the midday sun. A dry little wind blew mists of sand across the plateau. Nefret had drawn a thin scarf across her face, like the veil of a Muslim lady. After we had walked round the perimeter and inspected the steeply sloping entrance stairs, we retired to my little shelter and sipped the cold tea I'd brought along. David did his best to express enthusiasm over our battered pyramid and rows of wretched graves, but I could tell he was not excited about it, and so could Emerson. We are spoiled, that is our trouble, he announced gloomily. Never forget, David, that this is what Egyptology is all about. Painstaking, dull research, not gold and treasure. I don't wonder you are spoiled after finding the tomb of Tetesheri, Geoffrey remarked. How I envy you the experience. We've come across some interesting things at Giza, but nothing to compare with that. Since there were not enough chairs and stools for all of us, he was stretched gracefully at Nefret's feet. His colouring was even fairer than Leah's, his hair bleached almost to silver by the sun. The regularity of his features gave his face a look of remoteness, unless it was warmed by animation, as it was now. "'I've been thinking,' he went on, with a charming air of diffidence. "'I hope you won't think me presumptuous for suggesting this, Professor. "'It is only a suggestion.' "'Well?' Emerson demanded. "'I do know a bit about this site, sir. "'Enough, perhaps, to save you some time and trouble.' I would like very much to join your staff. Now? Emerson took his pipe from his mouth. Naturally, I would be glad to have you. But I don't think Reisner would forgive me for leaving him short-handed. Geoffrey sat up and clasped his arms round his bent knees. He would not only forgive you, sir, he would be forever in your debt if you allowed someone to replace me, someone whose qualifications are far greater than mine, he added with a boyish grin. He's not as scrupulous as you, Professor. Admitted, Ramses, Reisner has tried several times to persuade you to work with him. Emerson's eyes flashed. I suspected as much. Curse it. Excavators are all alike. Not a model among the lot of them. Ramses, is this true? Yes, sir. I believe I mentioned it last year, after my season with him at Samaria, that he offered me a position on his Giza staff... He made no secret of it. Nor should he, I said, seeing Emerson's face redden. You've always said, my dear, that Ramses is free to take any position he likes. Well, yes, but, said Emerson, hmm. I have no interest in working for anyone else, sir, said Ramses. It's true that your talents are wasted here, Emerson muttered. We're not likely to find much in the way of inscriptional material. Those fourth dynasty masters at Giza. Geoffrey looked from his crestfallen face to the expressionless countenance of Ramses. I didn't mean to cause trouble, he said earnestly. My decision has already been made. Leaving Mr. Reisner may be professionally wrong, but other considerations far outweigh that. Do you suppose, sir, that I am unaware of the dangers you face? I, who was present on the occasion Mrs. Emerson was attacked by an unknown gunman? I may not be of much use, but my place at a time of peril is at the sight of my wife. He reached for Nefret's hand and held it to his cheek. Hmm, said Emerson. So you told him, Nefret? She didn't have to tell me, Geoffrey said indignantly. Even if I were not familiar with your past history, I could not be fool enough to miss the signs... There have been too many suspicious accidents. Poor Maud's death was another such. I don't know what lies behind all this, and if you choose not to inform me, I will not ask. All I ask is the privilege of helping you to the best of my poor abilities. A handsome offer, said Ramses. I don't see how we can refuse. So intense was the emotional atmosphere that when David cleared his throat, we all started and stared at him. He hardly ever spoke when we were all together. Everyone else talked louder and faster than he did, and his gentle nature prevented him from the rudeness of interrupting. 
Now, he said quietly. I agree. The least we can do is tell Geoffrey what does lie behind this. Or have you already informed him about the forgeries, Nefret? No, I thought there hasn't been time. Ramses, seated cross-legged on the rug, shifted position slightly. Nefret glanced at him and then looked away. You thought to spare me embarrassment, David said, with an affectionate smile. That was good of you, dear, but it was not necessary. I had told him most of the story that morning. He now repeated it to Geoffrey, who listened with astonishment writ large across his ingenuous countenance. But then, he stuttered, then that explains the attacks on you. This person fears exposure. He will kill to prevent it. It doesn't explain a damn thing, said Emerson. Or, to be more accurate, it doesn't solve our problem. We've made no progress finding the swine. He could be anyone. He could be anywhere. Anywhere around Cairo, I corrected. Unless the actual violence has been perpetrated by hired thugs, in which case, I agree, he might be elsewhere. If we can capture one of the villains next time he attacks us... David raised his hand. Excuse me, Aunt Amelia. I know that waiting to be attacked is your preferred method of catching criminals, but I would rather try something less dangerous. You have been so tender of my feelings and my reputation that you've overlooked the step we must take next. Indeed, it is the only one a man of honor could consider. What do you mean? I asked apprehensively. When men start talking about honor, there is sure to be trouble. I intend to write to every dealer who handled the forgeries, informing them that my grandfather had no collection of antiquities and that the individual who sold them the objects was an impostor. You can supply me with a list, I presume? For a time, the only sounds that broke the silence were the hiss of wind-blown sand and the droning of flies. Ramsay's was, of course, the first to speak. I have a list. It's not complete. It's a start, David said. The word was spread. This may or may not lead to information that will help us identify the man we want, but that is not the important thing. Emerson's pipe had gone out. Slowly and deliberately, he removed it from his mouth, tapped out the ashes, and put it in his pocket. Then he rose and offered David his hand. I'm, he remarked, a damned idiot. It just goes to show that one should never allow sentiment to interfere with common sense. Shake hands, my boy, and accept my apologies. Not at all, sir. It was my fault for getting married and distracting everyone. He was laughing as he looked up at the impressive form towering over him. What a handsome, upstanding lad he was. Marriage had given him additional confidence and maturity. I fancied, for I have my moments of sentiment, that his grandfather must have looked like David when he'd been the same age, long before I met him. Abdallah had been a fine-looking man till the day of his death. He'd been so proud of David. He would have been even prouder if he'd heard him that day. In the villages, the separation of the sexes which rouses the indignation of foreign visitors is not so strictly enforced. Separate harems, or women's quarters, are only found in the villas of the well-to-do, and only a wealthy man can afford to keep a woman who contributes nothing to the maintenance of the household. Such a woman is purely ornamental, a sign of his success. I should not have to point out certain uncomfortable parallels with our own society. But in case the reader be too obtuse or blinded by prejudice to see them, I will remind him or her of the upper-class ladies of England, who do little but dress richly and drive out in their carriages to pay calls on other richly dressed ladies. Egyptian women of the Fellaheen class work hard and are, in my opinion, all the better for it. In many ways, their position is invidious. But they have some rights English women still lack. Their property is their own, and in the case of divorce or the death of their husband, they are entitled by law to a portion of his estate. 
Older women who have outlived several husbands are said to be among the wealthiest citizens of the country, lending money at usurious rates and undoubtedly enjoying their power. But I digress. The village of Atiyah, where our men and their families lived, was a model of its kind. Not only was it unusually clean, but it boasted a number of amenities not often found in such small places. Abdallah and his kin had commanded and deserved high wages, and I dare say their long acquaintance with us had modified some of their views of the world. Egypt was changing, slowly, and not always for the better, but the younger men like Selim were far more open to new ideas than their fathers had been. It had been almost five years since Abdallah left us, but whenever I went to the village, my eyes automatically looked for the tall, dignified form that had once been the first to greet us. Now it was Selim, his father's son and successor, who advanced to welcome our party. The village was draped with banners and bunting, and the noise was deafening, dogs barking, drums beating, children shouting, and rising over it all, the shrill, ululating cries of the women. A guard of honour escorted us to Selim's house, where a feast was to precede the fantasia. Rugs and cushions covered the floor of the principal reception room, and we were invited to take our places upon them. I made a point of sitting next to Geoffrey, for I assumed he would appreciate a few tactful hints as to how to behave. To be sure, Egyptologists were less narrow-minded than other non-Egyptians, but few of them mingled socially with their workers, and some had never tasted Egyptian food. Ignorant persons picture Egyptians as crouching round a platter of food and stuffing it into their mouths with both hands. In fact, the procedure is quite elegant and refined in its own way. After we had seated ourselves round the large copper tray that served as a table, servants poured water over our hands into a basin with a pierced cover, and we dried them on the serviette, futa, that had been supplied. In a low, reverent voice, Selim intoned the blessing, Bismillahi, in the name of God, inviting us to partake. Round, flat loaves of bread are used as plates and as utensils, a piece being torn off, doubled, and used to scoop up bits of food. It takes some practice to do this neatly, but then so does the use of a knife and fork. Knives were not necessary. The food was in the form of yachni, stewed meat with onions or other edibles that could be daintily picked up with the thumb and the first and second fingers. One uses only the right hand, of course. When a roasted fowl must be dismembered, it is sometimes necessary for two persons to cooperate, each only using the right hand. I will not describe the dishes in detail. They included several of my favourites, including a large dish of bamiya, which is the pod of the hibiscus, lightly cooked and sprinkled with lime juice. As platter followed heaping platter and the temperature rose higher, Geoffrey's pale face grew flushed, and finally he fell back against the cushions with a subdued groan. "'I don't want to let the side down, Mrs. Emerson,' he whispered, "'but I don't think I can go on much longer. "'I've never eaten so much in my life.' "'You have done nobly,' I assured him. "'Just nibble.' "'We were all uncomfortably replete "'by the time we removed from the house to the village square, "'where the fantasia was to take place. "'Chairs had been placed for us.' I saw Geoffrey brighten visibly when he realised he no longer had to kneel, and coloured lanterns hung round the perimeter of the space. The principal forms of entertainment at these celebrations are music and dancing. Egyptians are very fond of music. It is a tradition that goes back to ancient times. Modern Egyptian singing sounds strange to Western ears at first. I now find it very beautiful when well performed, as I expected would be the case that evening. The drummers tuned their instruments, pottery jars of various sizes covered with animal skins drawn tight across the wide mouths, and began a soft beat. It was wonderful to watch the movements of their long fingers and supple wrists, even more wonderful to hear the variety of tone and volume their skill evoked. The beat quickened and grew louder, and other instruments joined in. 
pipes and flutes, lutes and dulcimers, and a kemenge, an odd-looking stringed instrument which is played with a bow, like a viola. The Pièce de Résistance was a performance by the most famous singer of the region, who had graciously consented to come out of retirement for this occasion. He was no longer young, but when he cupped his hand round his mouth and let his voice out, the tone was so beautiful the other musicians fell silent, so that not even the soft tap of a drum interrupted the golden notes. Tumblers and jugglers, dancing by men and by women, though not together. A famed storyteller, it went on and on, for this was a celebration not only of a marriage, but of the formalization of a relationship between two groups of people who were now united legally as well as by the bonds of affection. I would have said something to this effect had not Emerson warned me in advance that if I attempted to make a speech, he would stop me by one means or another. He made a speech instead, in his most flowery Arabic, acknowledging both young couples and quoting several verses of poetry, which were not as vulgar as I had feared they would be. The speech was very well received, especially the poetry. The evening ended with fireworks, purchased, as Selim proudly explained, at great expense. As we drove away, the spattering of firecrackers and the farewells of our friends faded into silence. The ride home in the open carriages was long, but very beautiful, for the stars shone like jewels, and the night breeze cooled faces flushed with pleasure and excitement. Emerson wrapped me tenderly in a shawl, if he had hoped to do more, he was deterred by the presence of Ramses, who explained, with incontrovertible logic, that the other carriage would have been too crowded with five. Chapter 11 An Englishman who goes native betrays every other Englishman in the East... To learn something of the language is necessary in order to avoid being cheated. To wear native attire is sometimes convenient and comfortable. But acceptance of the corrupt moral standards of the Arab lowers our prestige. The women, for example. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Emerson had them out at dawn after their late night. He had always been able to go for days without any sleep to speak of, and he expected his associates to keep up with him. Ramses would rather have dropped in his tracks than admit he couldn't, but the combination of physical fatigue and mental confusion was taking its toll, and by the end of the day he could have cheered when his mother announced that they would stop work early. Another bit of good news was her decree that they would accept no social invitations for a few days, except, of course, with one another. They had a great deal of catching up to do, she said. What she really meant was that she wanted Geoffrey and Nefret to herself for a while so that she could pry into the latter's feelings and get the former firmly under her thumb. He'd have plenty of company there. When Leah asked Ramses to come to supper on the Amelia, just the three of them, adding that if they talked too late he should stay the night, it was as if someone had offered him a hand out of a fiery furnace. He was not managing as well as he'd hoped. After they got back from the Fantasia, he had left the house, ostensibly for a walk, so he wouldn't have to watch Nefret and her husband go down the corridor to their rooms. Late as it was, when he returned, he hadn't got much sleep. There were several things he wanted to discuss with David anyhow, and he introduced the most pressing of them as soon as he decently could. They were sitting on the other deck. It had been his mother's favourite place, and it was almost unchanged, the worn, comfortable wicker settees and low hassocks with their faded chintz covers, the awning flapping overhead, the tea things set out on a low table. Leah had insisted he take off his coat and put his feet up. He hadn't realised how much of his fatigue was due to pure nerves until it began to drain out of him. "'You are rather a dear little thing,' he said with a smile. She put out her tongue at him. And you are rather a dear yourself, for a man, she added, in his mother's very tone. 
David beamed at both of them. It's good to be back and at work. You were right, though, Ramses. That is one confounded boring sight. I felt as if I were photographing the same grave over and over. A few bones, a few broken pots, a few scraps of wood or stone. Only the professor would insist on recording such rubbish. Geoffrey was a great help today, Leah said. His Arabic isn't very good, but he's a first-rate excavator, even by the professor's standards. So and meticulous. Ramses, what are you going to do about his idea that you should change places? I wanted to consult both of you about that. She handed him a cup of tea, and he took it with a nod of thanks. It was a rather outrageous suggestion, and rather out of character for him. Not so much in itself, but that he should propose it without bothering to ask Father and Mr. Reisner. Or me, come to that. Yes, but that's how one has to treat the professor, David said, his eyes twinkling. He is one of the most intimidating people I've ever met. If you don't stand up to him at the start... You're doomed to perpetual silence and servitude. Like you, his wife said, with a fond look. Well, it took me a while, David admitted. Quite a while. I agree, Ramses, that Geoffrey may have been a bit out of line. But it was a logical suggestion. One can't blame him for wanting to be with Nefret. Or wanting me out of the way. He hoped he wouldn't have to explain... Unless they saw it too, he'd have to admit, if only to himself, that he had lost his sense of proportion. There was a long, nerve-wracking pause before Leah spoke. He's still a suspect, isn't he? That hasn't changed. And, yes, if he's the one, and he's not given up his vendetta, he'd have a freer hand if you weren't there. You are a force to be reckoned with. Only one of several, but the fewer the better, from the point of view of a potential enemy. The two of you make my blood run cold, David exclaimed. You'll be suspecting a threat next. Look here. Hasn't Geoffrey an alibi for one of the incidents? According to Aunt Emilia, he was with her when the shots were fired. That's true, Ramsay said. I'm only looking at the worst possible scenario, as my dear mother taught me to do. Mr. Reisner won't be back from the Sudan until the end of the month, but Fisher is starting work shortly. I think I'll drop by Harvard camp tomorrow and ask him if he'd like to take me on. Why did I know you were going to say that? David demanded, running his hand through his hair. And why did you bother asking our opinion if you'd already made up your mind? I'm opposed, Leah said decidedly. That would mean you'd be working with Jack Reynolds. For goodness sake, Ramses, he threatened to shoot you. That's one of the reasons, Ramses said and laughed at her indignant look. Not because he threatened to shoot me, dear. He was very drunk at the time, and he seems to have settled down. But because he's also a suspect. And if I'm working with him, I can play Sherlock Holmes in my famous, insinuating and clever fashion. There's another man working at Giza, who is an even more logical suspect. Carl von Bork. Yes, Aunt Amelia mentioned him, David said. But... Aside from the fact that his wife is an artist, that's just one of Mother's little notions, Ramsay said. I can't imagine that he would involve Mary. The case against him is strong, though. He's been in Egypt a long time. Not continually, but often enough to have struck up an acquaintance with a handy forger of antiquities. He's a good philologist. He's poor and devoted to his extensive family. He's German. Our imposter sold objects to several dealers in that country, and he speaks the language. Von Bork knows us, and he knew Abdullah. Most damning of all is the fact that he once betrayed mother and father for money. His wife was dangerously ill, and he didn't realize how serious the matter was. But it shows how far he might go if he believed his family was in need. Leah drew a long breath. That's damning all right. I'd rate him suspect number one. Which, in a work of fiction, would prove his innocence. Ramsay smiled. We haven't given him enough attention, though, and it's time we did. The last steamer of the day let off a series of warning blasts, and Leah clapped her hands to her ears. I'm going down to talk to Karima about dinner, and then rest for a while. That'll give you two a chance to talk. 
Her light dress blew out around her graceful little figure as she walked to the head of the stairs, where she paused just long enough to say, "'I'll tell Karima to make up the bed in your old room, Ramses. It's yours whenever, and for as long as you want it.' Her bright head vanished below. Ramses turned an inimical look on his friend. David shook his head. "'No, my brother. I did not betray your confidence. But, well, you know women.' "'I don't think I do. They are very romantic,' David explained, with a worldly-wise air that would have amused Ramses under slightly different circumstances. "'Inveterate matchmakers. We've been so close, the four of us, and you two seemed so ideally suited in every way. Leah talked about it, that's all, just as something she would like to have happen. "'It didn't happen. Can we change the subject? One thing more.' David leaned forward. His soft brown eyes were warm with affection and concern. I'll never mention the subject again until you bring it up. But for the love of God, don't push yourself too far. You have a bad habit of doing that. Do you think I can't tell? Come here to us, if and when you like. Go to work for Reisner, so you won't have to be with them all day every day. And when you're ready... Talk to me. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I thought Ramses had abandoned the search for Rashida until one afternoon when he asked if I would go to Nefret's clinic with him. I was flattered that he should ask me and said as much. I've been wanting to visit the place, but your father put up such a fuss that I decided not to press the issue. He said that, much as he disliked her going, Nefret had a legitimate reason, but that idle curiosity was no excuse. Now, you know, Ramses, you are never inspired by idle curiosity, said my son gravely. On this occasion, your presence is necessary. Dr. Sophia knows me, but I am sure she would feel more comfortable about admitting me if I were with you. It is a forlorn hope, I'm afraid, but one I feel I must make. If you will permit me, I will give you tea at Shepherd's afterward. Say no more, I exclaimed. I am with you, or will be, as soon as I put on my hat and find my parasol. I have been in a number of the nastier sections of Cairo, but though El Wasa is an embarrassingly close proximity to Shepherd's, I'd never gone there. I had heard about it, though. It proved to be even worse than my worst imaginings, which can be, as Emerson has often remarked, pretty bad. As evening approached, the houses were preparing to open for business. I am glad to say that my presence appeared to have a sobering effect on both the women and their prospective customers. Those who caught sight of me hastily withdrew behind curtains or around corners, and the raucous vulgarities being shouted by both parties were abruptly stilled. "'Perhaps I ought to come here every evening and walk about,' I remarked, "'concealing my horror and disgust under a mask of levity. "'I keep forgetting how vile it is,' Ramses muttered. "'Father will murder me when he finds out I brought you here. "'Then we probably shouldn't tell him.' "'Ramses had sent a message ahead, so we were expected. "'I was enormously impressed by the bright, cheerful interior of the house.' and the admirable state of cleanliness that prevailed. The doctor was Syrian Christian. The women of that region have more freedom than their Egyptian counterparts, and are taking the lead in the women's movement. Sophia showed us to her office, and Ramses plunged at once into his reason for coming. He must have planned in advance exactly what to say, for he gave only the necessary facts without entering into such details as the child's striking resemblance to me and the name of the presumed father. It was an attempt at blackmail, he finished, which did not succeed. We have tried to find the girl, for I feel certain she was not a willing participant in the scheme, and it is possible Kalan might vent his anger on her in which case she might come here. Though Sophia was courteous enough to pretend she knew nothing of the matter, it was clear to me that she had heard some version of it, the most malicious and insulting version, probably. 
I also understood why Ramses had asked me to accompany him. She had been rather stiff and formal with us. I had believed it to be her normal manner until her stern face relaxed. My presence supported his explanation, which she might not have accepted otherwise. I see. I cannot recall anyone of that description. I will notify you at once, if she does come here, but I am afraid it is unlikely. We are able to help so few. We chatted for a while. She had heard of Nefret's marriage and asked me to convey her good wishes, adding, with a smile and a twinkle, that they understood why Nefret had not been able to spend much time at the clinic. I expressed my admiration for the work she was doing, and she shook her head sadly. My medical training is limited to gynecology, Mrs. Emerson. We need a surgeon, but where are we to get one? Even if we could find a man who would be willing to donate his services, it might get us in trouble with the religious authorities. There are so few women being trained in that specialty. We were about to take our leave when she said, Perhaps I ought not to ask, but you said the child's father is English. Would he be able to help you locate the young woman? He was a tourist, I said. It was not a long-lasting relationship, I believe. Expressed with your well-known irony, Mrs. Emerson. They will do it, the irresponsible creatures. I believe you are being ironic now, I said. Irresponsible is certainly an understatement. Aside from the moral issues, they risk catching some singularly unpleasant diseases. How many men and women guide their actions according to safety and common sense, was the inquiry. The more sophisticated of them do take the usual precautions. She hesitated, her pleasant face hardening, and then added, The most sophisticated use only girls who are, who had remained untouched. When we were outside the house, Ramses drew my arm through his. Mother, I'm sorry. I thought you knew. I know such things happen. I saw she was very young. I was unable to continue. I should never have taken you there. Forgive me. I gave myself a little shake. It is for you to forgive me. I do not often yield to weakness, I believe, but it is one thing to contemplate such a vile act in the abstract, quite another to think of its being committed by a man one knows, a man whose hand one has taken. Yes, Ramsay said, I understand. Shepherd's Terrace was crowded, as it always is at tea time, but I never had any difficulty in finding a place. Mr. Baylor now owned the hotel, and his successor as manager was just as obliging. I went to freshen up. By the time I returned, Freddy was waiting to show me to a choice table near the railing. Ramses was slow in joining me. I presumed he had encountered an acquaintance, so I amused myself by observing the passing crowds, one of whom, as I was soon to discover, had also observed me. Percy was not in uniform so I did not notice him until he was almost at my side taken by surprise I was unable to conceal the shock and disgust I felt even supposing I had been inclined to do so he read my countenance and hastened to speak Aunt Amelia I've been haunting shepherds this past week in the hope of seeing you may I offer you tea no you had better take yourself off before I express my opinion of you loudly enough to be heard by everyone on the terrace. Ah. Oh. His face took on a look of quiet suffering. Then the rumours I've heard? I don't know what you've heard. If they accuse my son of one of the vilest crimes a man can commit, they are lies. Had you not lost all semblance of decency, you would clear Ramses and avoid the company of those who know the truth. But that is what I want to do, Percy exclaimed vehemently. To clear myself with you, at any rate. Won't you hear my side of it? You did not used to be unjust. Ostentatiously, I consulted my lapel watch. You have sixty seconds. 
he had remained standing. He did not venture now to sit down, but he put both hands on the back of a chair and leaned forward, lowering his voice. The child may be mine. I don't deny the possibility. No, no, please let me finish. I knew nothing of it, I swear. When I was lost in Cairo, I was young and foolish and easily led. But the, the act that led to the present difficulty was a single aberration, and one of which I am bitterly ashamed. I will do anything in my power to put things right. Money, any amount you think proper. He broke off with a strangled gasp and straightened, staring over my shoulder at something. I knew what it was, of course, even before I turned my head. The tables are very close together, Ramses, I said. If you strike him, he will fall over and injure some innocent people. Percy, I warned you, you had only a minute. You ought to have heeded my advice. Ramsay's fists uncurled, but I thought I had better take hold of his arm just to be on the safe side. Percy had backed away as far as he could, only a step or two, but he had apparently decided he could risk a few more words. I meant what I said, Aunt Amelia. Do you believe I spoke the truth? I don't care whether you spoke the truth or not, I said. "'What you did is indefensible, and your attempts to excuse yourself only make it worse. "'I really don't think I can restrain Ramses much longer, Percy, and I'm not at all certain I care to. "'Go away, and never darken my door again.' "'Very well.' "'He bowed and backed up another few steps, glancing behind him in order to avoid running into a tourist.' I had meant to call on Lefret to offer my felicitations, but I almost lost hold of Ramses. Percy beat a hasty retreat, weaving a path among the closely crowded tables with an agility born of a strong sense of self-preservation. Sit down, I said. A public scene would only fuel the gossip. I remember once you asked me for permission to pound Percy. I am sorry now I didn't let you. I shouldn't have given myself away, Ramses muttered. He only suspected before. Now he knows. Oh, I'm sure he already knew how thoroughly you detest him. What did he say before I arrived on the scene? The angry colour began to fade from Ramses' cheeks. He admitted the child might be his. It was a single aberration that occurred when he was young and easily led. He's good, Ramses said with grudging admiration. He admits the truth only when he's backed into a corner and then twists it to the best advantage. Well, my dear, we can be sure he will avoid us in future. I believe I made my feelings clear. Shall we order now? I could do with a nice hot cup of tea. Two days later, the body of a young woman was found caught in the reeds along the river bank, just above the barrage. We would probably not have heard of it had not Ramsay's persistent inquiries made the Cairo police aware of our interest in any such discovery. It was Mr. Russell, the assistant commissioner, who informed us, or Ramsay's to be precise. Ramsay's did not tell us until after he'd seen the remains. A certain identification was impossible, since the body had been in the water for several days, but the general description matched that of Rashida and, twisted round the neck, was a string of cheap beads like one she had owned. She'd been stabbed a number of times. The police attributed the killing to a hashahin, for similar cases were known. Excessive use of the drug may induce a homicidal frenzy. We were unable to find any trace of Kalan. Emerson believed he had left Cairo and was lying low, Ramses appeared to have lost interest in him. There are too many others like him, he said with a shrug. The next few weeks were without incident. I found this very alarming. Emerson scoffed at me when I expressed my forebodings. 
He always scoffs at my forebodings. But as I pointed out to him, an enemy who has already perpetrated several violent attacks, and a murder is not likely to change his skin. This prompted another rude remark from Emerson on the subject of mixed metaphors. But I knew what I meant, and so did he. When I say all was quiet, I do not mean that a great many things were not going on. We dined with the Vandergilts, and they dined with us. I gave a series of quiet but elegant dinner parties to welcome David and Leah, and to honour the other young couple. All four of them, not to mention Emerson, had argued against my original idea of a large reception at one of the hotels, so I'd been forced to give in. I do not enjoy such large social events, but I had wanted to outface the gossips. All in all, we had provided the narrow little world of Cairo society with a good deal of gossip that season, and I felt sure they were now engaged in malicious speculation on the suddenness of Nefret's marriage. When I mentioned this to Emerson, he gave me one of the coldest looks I'd ever received from that quarter. What sort of speculation? he demanded. You know, Emerson, they will be counting the days. Until what? Don't glower at me that way, and don't pretend you don't understand. I do understand, Emerson snarled. Confounded Peabody! Are all women so prurient and judgmental? Yes, I think so. They were happy to believe the worst, as the saying has it, of poor Maud Reynolds, and in their narrow little minds there is only one reason why a young woman would give up an elaborate church wedding with all the attendant fuss and ceremony. You know I don't believe it, Emerson. I only wanted... I know. His stern face softened. You wanted to indicate your love and support for Nefret, and tell the gossips to go to the devil. Never mind, Peabody. She doesn't give a curse about the opinions of such people, and neither should we. So I sent out my invitations, and in succeeding days we entertained practically every archaeologist in the Cairo area, and some from farther away. The Petries were not among them. The fact is, I did not get on with Mrs. Petrie any better than Emerson got on with her husband. Since women are more courteous than men or greater hypocrites, according to a source I need not name. Hilda Petrie and I expressed our antipathy by being frigidly polite when we were forced to meet, and by offering specious excuses for meeting as seldom as possible. I invited her. She wrote back to say she had a touch of catarrh, or a slight sprain, or nothing suitable to wear. Thus the civilities were maintained to the benefit of all. Monsieur Maspero also declined my invitation. I knew why he avoided us. It was shame, pure and simple, to see Emerson's superb talents wasted on a sight as dreary as a Wyatt, while selfishly retaining the pyramids and cemeteries of Dachour for lesser men might have shaken even Maspero's superb French sang-froid. To make matters worse, the disposition of the vast cemetery field of Giza was still in debate. Originally, it had been broken up into three sections, which were allotted to the Germans, the Italians, and Mr. Reisner. But a few years later, Signor Schiaparelli of the Turin Museum had abandoned the Italian concession. In theory, this was divided between the other two, but they were still arguing about precisely who got what. The obvious solution to hand over at least part of the Italian area to the most distinguished excavator of this or any other century, I believe I need not name names, was ignored by all those concerned. Emerson flatly refused even to mention the matter to Maspero and threatened me with divorce if I did so. This was, of course, just one of his little jokes. However, I decided not to speak to Monsieur Maspero. The temporary loss of his son had not improved Emerson's disposition. For the past fortnight, Ramses had been working at Giza in place of Geoffrey. He had very properly announced his intentions to Emerson, whose noble nature had prevented him from objecting. There may have been just a slight touch of ignoble pride involved as well. 
It would not have been in character for Emerson to admit he would miss not only Ramsay's professional skills, but Ramsay's himself. Secretly, Emerson had hoped that Mr. Fisher, who was in charge at Giza until Mr. Reisner returned, would refuse to countenance this somewhat unorthodox arrangement without consulting his superior. Unfortunately, Fisher knew Reisner's high opinion of my son and fell upon the scheme with shameless enthusiasm. He wrote at once to Reisner, who was messing about in Middle Egypt, and eventually received approval, but not until after Ramses had already been at Giza for over a week. It did not comfort Emerson to know, as he did, that the Harvard-Boston expedition was working in an area where they had already discovered wonderful things. Shortly after Ramses began, the Americans came upon a new tomb containing beautifully painted and carved scenes, a fine limestone statue, and other interesting items. It was enough to make Emerson's mouth water, especially when he returned each morning to scattered bones and broken pots. He knew Ramsay's motives for abandoning us were not selfish. He knew it, but he envied him all the same. One useful result of this arrangement was the re-establishment of relations with Jack Reynolds. Though he had straightened himself out, with a little hope from me, he had rather avoided us. It is difficult to work in close proximity to a man who has accused you of murdering his sister. I had no fear for Ramsay's safety, since I knew he was quite capable of looking after himself, but I took the earliest possible opportunity of asking him how he and Jack were getting on. He assured me Jack had been perfectly civil and helpful. I therefore invited Jack to one of our little dinner parties, so I could see for myself. Jack was on time, suitably dressed, and apparently sober. He had brought two large bouquets, one for each of the brides, which he presented with appropriately flowery speeches. As usual, there were more men than ladies present. Howard Carter was in town, and young Mr. Lawrence, who'd been working with Mr. Petrie, and who was loud in his praises. I must say that tact was not one of the young man's strong points. Fulsome praise of one's host's chief rival does not endear one to the said host, and he committed another faux pas by insulting the Egyptian workmen he had encountered. I heard a few words. Horribly ugly, dull, low-spirited, foul-mouthed, and fawning, before Ramses interrupted with a polite inquiry about Mr. Petrie's health. Jack, whom I had placed across the table from me so I could watch him, had also overheard. That's certainly not true of our people, he announced. Perhaps it has something to do with the attitude of the man in charge. Mr. Reisner has always been on the best of terms with his workmen. I gave him an approving smile. Quite true. There have been no problems with the theft of antiquities, have there? There are always problems with theft, Emerson grumbled, especially with Maspero refusing to heed accusations against his favourites. That disgraceful business at Saqqara. I was unable to administer a little kick to Emerson, since he was at the other end of the table. So I raised my voice to a particularly penetrating pitch and dragged the conversation back onto the track, with, I admit, something of a jolt. I suppose you have all also heard about the sales of antiquities this past summer, purporting to have come from the collection of our late rice, Abdallah? Some of you may not know that these objects are fakes, and that they were sold by a man who had assumed the name and identity of David here. The first time I made this announcement at a dinner party, Emerson had choked on a morsel of food, and I had had to trot quickly round the table and pound him on the back. When he complained later that I ought to have warned him, I replied that I would have done so had I known in advance what I was going to do. In fact, the idea came to me all of a sudden, as clever ideas often do, and I had seized the moment, so to speak. David's decision to bring the matter of the forgeries out into the open had cut the Gordian knot. How to pursue our inquiries without admitting what we were inquiring about. It would be some time before he could expect to receive replies to the letters he had written, 
but now there was no reason for us to maintain reticence with our professional acquaintances. Some of them might be able to contribute useful information. One, caught off guard by my unexpected candor, might betray himself by a start of surprise or a look of guilt. Thus far, no one had. On this occasion, there was a good deal of surprise, but nothing I could view as guilt. The surprise stemmed in part from my assertion that Abdullah had not collected antiquities. The truth is, some of them were sorry he had not. A good many of our acquaintances were enthusiastic collectors, for themselves or for various institutions. They agreed in theory that illegal excavations ought to be stopped, but took a pessimistic view of the chances of doing it. Mr. Lawrence, continuing his exercise in tactlessness, was the first to voice aloud a view held by many. The chap can't have been English. He must be an Egyptian, educated abroad, perhaps, with some superficial knowledge of the antiquities business. There aren't that many such persons. He should be easy to identify. He might be, if your assumptions were correct, I replied. They are not. You must learn not to leap to conclusions, Mr. Lawrence, if you wish to succeed in your profession. Work on our cemeteries continued. The tombs were small and poor in grave goods, but even they had been robbed and the bones of their occupants scattered. It was extremely boring. Cyrus grew bored too. Eventually, he announced that since nothing untoward had occurred for some time, he and Catherine thought they could risk leaving us long enough to make a quick trip to Luxor. Emerson encouraged this decision, since he hadn't believed he needed Cyrus's protection anyhow. So we saw them off and went back to our rubbish heaps. One afternoon, as we were packing the scraps for removal to the house, I allowed myself to express my increasing frustration. "'Emerson, if I have to put together one more early dynastic beer jar, I will scream. "'Why can't we investigate the substructure of the pyramid?' "'Geoffrey looked up from the box in which he was packing potsherds. "'His fair hair was wet with perspiration. "'Pushing it back under his pith helmet, he said with a smile, "'Your penchant for the interiors of pyramids is well known, Mrs. Emerson, "'but exploring this one would certainly be a waste of time.' I will determine what is a waste of time, Emerson grunted. He sat down on a rock and took out his pipe. As usual, he had misplaced his hat, and the sun beat down on his bare black head. Come back to the shelter and have something to drink, I said. The rest of you had better do the same. You're looking very warm. We withdrew to the shade, therefore, leaving Selim to finish packing the objects, and I made everyone take a glass of tea. Nefret removed her hat and wiped her wet forehead. I agree, she declared. What with? Emerson's mind was already on something else. That we ought to shift to another location. Haven't you taught us that we must leave something to be excavated by future archaeologists who may have developed more advanced techniques? We've done enough to know that this cemetery is purely early dynastic. There are later graves elsewhere. They might give us a clue as to the identity of the builder of the pyramid. We already know that, darling, Geoffrey said. The vases in the mastaba we found last year have the name of a king, Kaba. Whoever he was, Nefret said dismissively. He's not mentioned in any of the king lists. Anyhow, you can't attribute a pyramid to a particular king by means of objects found in a nearby tomb. Sometimes it's the only indication, sweetheart, Geoffrey said mildly. Third and fourth dynasty pyramids aren't inscribed. This one is probably even earlier. Mr. Reisner believes, but you only excavated one mastaba. There are others on the north side. Geoffrey sat up and clasped his arms around his bent knees. A few weeks working with Emerson had toughened the lad. His bare forearms were evenly tanned, and his wet shirt moulded well-shaped shoulders. Your point is well taken, dearest, so long as there aren't any more accidents like the one that came close to injuring Ramses. When I think that it might have been you down there, my blood runs cold. Nefret's lips tightened. Geoffrey's concern was natural for a bridegroom, but he would have to learn that she would not tolerate being treated like a fragile blossom. I could see a quarrel building, so I intervened. 
I assure you, Geoffrey, that Emerson does not take unnecessary risks or allow his people to do so. That was an unfortunate accident. I still cannot account for it. Emerson brushed this distraction aside. I would like to settle the question of the ownership once and for all, he admitted, and perhaps get some clue as to why there are no signs of a burial in the pyramid. They must have buried the rascal somewhere, you know. If not in the pyramid, where? And why not in the pyramid? Well, sir, Geoffrey began. Emerson bent a hard blue gaze upon him, and he closed his mouth. The rest of us had known the questions were purely rhetorical. Emerson was about to lecture. He does not care to be interrupted when he is lecturing. The other so-called pyramid here at Zawayat el Aryan was also empty. Admittedly, it was never finished. There's no sign of a cursed superstructure. There was a burial chamber, though, with a sarcophagus in place at the bottom of a pit that had been painstakingly filled with huge stone blocks. The lid of the sarcophagus was still in place, and there wasn't a scrap inside it, which leaves us with the same question. Where did they put the bust, the uh, king's mummy? What is your theory, my dear? I inquired, knowing that he was going to tell us anyhow. I haven't got a theory, said Emerson, aggravatingly. But I will tell you one thing, Peabody. I am not finished with the pyramid yet. Oh, Emerson, I exclaimed, clasping my hands to my breast. You believe that the burial chamber may be a blind? That there are passages and chambers as yet undiscovered? Control yourself, Peabody, said my affectionate husband. You're always hoping for unknown passages and chambers. It comes of reading sensational fiction. Such devices are singularly lacking in real life. He turned to Geoffrey, who started nervously. You weren't one of the ones who entered the place last year. I had a look. We all did. I was in charge of the cemetery, though. It was Mr. Reisner and Jack who investigated the pyramid. Hmm, said Emerson. We'll go on with the excavation of the private tombs. I also want a closer look at the outside of the structure. I cannot believe there was not a casing of some sort, though you say you found no traces of such a thing. There is a slight overhang on the face of the seventh layer. The young men listened with a convincing appearance of interest as Emerson continued to expound on construction techniques. Leah's blue eyes were fixed on David with that look of tenderness one likes to observe on the face of a young bride. Nefret was not looking at anyone. Head bent, brow frowning, she stared at the toes of her scuffed little boots. I wondered if she was thinking of those other little boots and the girl who had worn them. Though Emerson would never have admitted it, since he does not like to be considered sentimental, I knew that one of the reasons why he had postponed returning to the interior of the pyramid was his reluctance to return to a scene that held painful memories. How difficult would it be for Nefret? I reminded myself to ask Emerson whether all evidence of the tragedy had been cleared away, Ramses had said there hadn't been much blood. He hadn't mentioned other things. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses had told David about his meetings with Wardani. David hadn't liked it one damn bit. They were sitting on the upper deck of the Amelia when the conversation took place. It wasn't late, but Leah had gone to bed, and the last of the tourists had left long ago. Only the stars and a slim crescent moon and the crimson glow of David's pipe broke the darkness. "'I grant you your right to a certain interest in my affairs,' David said, after he had cooled down. "'But I don't need you to look after me, Ramses. Not in this, at any rate. "'I know you don't need me to look after you, "'but you couldn't consider lending your support to one of the more moderate organizations. "'You have a wife. Don't bring her into this.' Would you allow a woman or a man to keep you from what you consider your duty? Ramsay sighed. David, I know how you feel. No, you don't. You try, but you can't know. You've never been in danger of being imprisoned or beaten half to death because you expressed unpopular opinions. 
you are sacrosanct because of your nationality and your class. Have you ever seen a man flogged? As they were at Denshawi? Once. The silence lengthened uncomfortably. In case you wonder why I didn't stop it, Ramsay said, biting the words off. It is because I was tied to a post waiting my turn. David didn't make the mistake of apologising. You never told me. What happened? Ramses took out a cigarette and lit it. Oh, father arrived, hurling thunderbolts. He always does, you know. Even in the dark he could sense David's distress. In a gentler voice he went on. You were in Paris that summer. The business was hushed up. It was, as the diplomatists say, a matter of some delicacy. You were in Palestine. So that's why you... No, that's not why I was ill last year. I told you. Father appeared before they'd got well started. However, the incident did rather lessen my tolerance for the Ottoman Empire. Well, Dani is soft on the Turks. It's understandable. Co-religionists and all that. But there's an awful lesson to be learned from the young Turks. They started out as reformers and revolutionaries, too. Now they've been in power a while... They're becoming as corrupt as the old regime. And the penal system in the provinces is unchanged. It's still the Kobash, and execution without trial, and absolute power for the local magistrates, some of whom have extremely ugly habits. I won't see that happen here, David. Not if I can prevent it. Britain has a lot to answer for, but not as much as the Sultan. There was another thing the experience had taught him but he couldn't admit it even to David. Watching a man beaten to death by an expert who carried out his duties with cold-blooded skill had been a new experience. The business had taken quite a long time, and they had made sure he saw every stroke of the courbash and heard every scream. By the time they removed the bloody remains and fastened him up in their place, he had been ready to scream or beg for mercy. And he'd have done it, too, if his father hadn't arrived. To say the Kobash was the only thing he feared would have been a lie. He was afraid of a lot of things, but it was the only thing he feared more than death. David began. There's surely no danger of Egypt becoming an Ottoman province again. Legally, it still is, you know. Why do you suppose they call it the Veiled Protectorate? Britain has never formally annexed the country. Cromer's titles were consular agent and minister plenipotentiary, even though he was the ultimate power in Egypt for 30 years. Now Kitchener is in the same position. He's out to crush the nationalists, and he's done a damned thorough job of it. Well, Dani is the only leader who isn't in prison or in exile, and he can't elude the authorities much longer. If he succumbs to the temptation to assassinate someone... He won't go to prison. He'll be executed. And so may you be, if you are known to be one of his lieutenants. His voice had risen, and he had talked himself breathless. He stopped, struggling to regain control. I hadn't thought of it that way, David said, in his quiet, gentle voice. I know it was your concern for me that prompted you to seek out Wardani. Not entirely. We are hoping to use one another for our own selfish ends. Ramsay smiled cynically. He wasn't able to help with the business of the forgeries, except in a negative way. But even that is something. He knew what the next question would be, and put an end to the conversation by yawning and getting to his feet. Leah won't thank me for detaining you any longer, and I have some notes to write up before I get to sleep. Good night. The notes were not written up that night. He had other business, and it was almost morning before he'd returned to his room through the window he had left open. He'd been at it for over a week before Nemesis, in the shape of Wardani, caught up with him. Returning from Giza that afternoon, he found a charming little note from Lear inviting him to supper. David says if you don't turn up, he will come and fetch you. He'd hoped he could snatch a few hours' sleep before going out again, but he knew better than to refuse the invitation. 
The message was clear. The only thing he didn't know was what particular piece of bad news David wanted to discuss with him. David didn't leave him in doubt for long. Ramses had asked for coffee instead of tea, hoping it would keep him from falling asleep, and Leah had gone down to tell Karima, leaving them alone on the upper deck. The sun was low in the west, and the shapes of the Giza pyramids were framed in gold. I've had a message from my friend, David said. We're to meet him at eleven at the Café Oriental. We? Oui? He said I must bring you. That sounds like him. Will you go? I suppose I must. What have you told Leah? As much as I know, which isn't a great deal. He didn't say why he wanted to see us, only that it was important. She's not happy about it, but she said she'd worry less if you were with me. Trusting little soul, Ramsay said. Doesn't she know that most of the trouble you've got into was caused by me? Leah came up the stairs in time to hear this. David's as bad as you are, she said, but there won't be any trouble tonight, will there? She looked so sweet and troubled. Ramses wished he were brother to a few demons, so he could cast a spell that would send Wardani to Timbuktu and turn David into a sedentary, usurious scholar. Not a chance of it, he said firmly. Good heavens, Leah. The fellow isn't a killer. He's a, a friend of ours. The Café Oriental is perfectly respectable. We won't have to go down any dark streets or alleyways to get there. The last two sentences were accurate, anyhow. The café was on the musky, in the European quarter. They had been told to sit in the inner room, in as dark a corner as they could find. The whole room was dark, lit only by a few hanging lamps, and the air was close and hot and foggy with smoke. By the time they had been waiting for almost an hour, the innumerable cups of coffee Ramses had drunk weren't doing the job. His head felt as if it were coming loose from his body, and his stomach was churning. He should have known the bastard would keep him waiting. The man who approached them wore the uniform of an Egyptian army sergeant. He wore it with a swagger, his tarbouche set squarely on the top of his head, his boots gleaming. Overdoing it a bit, aren't you? Ramsay said. The panache? Wardani lowered himself into a chair. If you read my insignia, you will observe I am a long way from my regiment. On leave, of course. He offered his hands to David. Accept my felicitations and welcome, my brother. If it had been up to your friend here, we might not have met again. He told me, David said. He did? Wardani sounded surprised, and Ramsay smiled to himself. We too are brothers, David said. Then you will be pleased to hear that it was for your brother's sake I summoned you here. He snapped his fingers and ordered coffee from the waiter. Ramses remained silent. It was David who asked, What do you mean? Well, Danny waited until the waiter had painstakingly unloaded three glasses of water and three small cups of Turkish coffee. Then he looked directly at Ramses. You were seen recently with Thomas Russell. No doubt you've already collected the firing squad, Ramses said, trying to conceal his chagrin. He hadn't noticed he was being followed that day. Why shouldn't I see him? He's a friend of the family. A slight acquaintance, Wardani corrected. And a policeman. But Russell's stationed in Alexandria, David said. He's been transferred to Cairo, assistant commissioner. And you can thank God for it, Ramsay said. He took a sip of the coffee and wished he hadn't. He's an honest man, and a good policeman, unlike his present superior. Harvey Pasha is a pompous fool. I knew there was no use going to him with the story you told me. He'd scoff at the idea that a sahib was involved in the drug business. Russell didn't scoff. Mother said he'd offered me a job. She thought he was joking. He wasn't. It's nice to be in such demand. Everybody wants me. Reisner, Fisher, Father, Russell... 
Almost everybody. David put a hand on his shoulder and shook him. Get hold of yourself. Are you telling me you are working for Russell as a police spy? Call it what you like. I'll do whatever I must to find the swine and stop him. David's hand was oddly steadying. He took a deep breath and tried to focus on the narrow, dark face under the tarbush. If you know I saw Russell, you know why. If I succeed, you'll hear about it. Why the devil did you drag me here tonight when I could have been more usefully employed? Well, I thought that was the reason, Ordani said calmly. But some of my people had certain doubts. Watch yourself, Ramses. I believe I've convinced my friends that you mean us no harm. But a few of the lads are a bit hot-headed. And there are others in Cairo who wouldn't mind seeing you out of the way. You astonish me, Ramsay said. Now can we go home? No, David kept his voice low. Not until I know more about this. What others? The man he is looking for, to mention only one. Wadani well, lit another cigarette. He's an effendi, and a member of your own superior caste. He may be someone you know. If that's the case, he also knows you, Ramses. I presume you're trying to infiltrate one of the gangs in some disguise or other. All I'm saying is that it had better be a damned good disguise. What others? David repeated inflexibly. The man who killed that girl, or perhaps I should say the men who killed those girls. Wodani grinned unpleasantly. Even mentioning them in the same breath would offend a lot of people, wouldn't it? The whore may have been killed by her pimp or one of her customers, but the American girl didn't jump down that shaft of her own accord. If you want... That's enough, David said. My dear chap, I'm only trying to help. Wodani opened his eyes very wide. But I'd best be on my way. You'll hear from me soon again, David. My respectful salutations to your wife. And to the lovely Miss Forth, who is now, I believe, no longer a miss. Her husband is a fortunate man. David's hand pressed down on Ramsay's shoulder. We will convey your good wishes. Oh, absolutely, Ramsay's agreed. Not to the Honourable Mr. Godwin, though, Wardani said. He looked very pleased with himself, like a student who has come up with the right answer against all the teacher's expectations. He's a sahib of sorts, isn't he? He'd be shocked to learn you were acquainted with a reprobate like me. He rose and brushed fastidiously at his tunic. We mustn't leave together. Stay here for another half hour. Drink coffee. If I drink any more coffee, I'll be sick, Ramses muttered, as the slender, upright figure sauntered toward the door. Damn the fellow and his insinuations and his arrogance and his... Have tea, then, or an argile. David snapped his fingers. Or a little hashish. It's quite tasty when it's made into sweet meats. What you do is you take a quantity of honey and stop it. David's voice was soft, but it cracked like a whip. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what? What Donny covered a number of subjects in a remarkably short period of time. He's usually more verbose. I am going to be sick, he added, and lowered his head onto his folded arms. Drink your tea, David said. Then I'll take you home to Leah, and we'll put you to bed. Yes, fine, Ramsay said vaguely. A hand slipped under his forehead and lifted his head. You're not drunk, David said, inspecting him, or feverish. You're dead tired. That's all that's wrong with you. No wonder, working all day and prowling the streets all night. Or is it the wharves or the desert roads? Talk about arrogance. How long did you think you could keep this up? Here, drink it. The tea was so hot he could feel blisters rising on his tongue, but he choked some of it down. 
That's better, he said, in mild surprise. Let's get out of here. David put a hand under his arm and hauled him to his feet. Maybe what you need is a drink. We'll stop at Shepherd's and get a cab from there. And on the way back to the Emilia, you will tell me exactly what you've done so that we can decide what we are going to do next. The nightlife of Cairo went on till all hours, and the streets of the European section were bright and busy. Lights twinkled in the dark groves of the Azbekia Gardens. I don't want a drink, Ramsay said. Let's go home. All right. David hailed one of the open barouche, and they got in. Well? Well what? David slapped him across the face, just hard enough to sting. Wake up! I'm not angry yet, Ramses, but I soon will be if you continue to hide things from me. Why did you agree to work for us all? A girl has been murdered. Your mother has been attacked. The family may be in danger, and you are killing yourself, trying to track down a man who has nothing to do with... Oh, good Lord. He does, doesn't he? I ought to have known. Talk to me, damn it! Don't hit me again. Ramses mumbled. I'll talk. I was going to, but you kept yelling at me. Yes, I mean, yes, he does. It's the same man, David. The Sahib is using your name, too. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. Chapter 12 In the East, an Englishman must be willing to die rather than show a streak of yellow. The courage of a single individual raises the prestige of all. The cowardice of one man reflects on all his peers. I endeavoured in my own humble way to live up to this standard. I sat in the little room I had fitted up as an office, looking out over the garden, now being brought back to its former beauty, and I could not help thinking with pardonable complacency of how well our new living arrangements were working. Initially, Emerson had objected to the size of the house, but as it turned out, we needed all the space at our disposal. Our infantile charge required, in my expert opinion, several rooms, including one for her nurse, the lower areas, which I used for storage of artefacts, were rapidly filling up. Not, alas, with statues and steely like the ones Mr. Reisner had been finding, but with bones and broken vessels of stone and pottery. Nefret and Geoffrey occupied the entire wing that had once been the harem. They had all the privacy they desired, and so did the other young couple, though Ramses had taken to spending a great deal of time with them. Lately he had spent more nights on the Dahabiya than at the house. It was none of my business, of course, if they preferred it that way. I had left my door ajar, and since the room opened onto the main corridor, I heard the tap of heels and was thus able to call out to Nefret when she came along. She hadn't meant to stop, I believe. Looking in, she began, I don't want to disturb you, Aunt Amelia. Come in. I leaned back in my chair. "'It's almost tea time. I was just going... "'If you will wait a bit, I will go with you. Where is Geoffrey?' "'Realising that I had caught her fairly, she wandered to the window and stood looking out. "'There were no Mastrabia screens on this side of the house. "'The wooden shutters stood open to the warm afternoon air. "'Her back to me, she said. "'He went to see Jack. He's worried about him. "'Why?' Ramsay says he's behaving normally. Nefret turned. Ramsay's a damned liar. Ramsay's never lies. However, I admitted, he is an expert at equivocation. What makes you think he's misleading us about Jack? Jack is behaving oddly again. He refused your last invitation, and he's avoiding other people. Geoffrey says he spends most of his free time prowling the hills with a gun. When he can't find anything else, he shoots jackals. Is he drinking? Her slim shoulders lifted in a shrug. I'd better go and see for myself, I said, putting my papers into a neat pile and rising from my chair. 
I was afraid you would say that. Please, Aunt Amelia, don't go rushing off. Geoffrey said he would try to bring Jack here for tea today. Very well. I will wait and see if he comes. Nefret came and stood by my desk. She picked up a sheet of paper and examined it. Will Ramses be here? I don't know. He's got in the habit of having tea with David and Leah. In fact, I believe he went to the Dahabia earlier, as soon as he got back from Giza. We haven't seen a great deal of them lately. You see them every day at the site, I pointed out. No doubt they appreciate their time alone together. You know, Nefret, that if you and Geoffrey would prefer to take tea or any other meals in your rooms, I would understand perfectly. Thank you. But we are both quite happy with things the way they are. Nefret? Yes? She looked directly at me, and the words that had risen to my lips died there. It was as if a door had slammed shut behind her eyes. "'I've been revising my little fairy tale,' I said, indicating the paper she held. Uh, "'What do you think?' "'I'm no expert, Aunt Amelia.' She glanced at the page. I had the feeling she had not really looked at it until then. "'On the language? No more am I. What is wanted here is an examination of Signor Hay's motives, and for that one needs not only a profound understanding of human nature, but a familiarity with the sometimes oblique terms in which the ancient Egyptians expressed it. Everyone assumes that Sinyehe was a member of the conspiracy directed against the rightful heir, and indeed it is hard to conceive of another explanation for his flight and his fear of returning to Egypt, but Sinyehe claims he only learned of the plot by overhearing one of the conspirators talking. At least that is how I interpret a rather enigmatic passage. And that he was so terrified and dismayed, he fled. If that version is correct, he would be guilty of nothing worse than Cardis. Obviously it isn't correct, Nefret said. It's the official version, the diplomatic lie. I think he was in the conspiracy up to his neck, and that what he overheard was a statement by one of Senyuset's supporters to the effect that the new pharaoh was already on his way to claim the throne, that he knew all about the plot, and that the loyalists in the army were about to arrest the guilty parties. Hmm, I said. Yes, that is also my interpretation. And when, after many years, he begged forgiveness, she forgave him, Nefret said. She picked up the drawing that I knew was her favourite, the old man sitting at peace in his garden, looking out at the symbols of eternal life. He'd been in the service of the princess, hadn't he? She was now queen. She forgave him because she had loved him, and because she knew how badly he wanted to come home. The silence that followed was broken only by the soft chirping of sparrows in the tamarisk tree outside the window until one of Nama's sudden outrageous howls made Nefret laugh and me swear, under my breath, naturally. I put my work away, and we went to the courtyard. It was Geoffrey who'd come in. He was the only one there, except for Fatima, who was setting the table for tea. "'Weren't you able to bring him?' I asked. "'Bring who?' inquired Emerson, emerging. I explained. Geoffrey admitted he hadn't been able to convince Jack to join us. Von Bork dropped by while I was there, he added. I suppose Jack felt he couldn't abandon a guest. You should have asked Carl, too, I said. Oh, I couldn't presume to do that. He had presumed to invite Jack, though. I reminded myself that the situation was entirely different, and gestured to Nefret to pour. Geoffrey jumped up, took the cup from her, and carried it to me. Here you are, Mrs. Emerson. Thank you. I think perhaps you ought to start calling me Aunt Emilia, if you would care to. May I? His face lit up. I hoped I might, but I didn't want to presume, said Emerson, around the stem of his pipe. He said it fairly pleasantly, however, and the dimple in Geoffrey's thin cheek deepened as he glanced from Emerson to me. I gathered he had been warned not to refer to Emerson as Uncle Radcliffe. 
So, how is Jack? I inquired. Ought I to call on him, do you think? He isn't drinking, Geoffrey said, at least not to excess. One can't mistake the signs, you know. I would say he's still suffering from melancholia. Depression is the modern psychological term, I remarked. Peabody, said Emerson, in an ominous growl. Yes, my dear, I beg your pardon. I know how you feel about psychology. Call it what you will. Jack is not in a healthy state. We must shake him out of it. I agree, Geoffrey said earnestly. I tried to persuade him to come with us tonight to the reception at the agency, but he said he had another engagement. I am not going to the agency, said Emerson, in the same tone in which he would have announced that the sun was due to rise in the east next day. Oh, no, sir, I never supposed you would. Nefret sat immobile, her cup in her hand. Did you suppose I would? She asked in a very gentle voice. But, darling, you said you would. Geoffrey turned impulsively to her. Yesterday, don't you remember? Sir John Maxwell will be there, and you know what influence he wields with the Department of Antiquities. A word in his ear, especially from you, might do great things for the professor. Oh, Nefret put her cup down on the table. I'm afraid I wasn't paying attention. Are you sure you feel up to it? What's wrong, Geoffrey? I asked. Nothing at all, ma'am, honestly. I told Nefret she mustn't fuss. He gave his wife a look of gentle reproach. She flushed. All right, then. Wear your new frock, Geoffrey urged. The one that has all the colours of the sea off southern Greece. It makes your eyes sparkle like aquamarines. Uh, would you care to go with us, Mrs. Uh, Aunt Emilia? I suppose you don't need a chaperone, I remarked dryly. Did you tell Fatima you would not be dining at home? Good heavens, I forgot, Geoffrey said apologetically. Fatima, passing round a plate of little cucumber sandwiches, hastened to assure him it did not matter. Emerson had been grumbling to himself. I don't want people phoning on the Department of Antiquities on my account, he announced loudly. Someone had better do it, I informed him, since you keep antagonizing Monsieur Maspero, and you won't let me... He interrupted me, of course, and we had a refreshing little discussion. After tea, Nefret and Geoffrey went to change, and Emerson and I proceeded to the nursery. I had been forced to forbid Senia to join us for tea until Emerson learned to behave himself. Not only did he allow her to eat every biscuit on the plate, but he smuggled sweets from the kitchen in his pockets. We had a very enjoyable little interlude, though Senia kept demanding Ramses, and Emerson had to play lion before she was pacified. Later, we found ourselves a deux at the dining table. The situation was so unusual that at first all we could do was stare blankly at one another. Emerson burst out laughing. Alone at last! Good gad, Peabody, has it come to this? What the devil are we going to do when they've all gone off and left us? I'm sure you will think of something, Emerson. Quite right, my love. He blew me a kiss from the other end of the table. Fatima beamed sentimentally, and Emerson looked embarrassed. Well, um, as I was about to say, it is a pleasure to have you to myself. We've got a number of things to discuss, Peabody. I say, what's this? He stared suspiciously at the plate Fatima had put in front of him. Deviled beef, I replied. Rose gave Fatima some of her recipes, and she's been teaching Mahmoud. Hmm, said Emerson. Fatima lingered until he had expressed his approval, then trotted out to report success to Mahmoud. It's not bad at all, said Emerson, chewing. A bit gamier than Rose is. A different variety of beef, I expect. One would suppose so. Emerson leaned back and fixed me with a solemn stare. Things are in the deuce of a mess, Peabody. They usually are, Emerson. True. This time, however, there are too many unrelated things going on. I mean to settle one of them this evening. He took out his watch. They won't be leaving for a while yet. Finish your dinner, my dear, and we will take coffee with them. 
The hideous foreboding that filled me was so familiar it felt almost comfortable. Good gad, I exclaimed. It is Ramsay's you mean, isn't it? Ramsay's and David, leaving for where? What are they up to now? I should have known. Why haven't they told us? I mean to learn the answers tonight, Emerson said placidly. You must have suspected something yourself, or you wouldn't have leaped to the correct conclusion so quickly. Thank you, Fatima. That was excellent. Having observed how these matters were managed in England, Fatima was training one of her nephews in the fine art of butling, but he hadn't yet attained the degree of skill she considered minimal. I doubted he ever would satisfy her. She enjoyed waiting on us herself and listening to our conversation. When she served the next course, I had to force myself to eat. I was in such a state of worried exasperation. Of course I was suspicious, I said. Ramses has taken pains to avoid me, but I know the signs. He looks like an owl, or that falcon, a fret freed, with those dark lines under his eyes. David hasn't been his usual self either. They are prowling again, at night, in the old city, in their disgusting disguises. Have they found some clue to the forger, do you suppose? Fatima had missed my first reference to David. Hearing this one, she let out a hiss of alarm. I reassured her, not an easy task since I was in considerable need of reassurance myself, and warned her not to mention the subject to anyone else. You do put things in such a melodramatic way, Emerson said critically. I expect they are... It's not a bad word, actually. Prowling again. That is why Ramses has taken to spending his nights on the Dahabia. Then Leah must know what they're doing. David probably swore her to secrecy, and someone else may have sworn him and Ramses to secrecy. I stared at him in consternation. Wardani? It makes sense, doesn't it? I believe they would have told us if they were on the track of the forger. But, Emerson, that would be disastrous. Russell warned me that the police were after Wardani, and that David is already on a list of... I stopped myself, for Fatima was standing in the doorway, her eyes wide, and the bowl she held quivering violently. Put it down before you drop it, Fatima, I said. I told you there is nothing to worry about. We will see that David is safe. You trust us, don't you? I wa uh, yes, Itakim. She placed the bowl tenderly on the table. It appeared to be a somewhat exotic version of a trifle, wobbly with custard and cream and jelly. Bits of unidentified fruit stuck out from it. I don't think I can eat that, Emerson, I said, out of the corner of my mouth. We'll take it with us, Emerson declared. Parcel it up, Fatima. Parcel it? Put it in a bag or box or something, Emerson said. The children will enjoy it. I rather looked forward to seeing Emerson striding down the road toward the quay with a bowl of trifle tucked under one arm. He would have done it, too, but for Fatima. She turned pale with horror at the idea and insisted on sending Ali with us to carry the box in which she had wedged the bowl. The poor lad had to trot to keep up with Emerson's long strides, and we were followed all the way to the Amelia by little gasps and squawks as Ali juggled the awkward thing. As Emerson says, one can always count on a touch of comic relief in our family. There was no creeping up on the plotters unannounced, for we were observed approaching by an alert guard and hailed in a loud voice. When we got to the saloon, where they were finishing dinner, both young men were on their feet, and all three faces wore insincere smiles of welcome. The unpacking of the trifle, a good deal of which had slopped over the sides of the bowl, occasioned some mirth. Karima scraped the remains onto plates, and in duty bound we all ate some of it. Emerson soon began to fidget. He is not a patient man, and he had a great deal on his mind. Since I did not want Karima and the other servants to overhear, I managed, with little nudges and winks, to keep the conversation on casual subjects until after we had retired to the upper deck for coffee, and Karima had left us alone. 
Leah had already expressed her pleasure at seeing us so unexpectedly, and I had already apologised for breaking my own rule about dropping in uninvited. I didn't doubt all three knew there was some purpose in our coming. The only question in my mind was whether Ramses would confess before his father accused him. Emerson did not give him time, supposing he had intended to. "'What the devil are you up to now?' he demanded. The disadvantage of the ambiance was that I could not make out their faces clearly. Candles in pottery bowls shone softly, but gave little light. I saw only Ramsay's hands as he put his cup down on the nearest table. They were always scratched and scraped, for like his father, he was forgetful about wearing gloves when he is digging. "'I suppose I should apologise for not confiding in you and mother,' he said. I gave my word I would not. "'Be damned to that,' said Emerson. "'Yes, sir. "'Was it Lord Danny who swore you to secrecy?' "'No, sir. "'We had better confess,' David said, "'over the low rumble from Emerson "'that betokened an imminent explosion. "'I wish you would,' Leah murmured. "'I hate keeping secrets, "'especially from Aunt Amelia and the Professor.' "'Ha!' said Emerson. Well, Ramses. It was as if, having made up his mind to speak, Ramses was anxious to unburden himself, or possibly he was anxious to get it over so he could go about whatever business he had planned for that night. I have been working for Mr. Russell, who is attempting to put an end to the traffic in drugs. One of the persons involved is rumoured to be an Englishman. David and I have been trying to infiltrate one of the gangs in order to learn who this man is. Thus far, I could contain myself no longer. Russell, did you say? Confound the man. I told him in the most decided terms that you were not to be a policeman. Police spy, Ramses corrected. My men's words. Perhaps you now understand why I did not inform you. There's not much point in being a spy if everybody knows you are one. We are not everybody, said his father, unmoved by the bitterness in his voice. Or so I believed, until Emerson added, And there is no shame in spying if it is for a worthy cause. Where did you get the idea that an Englishman was involved? Or Danny, it occurred to me that he might have invented it just to make mischief. He's quite capable of that. But the rumours are out there. We've heard them for ourselves. His head turned toward me, and he added seriously, Where there is smoke, there is fire, you know. There is no doubt that confession is good for the soul, depending, of course, on who is confessing and to whom. Ramses leaned back and lit a cigarette. His father took out his pipe. Leah poured coffee, and David let out a long breath. I don't mind admitting I'm glad to have it off my chest, he said ingenuously. Hmm, said Emerson, sucking on his pipe. You still have some way to go. Tell me what steps you have taken. Originally, Mr. Russell had concentrated on the coast, trying to confiscate the cargoes as they were unloaded. As Ramses had mentioned earlier, this was a hopeless task, for the area was extensive. It seemed to me, Ramses continued, that it made better sense to try and intercept the stuff when it entered Cairo. It might come by water, up one of the arms of the Nile, or overland. In either case, it would end up in a warehouse or shed or some other storage area awaiting distribution to the dealers. More than one such storage place, surely, said Emerson, who was listening with keen interest. Common sense would suggest they change the locale periodically. Not if they had no reason to believe it was suspected, Ramses argued. Even so, pinning down a specific location would be difficult, so I started from the other end the local distributors. I managed to get a position in one of the hashish dens. How did you manage that? Emerson asked curiously. I started a fight. It wasn't difficult. Some of the lads become combative as the night wears on. After I'd pitched my unfortunate victim out into the alley and expressed my regret for the disturbance, the owner offered me a job as a lookout. It didn't take long to figure out the schedule of deliveries and identify the deliverers, 
To make a long story short, I worked my way up the ladder until I was taken on as one of the labourers who meet the incoming shipments. So you located the warehouse? Emerson inquired. He sounded a little envious, I thought. One of them. That wasn't what I wanted, though. And it finally occurred to my slow wits that I was never going to get past a certain point. There is a great gap between the people who handle the stuff and the people who finance the business, and only a few points of contact between them. I was racking my brain trying to think how to bridge the gap when David found out what I was doing. I owe Wardani a debt for enlightening me, David said. You wouldn't have told me. There's no need to go into that, Ramsay said. It was David who came up with the brilliant idea of setting up a police ambush so that we could save the shipment and become heroes. Russell approved the scheme. So David joined the group, on my recommendation, and when the attack occurred, we gave our all for the cause. We planned exactly what we would do, and it went off rather well. In all the pandemonium and in the dark, nobody could really tell who was hitting whom. In the end, David and I and our immediate superior were the only ones left standing, and we dashed off with the hashish, bleeding copiously, of course, and covered with bruises. Emerson chuckled. Ramses picked up one of the little pottery lamps and used it to light a cigarette. The glow illumined his face and David's. Both had a look of reminiscent amusement that made me want to shake them. I wanted to shake Emerson, too, for laughing. Men are incomprehensible to me at times. So, said Emerson, what next? Next comes a spot of eavesdropping, said his son. We'll never be admitted to the inner councils, but because of our extraordinary heroism, we're considered trustworthy. People don't always guard their tongues when we are around. There's a meeting tonight we must attend. We haven't been invited, so we will have to hang about in the hope of hearing something interesting. It will take a little time to get into position, so if you'll excuse us. Not quite yet, said Emerson, slowly and distinctly. There is something more, isn't there? No, don't tell me. I will tell you. You and David wouldn't waste your time on police business unless it were connected with our other problems. It's the same man, isn't it? How did you make the connection? Is he also using David's name? After a moment, Ramsay said, Yes, to both. Sir, confound your Ramses. Don't you see that attempting to keep me in the dark is not only a waste of time, but devilish dangerous? It is for your sake that I insist on knowing the truth, my boy. The speech that had begun in anger ended in appeal. That Ramses felt its effect, I did not doubt. He bowed his head and murmured, Yes, sir, I know. I apologise. Well, never mind, Emerson grunted. This is an unpleasant state of affairs. The bastard seems determined to incriminate David one way or another. It cannot be a personal vendetta. David hasn't an enemy in the world. Have you, David? No, sir. I think he got the idea of using my name when he sold the forgeries, simply because it gave them a believable provenance. Why not continue to use it in his other business arrangements? I doubt the fellow holds a particular grudge against me. I was a convenient scapegoat because of my nationality and my background, that's all. As simple as that? I exclaimed. As simple and as deadly, said Ramses. We're accustomed to dealing with enemies who hate us for personal reasons. This is a motive we have never encountered and a kind of enmity we've never had to face. I think David's right. This bastard, this man, chose to victimise him, not because of who he is, but because of what he is. A member of an inferior race who has, moreover, dared to demonstrate his intellectual superiority and violate the rules against intermarriage. What makes this mental aberration even more dangerous is that it is shared by those who will be David's judges, if it should come to that. Emerson growled deep in his throat. 
It won't come to that. I'm not worried, David said firmly. He took the hand Leah held out to him. No suspect ever had a more impressive array of allies. Quite right, I said. We'll find the bast, the villain. Never fear. Well spoken, mother, Ramsay said. Now that we've settled that, one more thing. Emerson turned to David. Have you heard from any of the European dealers to whom you wrote? Yes, as a matter of fact. I had asked for a description of the artefacts in question, if you will recall. I got a letter today from Monsieur Dubois in Paris. He was somewhat perturbed. I can well imagine, Emerson grunted. I presume he insists that the article was genuine. Exactly. As he pointed out, the seller and the provenance may have been spurious, but that doesn't prove the artifact was. He sent a photograph. Oh, what was it? You'd better see for yourself, sir. I had intended to show it to you tomorrow, but so long as you are here. David got to his feet. Emerson followed suit. We'll go down to the saloon where the light is better. It's time we were getting along home anyhow. The saloon was not nearly so cluttered as it had been in my day, possibly because there was only one male person cluttering it up. The removal of all but two of the desks had actually left room for a dining table. Leah had replaced several of the rugs. When she saw me looking at them, she said nervously, I do hope you don't mind, Aunt Amelia. Some had rather large holes in them. From Emerson's pipe, I nodded. My dear child, this is your home now. Make any changes you like. David had found the photograph. Emerson snatched it up with a muffled expletive. Let me see it, I said, and tugged at his hand. At first I could not make out what the objects were. There were four of them, their size indeterminable, because no scale had been provided. Then Emerson said... Carved animal legs, bull's legs, ivory. So Monsieur Dubois said, It's little difficult to make out from the photograph. Inlaid, Emerson muttered, his finger tracing the outline of the oval base. Curse it, this cannot be. Gold and lapis lazuli. Have you ever seen anything like them? Yes, said Emerson in an abstracted voice. Oh, yes. May I take this along? Certainly, sir. Emerson straightened the photograph in his hand. His eyes met those of Ramsay's. Go on about your business, then, he said gruffly. If you aren't here tomorrow morning, I will just run into Cairo and ask a few questions of... whom? Ramsay's mentioned a name which meant nothing to me. Emerson appeared to recognise it, however. He nodded. So he's one of them. I'm not surprised. Good night and good luck. The night was overcast and a damp wind tugged at my skirts. Emerson did not appear to be in any hurry. His pipe in one hand, my hand in the other. He strolled in a leisurely fashion and when we reached the house he gestured at the mastaba bench outside the door. Sit down for a moment, Peabody. I want to discuss something with you. A fitting punishment for Mr. Thomas Russell? Honestly, Emerson, when I think of his going behind my back to... Peabody, Peabody! Ramses does not need your permission to accept a position. Nor mine, Emerson added gloomily. I don't like this any better than you do. But for pity's sake, don't embarrass Ramses by scolding Russell as if they were naughty schoolboys and Russell had led him into mischief. That isn't what I want to discuss. The photograph? Yes. I've got a theory, Peabody. About the forgeries? In a way. Really, Emerson, there are times when I would like to murder you, I exclaimed, so loudly that the grill and the door creaked open and the alarmed face of Ali peered out. At my urgent request, he closed the grill again, and I returned to my grievance. Are you going to tell me your theory, or are you just going to go on dropping enigmatic hints until I lose my temper? 
enigmatic hints, of course, said Emerson, with a chuckle. See what you can make of them, eh? I will play fair, though, and tell you what the objects in the photograph remind me of. Couches, both domestic and funerary, were often mounted on carved animal legs. Obviously, only the well-to-do could afford such things, and the materials used in this set are rare and expensive. Such a set of ivory legs was found at Abydos, in one of the Second Dynasty royal tombs. He paused invitingly. I said nothing. An idea had come to me too, but I was cursed if I was going to share it with him. Emerson always makes fun of my theories, until I am proved correct. Enigmatic hint number two, said Emerson. I believe that Vandergold had the right idea. There's something at Zawyat we are not meant to find. Things have been suspiciously quiet lately. Because we're digging in the wrong place. The words popped into my head straight out of my mouth before I could stop them. I clapped my hand over my lips. Emerson let out a roar of laughter and put one arm round my shoulders. That is a possibility, he said. Would you care to go on, or shall we have another of our little competitions in crime? Sealed envelopes and all the rest. Are you telling me that you know the name of the person who is responsible for the accidents? And for murdering Maud Reynolds? No, I don't. And if you have the confounded audacity to claim that you do... No, I admitted. I see a few rays of light I hadn't seen earlier. They explain some of what has happened but I'm still in the dark as to the identity of the criminal. All the same, Peabody. I think I will put a message in one of those little envelopes, just in case. I turned to him, taking hold of his coat. The lighted lamp beside the door cast enough illumination to show his smiling lips and firm chin. In case something happens to you, what are you planning to do? Why, I'm going to dig at various other places all round the site, that's all. What, play hot and cold, like the children's game, with a murderous attack as a sign you're getting warmer? You mustn't, Emerson, at least not until we've mustered our forces. Ramses, you mean? He has enough on his mind without worrying about me. What the devil, Peabody, we've always managed quite nicely by ourselves, you and I. Well, almost always. I don't doubt for a moment that we can manage, I said stoutly. It is Ramses and David I'm concerned about. Ramses is always taking foolish chances, and David cannot control him. Any more than I can control you. Emerson gave my shoulders a hearty squeeze. People who live in glass houses, Peabody. The only way we can help the boys is to keep their activities strictly to ourselves. I want your word that you will not breathe a word about them to a living soul. Does that include Nefret? There is nothing she can do. She would only worry. It was true, but it was not the real reason. A young wife who has not learned better is likely to confide in her husband, and we did not know Geoffrey well enough to count on his discretion. I woke before daylight and found I was unable to woo slumber again. The reader may well imagine why. The boys, I could not help thinking of them that way still, had been involved in their perilous and disgusting quest for at least a week. Since I hadn't known of it, I'd slept soundly. Now that I did know of it, I did not see how I could sleep again until I knew they were safely back. With the utmost caution, I folded the thin sheet back and was about to slip silently out of bed when an arm wrapped round me and pulled me back. If you intended to go herring off to the Amelia, I advise against it, Emerson said in my ear. It is near dawn. If they had not returned, Leah would have come to us. So you say, I retorted, wishing he'd not done so in such close proximity to my oral orifice. Emerson's whispers are as penetrating as a shout. So I do. Another arm enclosed me. "'drawing me closer. "'I thought you were asleep. "'Obviously I am not. "'Obviously he was not. "'If he was trying to take my mind off the boys, "'he succeeded, but only temporarily. 
By the time I rose and dressed, the dawn was breaking. As if in sympathy with my mood, it was not the pearly pink of a normal sunrise, but a soggy grey. White mist veiled the windows. I knew the sun would probably dissolve the fog in a few hours, but the sight of it intensified the uneasiness that had returned following the conclusion of Emerson's engaging attentions. Like darkness, mist and fog are of great assistance to assassins. When we went down to breakfast, I was relieved to see Leah already there. So was Nefret. But in that first instant, I had eyes only for my niece, whose greeting told me that my apprehensions had been needless. David will be along shortly. He and Ramses were up till all hours talking. Ah, I said. Is Ramses coming with him? He went straight to Harvard camp. She smiled affectionately. Don't worry, Aunt Amelia. I made Ramses eat something before he left. Hmm, said Emerson. He looked at Nefret, whose untouched breakfast had a congealed look about it. What's wrong with you? Feeling ill? No, sir. She would have left it at that, but Emerson's piercing blue stare is difficult to ignore. I had trouble sleeping, she admitted. "'One of your dreams?' I inquired. "'Yes.' "'She picked up her fork and took a bite of scrambled egg. "'I knew she would say no more. "'She would never discuss those nightmares which had troubled her for years. "'They were infrequent but very disturbing, "'and she claimed she could never remember the content. "'I had my doubts about that, "'but my efforts to induce her to discuss them "'with me or with a qualified medical person had come to naught.' The others soon joined us, first David, then Geoffrey, a few minutes later. Fatima was in seventh heaven, with so many people to be stuffed with food. She kept pressing delicacies upon us and replacing people's plates with freshly cooked food. Everyone did his or her best to eat, but as I looked round the table, I thought I had never seen so many haggard faces and drooping eyelids. The only ones who appeared normal were Geoffrey and Emerson. I wondered how the lad could have slept so well while his wife suffered the pangs of nightmare. And then I dismissed the rude speculation that had entered my mind. As if feeling my gaze upon him, Geoffrey looked up from his plate and gave me a cheerful smile. You ought to have come with us last night, Aunt Amelia. I had a most interesting conversation with Sir John. I didn't want to hear about it, Emerson declared. It's time we were off. I suggested we go by way of the Giza Plateau, but Emerson, misunderstanding my motives, vetoed the idea in terms that allowed no room for discussion. The pace he set allowed no room for discussion either. Upon our arrival, he summoned all of us, including Selim and Daoud, to a conference. I have finished with the cemeteries for the time being, he announced. Today we begin clearing the shaft from the top. This abrupt and arbitrary decision was accepted without comment by those who knew him well. Observing that Geoffrey's eyes had widened and that he was on the verge of speech, I intervened to spare the lad the reprimand a question would undoubtedly have provoked. Far be it from me to question the dictatorial nature of your decrees, Emerson. I said. But perhaps if you condescended to explain why you are taking this course and what you hope to accomplish? Emerson drew a deep sigh, like a patient schoolmaster facing a particularly dull child. I should think that would be obvious. However, if you insist. Where is that plan of Barsante's? He began throwing papers around. Ah, here it is. We all gathered round the table, and Emerson began lecturing, using the stem of his pipe as a pointer. The entrance to the substructure is this long descending stair and passageway. What, then, was the purpose of the shaft, which goes straight up to the surface from the end of the first passageway? Perhaps it was made by tomb robbers, Selim suggested. Emerson snorted. You know what tomb robbers' tunnels look like, Selim. This shaft was built by professional masons, not by robbers in haste and in secrecy. It may be a later construction. I want to see what, if anything, is in it. Does that answer your question, Peabody? 
Only part of it. You mean to concentrate on the substructure, then? I intend to clear the place out. Emerson's handsome face took on a look of demonic pleasure. I got Reisner to admit he didn't do a damn thing down there last year. Barsanti's excavations were inadequate. I am going to go about this slowly and methodically, taking all possible precautions. That is why I want the shaft completely clear before we enter the substructure. Had I not been distracted by other considerations, I would have rejoiced at Emerson's new scheme. It was what I had wanted all along. He was absolutely correct in clearing the shaft before proceeding with his investigation of the substructure. If the filling gave way, several hundred tons of rock and sand would drop straight down into the corridors below. The top of the shaft was marked by a shallow depression, no different in appearance from others that covered the uneven terrain. But, of course, we had plotted its precise location when we made our plan of the site. Emerson got the men to work, indicating an area we had already excavated as the location of the dump. Before long, the sand was flying, and the basket men were trotting busily back and forth, accompanying their tedious labour with a crooning chant. Apparently, they'd got over the superstitious fear of the place that had followed the discovery of Maud's body. However, when I expressed this optimistic sentiment to Emerson, he shook his head. Then in the open air, some distance from the spot where her body was found. We may not be able to persuade them so easily to enter the place. Let us hope nothing else occurs. Emerson's jaw tightened. I will make certain it doesn't. Hands on his hips, he stood looking on, his keen eyes intent on the men who were in the depression, filling their baskets. He was watching, I knew, for the slightest sign of movement under their bare feet and busy hands, ready to leap to their rescue should a subsidence occur. Naturally, I remained at his side, ready to leap to his rescue. He and Selim saw the object at the same moment. Their shouts caused the diggers to halt their activities. Before I could stop him, Emerson hastened to the spot. Naturally, I followed him. The object was a bone, too large to be human. Others, half buried by a layer of fine sand, lay around it, covering an area approximately a metre square. Emerson required no more than a glance to identify the strange deposit. Animal burials, he muttered. They were mummified. That's a scrap of linen. All right, said him, brush away the sand, but don't move anything until we get photographs. There were several layers of bones and horns, rams, goats, gazelles, oxen, separated from one another by layers of fine sand. Even with all of us concentrating on the area, progress was slow, owing to Emerson's insistence on proper procedures. We were still uncovering bones when I decreed a halt. It was sometimes necessary for me to do this, since Emerson would have gone on until dark, or until everyone else dropped in his or her tracks. That day, it was David whose increasingly clumsy and slow movements aroused my concern. Geoffrey had teased him about his drowsy looks, until a sharp glance from me put an end to little jokes about bridegrooms. I hadn't been able to get any information out of anyone all day. My attempts to get David to myself had been foiled by Leah, who stuck close to him and ignored my hints that she should go somewhere and do something else. It became clear to me that David knew something he did not want me to know, and that Leah and Emerson were both in the conspiracy to keep me in ignorance. That is a state of affairs I never allow. I therefore demanded Emerson's company on the way back to the house and held my horse to a walk. What happened last night? I demanded. Were they able to learn the identity of the man they seek? What are they going to do next? I don't know, said Emerson. Confound it, Emerson, I will not be kept in the dark. If you won't tell me, don't shout, Emerson bellowed. Geoffrey, riding ahead with Nefret, turned his head to look at us. Now see what you've done, I said. I haven't done anything, curse it. He's accustomed to our shouting at one another. We do it all the time. But he moderated his voice. I've not had an opportunity to speak with David at length. 
He said only that they had run up against a slight snag last night, but there was no harm done. They mean to give it one more try tonight, and if they are not successful, we will discuss the matter further. I suppose I must be satisfied with that. You must, yes, and so must I. The tight set of his lips and the whitened knuckles of his hands that grasped the reins betrayed the same sense of frustration that affected me. After a moment, he added, Don't you suppose I want to go with them? I dare not. My presence would only increase the risk. There is nothing I can do to help them, except possibly to provide a distraction. So that is why you announced you would investigate the substructure. One of the reasons... Emerson grinned. I want to see what's down there. Leah and David would not stay for tea. Ramses was to meet them at the Dahabia, and would, Leah said casually, probably spend the night. He had taken to keeping toilet articles and changes of clothing there. Bring him to breakfast tomorrow, I said. It was an order, not a request. The only possible response was yes, and Leah gave it. They left the horses and went on on foot, arms entwined. The others went up to change, except for Nefret, who intercepted me. Geoffrey wonders if Ramses is avoiding him, she said. I promised him I would ask you. Now, why would he wonder that? I said, in some confusion. She did not reply, but stood looking at me with a singular lack of expression. I wondered if she had learned the trick from me. It's more likely to induce a response than repeated questions. He's enjoying David's company, I said at last. You know how close they are. He, uh, no doubt, he also means it as a delicate attention to the two of you. I hoped she would not ask me what I meant by that, since I did not know myself. Apparently she accepted it, for she nodded and left me. The conversation at dinner was strictly archaeological and conducted almost entirely by Emerson and Geoffrey. The latter appeared to be very interested in our bones, the ones we had found, that is. Were they perhaps sacrifices to the dead king? he asked. The shaft was not dug to contain the animal burials, said Emerson. They are later in date. You observe that the pit in which they lay was smaller in size than the shaft itself. I'm afraid I paid less attention than I ought to have done. The reader need not doubt whither my thoughts had strayed. After a restless, on my part, night, we were up betimes. Again mist veiled the windows. Again I hastened downstairs. Nefret and Geoffrey were already there, and Fatima had served the food before the others finally came. It was with inexpressible relief that I beheld them. But a second look at Ramsay's brought a quickly repressed exclamation to my lips. It was repressed, to be precise, by Emerson, who placed his serviette firmly over my mouth. A bit of butter on your chin, my dear, he said. Let me remove it. My dear Emerson and I communicate without words. Nor had he missed the signs of exhaustion that marked his son's face. It was not long before his keen wits and amiable paternal concern had determined on a course of action. Pay attention, everyone, he said. Certain changes in our schedule have become expedient. Ramses, I need to borrow you back from Reisner for a few days. He can have Geoffrey instead. Geoffrey choked on a swallow of coffee and had to retreat behind his serviette. "'You can't trade people back and forth as if they were picks and shovels, Emerson,' I exclaimed. "'Have you spoken with Mr. Reisner about this?' "'Geoffrey cleared his throat. "'I'm afraid he won't agree, sir.' "'Emerson's fist came down on the table. "'Reisner is not the Lord God Jehovah. "'He will have to agree, because I have said so. "'I need Ramses to go over the proofs of the text volume of my history.' I received another cursed letter from the cursed Oxford University Press yesterday, saying they will have to delay publication for six months unless they receive the proofs by the end of February. I respect your acquaintance with the language, Geoffrey, but I trust I do not offend you when I point out it is not the equal of Ramsay's. Besides, he is familiar with the material. 
It was a suspiciously detailed explanation for Emerson, who does not often condescend to explain at all. I felt sure I understood his real motive, and I was filled with admiration for his ingenuity. "'No further objections?' Emerson inquired, glowering at each of us in turn. Hmm. "'I will stop by Harvard camp on the way to the dig and tell Reisner what I have decided. "'You'd better ride with me, Geoffrey, and stay at Giza if you are wanted. "'Ramses, come up to my study, and I'll show you what needs to be done before I leave. "'The rest of you will be ready to go.' "'Yes, sir,' said Ramses. "'He followed Emerson out of the room. "'I gave them five minutes and then followed. "'Emerson was just coming out of his study.' Through the open doorway I saw that Ramses was already asleep on the sofa, motionless as an effigy of a knight on a tombstone, and looking remarkably innocent, with his hands limp at his sides and his lashes dark against his cheeks. Emerson closed the door. "'I couldn't wait,' I explained. "'Did they have any luck last night? Uh, he is all right, isn't he?' Emerson gave me a quick kiss. "'Sleep is all he needs.' This was the only way I could think of to explain his absence from work. And very clever it was, Emerson. Mm. Emerson fingered the clef or dimple in his chin, as he does when deep in thought. I've never seen him drawn quite so fine, Peabody. It is more than physical exhaustion. It is nervous strain as well. Was he in love with that girl? Maud? Oh, no. And you would know. He drew my arm through his and led me toward the front of the house. Good gad, we sound like a pair of society gossips. As for last night, you can and undoubtedly will quiz David once you've got him to yourself. I will arrange matters so that he gets a few hours rest today. Are they going out again tonight? I don't know. Ramses was asleep on his feet, and I didn't want to keep the others waiting. The mist was lifting, but it still lay thick upon the Giza Plateau. After Geoffrey and Emerson had turned onto the side road, their forms were gradually enveloped in clinging white fog. The rest of us went on along the main road, which was filled with the usual morning traffic, from camels to bicyclists. Riding four abreast would not have been courteous or safe, given the disposition of a camel. I directed the girls to precede me and David, and then I got to work squeezing information out of him. Direct assault was the method I selected. What happened to Ramsay's hands? His hands? David's look of surprise would not have deceived a child. They were green. Oh, Lord, I thought we'd got the stuff off. I have seen Khadijah's ointment often enough to recognize it, even on a cloudy morning when the individual in question is doing his best to hide his palms. It is not easy to remove with soap and water. What happened? Just rope burns, David said. He was hanging onto the rope and had to descend in something of a hurry. Because people were shooting at him? Goodness, no, David essayed to chuckle. They were only um, about to cut the rope. It was rather a long drop, you see. Onto a stone paving. He was beginning to sound a little rattled, so I continued to press him. When was this? Night before last. That is why he kept out of my way yesterday, I mused. Did they get a good look at him? He doesn't think so. He doesn't think so, I repeated. What about you? No, I was down below. And what happened last night? Nothing. David took out his handkerchief and mopped his brow. Something went wrong. Oh, the deuce, I may as well tell you. You may as well. Well, you see, one of the things Ramses overheard before someone took a notion to approach the window was that Felani was to meet the, uh, the Effendi last night. Unfortunately, the place of the meeting was not mentioned. The only thing we could do was trail Felani, which we did, for six bloody... Excuse me, Aunt Amelia. Six hours. He visited a number of interesting places, but if a meeting took place, we missed it. We might have done. We couldn't follow him into... 
into certain of the places. I decided not to press him on that issue. You said Ramsay's presence was observed the previous night, even if he wasn't recognized. Has it occurred to you that Filani may have anticipated he would be followed? That he led you on a wild goose chase instead of keeping his appointment? That he arranged to have someone follow you? Yes, ma'am, David said wretchedly. It did occur to us, eventually. David, this has become too dangerous. You must stop it. It's not up to me, David said gently but firmly. Where my brother goes, I go. Emerson arrived at the site soon after us and looked surprised when I asked what Mr. Reisner had said. He said nothing. What was there to say? He inspected David from head to foot and back again and scowled. David, I won't need you for a few hours. Go round to the south side and get me a series of photographs of the area at the base of the pyramid. There's got to be some trace of a casing, has it? Selim, where the devil are... Oh, let's get back to the shaft. Do you want me to help David with the photography? Fred asked. No, Leo can give him a hand. He avoided looking at her, and a wave of sadness washed over me. Emerson and I had sometimes kept the children in the dark about certain of our schemes, but never before had all of us treated Nefret like an outsider. In a sense, she was, though. Her chief allegiance was now to another, and although I knew Geoffrey could not be the villain we thought, we could not be certain of his discretion or his understanding. The delicacy of the situation was particularly acute with regard to the activities of Ramses and David. This realization brought home to me how closely knit and united our little band had grown over the years. In time, Geoffrey might become part of it. No doubt he would. It took normal people a while to get used to us. Leah and David went off, not to photograph, but to snatch a few hours' sleep, and the rest of us returned to the shaft. The dimensions of the animal pit became more apparent as we went deeper. It was narrower than the shaft itself, and Emerson's assumption that it was considerably later in date was confirmed by the discovery of faience amulets and wooden animal figures mixed in with the bones. David and Leah joined us for luncheon. I was pleased to observe that the lad appeared greatly refreshed, and when we went back to work on the shaft, he accompanied us. We were still digging up bones when the sudden disappearance of the declining sun behind a bank of cloud cast a shadow like twilight over the scene. Confound it, said David, who had been about to make an exposure. Emerson cast a malevolent look at the cloud bank. Rimmed by the rays of the sun it had concealed, it hung like a gold-trimmed purple curtain across the western sky. Confound it, he repeated. It was not the increased difficulty of photography that concerned him, but the possible consequences of a heavy rain. He began bawling out orders. Nefret, stop sorting those bones and pile them into baskets. Sell him, Dowd. Get the tarpaulin from the shelter and stretch it over the excavation. We'll need heavy stones to anchor the corners. David, pack up the cameras. Peabody, Leah. I was already on my way to the shelter to gather up our notes and papers and pack the remains of the food. It was inspiring to see how quickly everyone scattered, each to his appointed task, all moving with the efficiency long experience had taught us. The rain held off, but the skies darkened, and a brisk wind arose, tugging at the canvas so that we had the devil of a time getting it into place and keeping it there. The hired labourers had scampered away toward their village. Only our loyal men remained, working as assiduously as we. I lay flat across one section of canvas, holding it down until Dowd could fetch another stone, and admiring the unusual atmospheric manifestations. The eastern sky was clear, but the uncanny shadow cast an eerie light across the cultivation. Toward the north, the shapes of the pyramids stood out black against an encrimsoned rent in the clouds. Another shape became apparent. It was that of a horse and rider, approaching at an easy pace. 
there was no mistaking the elegant outline of Risha, or, come to that, the outline of Ramses. Someone had once said Ramses rode like a centaur, and he looked like one just then, for the forms of man and horse blended into a featureless silhouette. He was still some little distance away when a sharp cracking sound made me start and look up. A repetition of the sound told me what I ought to have known from the first. It was not thunder I'd heard. It was a rifle shot. I jumped up in time to hear a third shot and see Ramses fall forward over the horse's neck. He held on, though, and when Risha came to a stop, he straightened and looked down with a particularly supercilious expression at the agitated group surrounding him and the horse. We had all run like fury, and so had Risha, straight to us. Having delivered his rider, he turned his head and snuffled inquiringly at Ramsay's arm. The latter raised both eyebrows at me. Put your pistol away, mother. May I ask what you intended to shoot at? Unaware of having removed the weapon from my pocket, I looked at it in surprise. Emerson snatched at my hand. Don't point it at your face, Peabody. Curse it. Ramses, are you hurt? No. Then why did you appear to collapse? I demanded angrily, as Emerson took the pistol from me. It seemed advisable to present a smaller target. There is blood on your shirt, said Nefret. Jam, said Ramses. I took tea with Senia. Chapter 13 My wounds were negligible, but the maiden insisted upon binding them up with strips torn from her diaphanous garments. My suggestion that we fan out in search of the hidden assassin was unanimously rejected. Ramses claimed he could not tell from which direction the shots had come. Nefret declared that such a procedure would be foolhardy in the extreme. Leah pointed out that the increasing darkness would render a search futile. David did not get a chance to say anything, and Emerson's blistering comments cannot be reproduced in these pages. So we finished packing up and started for home. By the time we reached the house, rain was falling heavily. It splashed into the fountain and formed puddles on the tiled floor of the courtyard. Fatima had seen the storm approaching and moved all the overstuffed furniture and cushions under cover. As soon as Emerson had seen his precious boxes of bones and scraps safely stowed away, he started across the courtyard toward the front door. I had anticipated this. So I was able to intercept him when he reached the Takhtabosh, where the doorman had taken shelter from the rain and was sitting on one of the benches. "'And where do you think you're going?' I demanded. "'You are soaked to the skin. Change your clothes at once.' "'Why, I will be wet again immediately,' said Emerson. The door to the street opened, admitting Ramses and David, who had taken the horses to the stable. "'What is the matter?' David asked. I didn't blame him for asking. Emerson and my relative positions were somewhat combative. I am attempting to prevent him from rushing off to Mr. Reynolds' house and accusing him of attempted murder, I explained, taking a firmer grip on my impulsive husband's shirt sleeve. That is where you were going, wasn't it, Emerson? I want to get to him before he has time to conceal the evidence, snarled Emerson. Out of my way, Peabody! It is already too late for that, said Ramses, assuming there was any evidence to conceal. Quite right, I agreed. Quiet, calm consideration is what we want now, not impulsive action. Go and change, all of you, and we will meet in the sitting room for a council of war. Since it was necessary for me to make certain Emerson did as he was told before I took care of my own needs, I was the last to join the group. The sitting-room felt quite cosy, with the lamps lighted and the soft murmur of falling rain outside the open windows. Nefret had supplied Leah with a change of clothing, and David was wearing one of Ramsay's galabias. And Geoffrey? I'd completely forgot about him. Guilt made my greeting warmer than the situation actually demanded. In response to my question, he explained that he'd returned to the house in the afternoon, meaning to rest for a few minutes, and had fallen sound asleep. 
At this point in his narrative, a burst of coughing interrupted his speech. "'That cough is getting worse,' I said. "'You'd better let me... Uh, let Nefret. "'Perhaps he will let you,' said Nefret, smiling at my inadvertent faux pas, even as a frown wrinkled the smooth surface of her brow. "'He refuses to see a physician or allow me to examine him.' "'It's only the dust,' Geoffrey protested. "'Have a whiskey and soda,' said Emerson. "'He has very little patience with illness, his own or anyone else's. "'And then we can get to business. "'Didn't a fret tell you about your friend Reynolds' latest aberration?' "'Yes, sir,' Geoffrey said in a low voice. "'I had thought he was better.' "'It seems to me,' said Ramses, "'that you're all ignoring one of the basic principles of British law. "'We've no proof whatever that Jack Reynolds fired those shots.' "'I was attempting to get that proof when your mother prevented me,' Emerson replied, "'giving me a whisky and soda and an inimical look. "'Ramses leaned forward, forearms resting on his knees and hands clasped. "'That's all very well, sir. "'And I agree, someone ought to pay Jack a visit. "'But first we must consider what it is we hope to learn. "'He had ample time to clean and replace the weapon.' If he has an alibi for the critical time, well and good. If he hasn't, which is more likely, that is still not proof of guilt. <clears throat> said Emerson. It won't do any harm to ask, will it? Have I your permission to call on Reynolds and inquire, with the utmost tact and subtlety, where he was and what he was doing this afternoon at approximately... What time was it? Another brief and inconclusive discussion ensued. None of us had been keeping track of the time. Finally, Emerson declared that we had talked long enough and that he meant to go at once, alone. Naturally, I accompanied him. The rain had almost stopped and the night air was refreshing. Emerson had his torch and I my parasol. He would not come under it with me or walk close by me since he claimed the spokes kept hitting him in the face. So we splashed through puddles and patches of mud like two strangers who happened to be going in the same direction. I was preoccupied with my own thoughts, as I did not doubt Emerson was with his. I had persuaded Leah and David to stay and dine with us, but I felt certain they would be off shortly after dinner, and Ramsay's with them and that shortly after that he and David would be on their way to Cairo to risk... Heaven only knew what terrible danger. I found myself wishing Ramses had been struck by a bullet, not in a vital organ, of course, but in a spot that would keep him immobile for a few days. The little house, which had once been filled with merriment and harmless, for the most part, pleasure, looked desolate and forlorn. Few lights showed. Raindrops dripped in mournful melody from the surrounding trees, the doorman had retreated within. We had to pound and ring for several minutes before there was a response, and that, when it came, was not welcoming. Go away, a voice shouted in Arabic. The Effendi is not at home. Emerson shouted back. His voice is unmistakable. Before he had got more than a few words out, the portal was flung open, and the groveling servant ushered us into the house. We sent him off to announce us while I tried to persuade Emerson to wipe his feet. Why bother? he inquired, with a critical look round the untidy entrance hallway. We were kept waiting rather a long time, and Emerson was about to lose his patience when someone came. The reader may conceive of my surprise when I recognized Karl von Borg. I ought not to have been surprised, in fact since I remembered hearing that Carl had got in the habit of spending a great deal of time with his friend Jack, though what the two had in common, aside from their interest in Egyptology, I couldn't imagine. It wasn't until he bowed us into the sitting room that I got a good look at him. Evidently he and Jack had been having one of those comfortable masculine evenings at home. A man's idea of comfort is to be as untidy as possible. 
Carl had reassumed his coat in some haste, since it was buttoned askew. His attempt to smooth his hair with his hands had not been successful. His face was flushed, his eyes unfocused. He began to apologize for Jack, who, he explained, was unwell. "'Intoxicated, you mean?' I inquired. "'I am sorry to see, Carl, that you've been encouraging his weakness by drinking with him.' "'Not drinking,' said Emerson. His nose wrinkled. In one long stride he reached the door of Jack's study and turned the knob. Dishevelled and coatless, Jack sat sprawled in an easy chair, staring blearily at the door. The sofa cushions were every which way, so I presumed Carl had been reclining on that article of furniture when the servant summoned him. On a nearby table were an ash receptacle, a pipe, and a plate of almond biscuits, one half eaten. Jack held his pipe in one lax hand. The smoke that eddied about the room did not have the scent of ordinary tobacco. It was the same strange odour I had once taken for that of decay. There was no mistaking its origin now. I turned to Carl. Shame! I cried. Oh, Carl, how could you? What would Mary say? Tears filled his eyes. He flung his arm up to cover his face. I was so lonely for her, he gasped. Und für die Kinder. Ach, Gott, ich habe myself disgraced. Meine Geliebte betrayed. Sobs stifled his speech, which had become increasingly incoherent. I patted him absently on the shoulder. Emerson removed the pipe from Jack's hand and shook him vigorously. The only response was a faint smile. Too far gone, said Emerson. It will take several hours for the effects to wear off. How long have you been here with him, von Bork? His curt tone recalled Carl to some semblance of manhood. He wiped his eyes on the back of his hand. Ich weiß nicht, Herr Professor, he muttered. A long time. I passed him my handkerchief. Pull yourself together, Carl. It is vitally important that we extract a coherent statement from you. I doubt we can get it, said Emerson dryly. By direct questioning, we managed to extract a few scraps of information from Carl. He'd been in Cairo at the Institute, not at Giza. The sun had been shining when he got to the house. At least he thought it had. Jack had arrived shortly after him. No, alas, he could not remember how long after. At some point it had begun to rain. He and Jack had been together ever since. As for the hashish, this was not the first time they had indulged. It was Jack who had provided the filthy stuff. He did not know where Jack had got it. Depression so profound, it forbade even the release of tears, had gripped our friend. It soon became clear we would get no more from him that night, if ever. Emerson abandoned his interrogation and went to the gun case. The key was in the lock. He turned it and opened the door. I see only one of the famous Colts. Jack mentioned some days ago that a weapon had been stolen. That is what he would say if he intended to use it for purposes of homicide, Emerson remarked. However, it was not a revolver that was employed this afternoon. He removed each of the weapons from its place and examined it. No, he said, replacing the last. If one of them was used, it has been cleaned, and any remaining ammunition removed. At least he has sense enough not to leave a loaded weapon in the case. There's nothing more for us here, Peabody. Should we not question the servants, Emerson? Useless, said Emerson. They will say what they have been told to say, or what they believe we want to hear. Von Bork, I will speak with you again tomorrow. A barely audible murmur of... Ja, Herr Professor, came from the huddled form. Emerson's stern face softened slightly. Don't do anything foolish, he said. Emerging from that house was like coming out of a prison, a dungeon that held two men in fetters more difficult to break than any material chains. Emerson took a deep breath of the clean night air. Don't put up the cursed parasol, Peabody. It has stopped raining. Odd, isn't it? that once again our old friend von Bork has provided an alibi for a suspected killer. 
I can't believe he deliberately lied, Emerson. He was so repentant after that other occasion, so grateful that we'd forgiven him. Is it possible that Jack misled him? The drug has strange effects. You are hopelessly soft-hearted, my dear, but you're right about the unpredictable effects of hashish. They depend on the constitution of the user and the purity of the substance. Euphoria is the commonest reaction, which is why people use the confounded stuff. But there are others, and most of them are easy to counterfeit. The clouds were lifting. Stars glimmered in the sky over Cairo. Emerson's steps slowed. He took out his pipe, and I let go his arm so he could fill it, recognizing the need for his favorite aid to ratio sedation. Are you implying that Carl's remorse was pretense, Emerson? That he was acting the whole time? It's a possibility. But that would mean... Good gad, that would mean that Carl is the man we are after. He supplied Jack with the drug, pretended to smoke it with him, took advantage of Jack's stupor to creep away and follow Ramsay's. There wasn't much of an alibi he gave Jack, you know. He was very vague about times. A match flared. Emerson chuckled. Jumping to conclusions again, Peabody. There are a number of holes in that scenario. We are gradually getting closer to the truth, but we are still a long way from understanding how they all fit together. Our accidents at Zawaya del Alyan, the drug business, the forgeries, the murder of Maud Reynolds. You believe there is a common denominator? There must be. It wouldn't be playing fair if there were not. God, I remarked, does not always play fair. That is why I don't believe in him. A decent deity would have better manners than the creatures he created out of dirt. I prefer to avoid theological discussions with Emerson. His opinions are distressingly unorthodox, and sometimes uncomfortably close to my own private musings. We had reached our house. The doorman stood ready to admit us. I shivered. Emerson, can't we keep the boys from going to Cairo tonight? Having one of your dire forebodings, are you, Peabody? I don't need a premonition to know they will be in danger. David told me what happened last night. It is highly suspicious. Everything strikes you as highly suspicious, Emerson said agreeably. But I know what you mean. You will have another conference with the boys immediately after dinner. We went straight into dinner, since we were later than I'd expected we would be, and Emerson proceeded to regale the others with a description of what we had found at Jack's. It was not the most appropriate conversation for a dinner table, but then most of our conversations are not. Of all of us, Geoffrey was the most disturbed. Hashish! That's even worse than I feared. Where could Jack have got it? Since it is illegal... He would have to exercise some discretion in obtaining it, Ramses replied. But it's not difficult to find. Carl, too, Nefret murmured. I knew she was thinking of Mary and the children. Let's not waste time in vain regrets, I said briskly. Rather, we should apply our collective intelligence to answering the questions that arise from this discovery. Agreement was unanimous, but answers were few, Part of the difficulty was the necessity of avoiding the other hashish connection, as I called it to myself. I understood Ramsay's insistence that Nefret not be told of that aspect of the case, but omitting any mention of the subject made discussion cursed difficult in the light of what we'd learned that evening. Several times I found myself on the verge of a reference to it, and Ramsay sat poised like a bird of prey, anticipating a slip and ready to pounce on the culprit. Finally, Emerson declared, I promised von Bork I would have another little chat with him tomorrow. I will interview Reynolds at the same time. If I can do nothing more, I will at least put the fear of God into him. The fear of Emerson, rather, I said. Can't you take his guns away from him? Now there's a thought, Emerson admitted, stroking his chin. That arsenal of his is too convenient, not only for Reynolds, but for anyone who chose to help himself. 
I understand there's already been one theft. Do you happen to know what was taken, Geoffrey? No, sir. A look of distaste twisted the young man's delicate lips. As I told you, I abhor firearms. I wouldn't know one from another. You mentioned the Colts, Ramsay said. There were two of them. New service revolvers, forty-five calibre. He also has, or had, when I saw the collection the day we first went to luncheon with the Reynolds, a shotgun, a Winchester slide action with a twenty-inch barrel, two rifles, a Springfield, and a Mauser Gewehr, and a Luger pistol. Observing Geoffrey's sceptical look, I explained, Ramsay's memory is seldom at fault, Geoffrey. Well, Emerson, were any of them missing? Only one of the Colts. Reynolds isn't the only man in Cairo who owns a rifle, but... Hmm. Yes, I will relieve him of his collection tomorrow. The rain having ended, we went to the courtyard for coffee. I had no intention of allowing Ramses to get away from me without a private discussion, or as he would have called it, a lecture, and was racking my brain to think of a way of accomplishing this when Nefret excused herself and Geoffrey. His cough had been troubling him all evening, and I could see she was worried about him. They went off arm in arm as soon as the door had closed behind them. I turned to my son. After the failure of your plan last night and the attack on you this afternoon, I trust it has occurred to you that you'd better not venture out tonight. Shh, said Emerson, glancing uneasily over his shoulder. Your whispers are louder than my ordinary speech, I retorted. No one can overhear. Goodness gracious how uncomfortable it is, having to keep things from our nearest and dearest. Ramses, I want your promise. You have it. It would be foolhardy in the extreme to... Oh. Emerson leaned forward and David drew his chair closer. We must have looked like a band of conspirators, heads together, hissing at one another. What made you change your mind? I demanded, nose to nose with Ramses. "'for I do not suppose it was concern for your mother's feelings that moved you.' "'Simple logic,' said Ramses, refusing to take the bait. "'We were under surveillance last night. "'It took me longer than it ought to realise that. "'And then we had something of a problem eluding the lads. "'How they became suspicious of us, I don't know. "'Finding you dangling from a rope outside the window?' "'Emerson suggested sarcastically. "'That is one possibility.' The point is that we can't use those personae again, and working our way into the organisation from another direction would take a long time. Since we now know that the man we were after is also the forger, we may be able to employ other methods. He's been a busy little rascal, said Emerson, in his normal tones. I immediately shushed him. He swore softly and leaned closer. "'dealing drugs, manufacturing forgeries, and excavating ancient sites, "'not to mention committing a murder and arranging accidents for us. "'We still are not certain of the motive behind those. "'They must be designed to keep us away from the site,' David murmured. "'The attack on Ramses today cannot be the result of our investigation of the drug business. "'There's no way they could know who we really are.' "'An informant in the police?' I asked. Ramses shook his head. "'Russell's the only one who knows our identities. "'He's too good a policeman to let that information slip. "'The attack today resembled the earlier accidents, "'and that suggests the motive is the one Mr. Vandergill proposed. "'Yes, but what the—' "'Emerson caught himself. "'Damn and blast!' "'Quite,' said Ramses. "'It's the very devil, isn't it? "'Having to whisper and conspire?' I think our friend is becoming a bit rattled, though. We've been pressing him from several different directions, and we must continue to do so. Do you want me back at work tomorrow, Father? Under the circumstances, I believe we should concentrate our forces. Mr. Reisner isn't going to like that, I remarked, especially if Geoffrey remains with us, as he has declared his intention of doing. Then he will have to lump it, said Emerson. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H.
The retreating footsteps must have been as light as a child's. It was the soft click of the closing latch that woke Ramsay's, and his sleep-fogged brain was slow to respond. It took him several seconds to realise that he was lying on the couch in his father's study. A drowsy smile curved his lips as he remembered. Emerson had ordered the others off to the dig and ordered him to rest. He must have slept heavily for hours. The light was that of late afternoon. Rising, he stretched and yawned and went out. He found Senia in the courtyard, with Basima in close attendance. The child was trotting back and forth from the fountain with a little pail with which she was watering the flowers, and the floor, and Horus. When she saw Ramses, she dropped the pail and ran to him, squealing with pleasure. She is very wet, Basima warned him. So I see. It's all right, Basima, he added, laughing as a pair of wet arms went round his neck and a dripping body soaked his shirt. I need to change my clothing anyhow. Not until you have eaten, said Fatima, appearing in the archway. The father of Cassis said you were working and not to disturb you, but it is not good to go so long without food. I will bring soup and cold lamb and lettuces and bread and... No, don't bother. We'll have an early tea, Senia and I. Would you like that, little bird? Jam, said Senia. She was picking up English rapidly, though her speech was still a bewildering mixture of both languages. Perched on his knees, she explained to him that flowers needed much water and that she was helping to make them look pretty. Do you think Horus looks pretty when he is watered? Ramses asked. The cat gave him a sour look. But, as he responded to the child's chatter, part of his mind wandered back to the sound that had wakened him. If it wasn't Fatima who had looked in to see if he wanted food or drink, who was it? Or had he imagined that sly, soft little sound? When Fatima came back with tea and food and milk for Senia, he said casually, I suppose the others are still at the dig? All but Geoffrey Effendi. He said he did not feel well and went to his room to rest. I hope it is not a bad sickness. He is not a strong man. He's stronger than he looks, Ramsay said. No, little bird, cats do not like jam, and don't eat it from the same spoon you put in Horace's mouth. She was a distraction and a delight, the innocent cause of his misery, and one of the few things that allowed him to forget it for a while. No doubt his mother could compose a pithy aphorism on the irony of that. After Senia had been carried off for a bath and a change of clothing, he was too restless to sit still, so he went to the stable. With no particular goal in mind, he headed up into the desert. The emptiness of sand and sky always helped him to think more clearly. This time he could have wished he wasn't thinking straight, that he was misled by anger and jealousy, but the evidence was mounting, and all of it pointed to the same man. He hoped he was wrong. Of all the solutions to his personal problems, this would be the worst. He let Risha set his own pace, paying little attention to his surroundings until a cool wind lifted the hair on his forehead and a sudden twilight turned the air grey. Looking up, he saw the approaching storm. It was still some distance away, but it looked like a bad one. Undirected, Risha had headed for the same place they had been so often. They were less than a mile from Zawayat el Arian. He decided he might as well go on and lend a hand if they were still there. Knowing his father, he thought they probably were. He was within sight of the little group when the first shot whistled past. So close he could have sworn he heard the wind of its passage. His hands tightened on the reins, but Risha, who had better sense than he stretched out and broke into his long, smooth gallop. By the time his agitated family had done arguing and interrogating him and inspecting him for bullet holes, there was no sense in searching for the rifleman. He and David took the horses to the stable and helped rub them down. He learned there what he had expected to learn. It still wasn't proof positive, he told himself. Apparently, none of the others shared his suspicions. His father would have gone straight after Reynolds if his mother had not prevented him. Obeying her orders, he and David went to his room to change their wet clothing. 
It must have been Jack Reynolds, David said, while Ramses rummaged through the wardrobe, looking for dry garments. The rumours mention an Englishman. That means little or nothing. Wardani used the words Sahib and Effendi and Inglisi interchangeably. They indicate a social class rather than a particular nationality. I seem to be out of clean shirts, Ramses muttered. A lot of your things are at the Emilia. David left his wet clothes lying on the floor and went to assist in the search. He pulled out a dresser drawer and reached in. What's this? He had found the little statue of Horus. Maud gave it to me, Ramses said. It was a Christmas gift. She bought it in the souk, I suppose. Charming Western naivete, David said. What do you mean? Isn't that what Europeans say of Egyptian work? Primitive? Naive? All that means is that they don't understand, or care to understand, that particular artistic tradition. No Egyptian made this. Ramses tossed the galabilla he had removed from the wardrobe across a chair and went to David. How do you know? Hard to put in words. The workmanship is rather good, really. But the musculature of the chest and arms, the cast of the features, well, they aren't Egyptian, that's all. They are in the Western tradition, even though the artist was trying to imitate the ancient style. She must have... His voice trailed off as a belated realization of the implication of his analysis came to him. Made it herself? Ramses finished the sentence. Why didn't you show me this before? David demanded. My gentlemanly instincts got in my way, Ramses said in disgust. It seemed indecent to show the girl's gift, especially after Nefret ridiculed it so ruthlessly. Besides, the idea never occurred to me. I haven't your eye, and Maud never said anything about her hobby or showed us examples of her work. He'd make damned good and sure she didn't, David said, especially after he learned you were on his trail. Everything points to him, you know. He took alarm when Nefret made that pointed reference to fakes and the London dealer. How else could anyone have known that the professor had the scarab? He had to kill Maud, because she was about to tell you the truth. It fits, Ramses admitted. She couldn't have understood his real motives or the seriousness of selling forgeries. She probably thought of it as a jolly little joke to be played on a group of solemn scholars. We're still missing something, though. Why did he have to retrieve the scarab? David had been turning the figure over and over in his hands. Because she signed her work, he said. Part of the joke. Look here. Are you sure this wasn't on the scarab? They were incised on the flat base of the statue. Two small hieroglyphic signs. One was an owl, the ancient Egyptian M. The other, below it, was the alphabetic sign for the letter R. Together... They were not only Maud's initials, they made up an Egyptian word. Ramses had deliberately cultivated his visual memory, but he didn't even have to close his eyes and concentrate in order to remember that part of the inscription. Of course it was, he said. It's a title, the word that means overseer or superintendent. That was one of the anomalies I noticed, the fact that the inscription began with the titles of the official who composed it, he practically rubbed my nose in it, the bastard, and I flat out missed it. There you go again, taking yourself to task because you aren't omniscient. How could you possibly have realized what it meant? David slipped the galabia over his head. I think, he went on, after his head had emerged, he panicked unnecessarily when he realized you might have the scarab. Breaking into the house was a risk. There was no risk to him. The men he hired knew nothing about him and he left no trail that could lead back to him. We'd better show this to the professor, David said. Are you ready? Mother wouldn't think so. Attired only in trousers and boots, Ramses shut the bureau drawer and went back to the wardrobe. There's got to be a confounded shirt round here someplace. Ah, they're on the top shelf. His indignant tone made David laugh. That's where they are supposed to be. Are they? Why do women button the damned things before they put them away? They only have to be unbuttoned again. 
David, I don't want to mention this to father or mother tonight. This is the most damning evidence we've found yet, Ramses. We cannot keep it from them. The last nail in Jack Reynolds' coffin, Ramses muttered. No, David, it's too easy. David pushed a pile of papers off a chair and sat down. Out with it, then. If it's not Jack, it must be Geoffrey, you suspect. Look here, Ramses. It's not what you think. He tucked his shirt in. I wasn't suggesting. Yes, you were. You're wrong. Do you suppose I want him to be guilty? Think what that would do to Nefret. But it would be even worse to cover up his guilt on her account. If he's the man we're after, he's totally unprincipled and as dangerous as a snake. He took one of the horses out this afternoon and didn't get back until just before it started raining. You heard what Mohammed said? He could have followed Mother that day solely in order to establish an alibi. Why the devil else would he have followed her? It wouldn't be difficult to arrange a few firecrackers to go off after he'd come gallantly to her rescue. He's had access to Jack's weapons, to Jack's poor, naive mind, and to Jack's sister. A sharp catch of breath from David interrupted him. He shrugged. Feel free to tell me if I've overlooked something. God knows I'd like to think so. It's all circumstantial, David muttered. I know. Give me another day before we break this latest bit of news. I'll stay here at the house tonight and keep an eye on him. He may do something, or refrain from doing something, that will settle the business. What they learned from his parents at dinner that evening could be regarded as another nail in Reynolds' coffin. To Ramsay's, it was a point in his favour. The top men in the drug business seldom used the stuff themselves. They had better sense. So he spent the early hours of the night in the garden watching a particular window. It had been dark for quite a long time before a form emerged and crept through the shadows in the direction Ramses had expected. There was no objection from Nama. Ramses had ordered the dog to be shut up at night when he began working for Russell. Slowly Ramses approached the window of the room that had once been his. He didn't suppose she would be there but he made certain there was no sound of movement or breathing within before he climbed over the sill. It did not take long to find what he was looking for. He removed the bullets before he put the weapon back under the mattress. Up to that point, he had managed to think of nothing except the job at hand, but as he straightened, a series of remembered images flashed across his mind so vividly and painfully that he closed his eyes as if he could shut them out. How in God's name was he going to tell her? Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. As a rule, I rise before Emerson, who is a heavy sleeper, and not at his best in the morning. Conceive of my surprise, therefore, to open my eyes and behold a small circle of glowing red and a statuesque form silhouetted across the starlit window. It was Emerson, not only awake, but dressed and smoking his pipe. I sat up with a start and a cry. What's happened? Nothing as yet, was the calm reply. A number of things are about to happen, however. I must see Reynolds and von Bork and pay a courtesy call on Reisner before we begin work. Do you want to come with me? Certainly. I felt sure you would say that. Do you need any help with your buttons? No, thank you. I can probably dress more quickly without your assistance. Emerson chuckled. Fatima won't be up yet. I will go to the kitchen and make coffee for you, my dear. If I had needed any encouragement to assume my attire without delay, that magnanimous offer would have done it. Emerson's intentions are of the best, but it would probably take Fatima an hour to clean up after him if he did not actually set the stove on fire. Sure enough, I found him swearing and nursing a scalded hand. He had smashed a cup and overturned the coffee pot. There was a dead mouse in the middle of the table, one of Horace's offerings, I presumed. I made the coffee and swept up the fragments of the broken cup while Emerson disposed of the mouse. Looks like a fine day, he remarked, joining me at the table. For what? I demanded, somewhat waspishly. I had cut my finger on a bit of broken cup. Among other things, said Emerson. For excavating. One part of the plot is clear to me now. 
I know what is behind the forger's activities, and what it is we are not meant to find at Sir Wyatt. I suppose you aren't going to tell me. I will give you a hint. Two of the objects the forger sold were unusual, the little ivory statue and the legs of the couch. Both are early dynastic in date. By a strange coincidence, that is also the date of our pyramid. By another strange coincidence, someone is trying to keep us from excavating there. He paused invitingly. Good gad, I breathed. That is, I meant to say, yes, of course, the legs of a funeral couch, richly ornamented with gold, the image of a king, the father or grandfather of a king, a royal burial, or a cash, Emerson amended. Let us suppose our friend found it last year and determined to keep the treasure for himself. How was he to dispose of it without arousing suspicion? By making the genuine artefacts appear to be part of a larger collection with a believable provenance. Brilliant, Emerson. And he cannot have cleared the entire burial, or he wouldn't be trying to drive us away from the site. Some of the funerary goods must still be there. It appears that that may be the case, said Emerson. He would have believed there was no urgency about removing the objects last season. The site is part of Reisner's concession, and he had no intention of returning to it. No one could have anticipated he would offer it to me. And he, the forger, would not have found that out until recently. Reisner would have no reason to mention it to anyone except Monsieur Maspero. And your habit of keeping your plans a secret until the last moment... It must have come as a considerable shock to the bastard, Emerson agreed. My heart bleeds for him. The appearance of Fatima, open-mouthed with surprise at seeing us, put an end to the conversation. I put an end to her apologies and apologized to her for the mess. There was just enough light in the courtyard to allow us to see the shapeless outlines of furniture and fountain. The sky above was a pale shade, almost without color as yet, but I knew it would be a fine day. I took my parasol, however. Rain is not the only thing against which it is a protection. Shall we leave a message for the others? I asked, as the sleepy doorman unbarred the portal. We will be back before they miss us, said Emerson. It won't take long. He was not correct in that assumption. When we reached Jack Reynolds' house, we found the bird had flown. One of them, at any rate. After ascertaining that Jack was not in his house and that none of the servants admitted knowledge of his present whereabouts, Emerson burst into the guest chamber where Carl von Bork lay and shook him awake. The brusque awakening and the sight of Emerson's engorged countenance, only a few inches away, would have reduced a man with less on his conscience than Carl to incoherence. I had quite a time calming him enough to get a statement out of him, and it was not much use. He had stumbled off to bed after we took our departure, leaving Jack in the study. He hadn't seen him since. He had heard nothing, seen nothing, knew nothing, except that he was the lowest of worms, the most contemptible creature on the face of the earth, undeserving of our friendship and Mary's love. This was true, but not of much help, so I left him wringing his hands and crying. Emerson had returned to Jack's study. When I joined him there, he had opened the gun case. One of the rifles is missing, he announced. I see Calm had replaced his fury, and he went about his business with the terrifying efficiency that makes Emerson so formidable. Returning to the guest chamber, he searched that room and the shrinking form of Carl von Bork without finding any sign of a weapon. We then hastened to the stable, where we found, as we had expected, that Jack's horse was gone. The stableman had not been seen. In fact, most of the servants, aroused by Emerson's initial shouts, had fled. Emerson's penultimate act was to strip the gun case of all it contained. Pistols in his belt, the other weapons under his arm, he delayed only long enough to speak a final word to Carl. "'Go to work and say nothing to Junker or anyone else,' he instructed. "'If you are innocent, we may be able to get you out of this yet. "'Guilty or innocent, running away would be the worst mistake you could make.' "'We hastened back to the house. 
The doorman's greeting brought everyone rushing out of the breakfast room, including Leah and David, who had just arrived. Emerson apprised them of the situation in a few brief sentences. So, finish your breakfasts, he concluded. I could do with another cup of coffee myself. Peabody, you haven't eaten. Make haste, my dear, we must be off. Off? Geoffrey exclaimed. To the dig? But, sir, shouldn't we look for Jack? If he's out there somewhere with a rifle, he could be dangerous. Where would we look? Ramses asked for Emerson's look of mild exasperation indicated he did not mean to waste time pointing out the obvious. "'At least you will go armed,' Geoffrey persisted. "'Armed?' Emerson appeared to notice for the first time that he was carrying Jack's weapons. He dropped them with a clatter. "'None of them is loaded.' "'I know where he keeps the ammunition,' Geoffrey said eagerly. "'Let me go and—' "'In his desk,' Emerson interrupted. The damned fool didn't even lock the drawers. I do not carry firearms, Geoffrey. Mrs. Emerson does. I do not object, since, to the best of my knowledge, she has never hit anything yet. Kindly refrain from arguing with me and do as I say. No one else had argued with him. They knew better. However, conversation cannot be restrained for long among us, and after we had taken our places at the table, the inevitable speculation began. "'Perhaps he only went hunting,' Leah suggested. "'Don't sportsmen like to get out early?' "'She looked so sweet and so worried. "'No one wanted to dispel this optimistic fantasy. "'Ramses, who had scarcely spoken since we returned, smiled at her. "'That may well be the case.' "'Emerson put an end to the conversation by ordering us all to work. "'I was, of course, fully armed, "'for I pay no attention to Emerson's little foibles.' Pistol, knife, belt of tools were all in their proper places, and as I went out the door, I took my parasol from its hook. When we reached the Wyatt, the men were already there. Under Selim's direction, several of them were removing the tarpaulin from over the shaft, and Emerson dashed off to make sure no damage had been done. A little water had seeped in, but not much. It cannot be said that my full attention was on the work— I had thought of the terrain as relatively flat, and so it was, compared with the broken cliffs and irregular contours of the Theban mountains where we'd worked before. Still, there were enough ridges to provide cover for any number of determined assassins. I took Selim aside. His young face lengthened and grew grim as he listened to what I told him. Before long, there were men posted at various vantage points around the pyramid and atop that structure. By mid-morning, another layer of animal bones had been photographed and removed. Mixed in with them were scraps of papyrus on which Ramses pounced. Demotic, he announced, after a brief look. You were right about the late date of the deposits, Father. Here is the name of Amasis II. The pit was by now over six feet deep, and we had apparently reached the bottom of the deposit. No more bones appeared, only a thick layer of sand. Emerson poised on the edge of the drop, suddenly called to the men below to stop digging and come up. "'What's wrong?' I asked, hastening to his side. "'Is there evidence of imminent collapse?' "'One has seldom given warning of imminent collapse,' said Emerson sarcastically. He rubbed his chin. "'We've reached the bottom of the intrusive pit. "'If you look closely, you can see the top of one of the original filling blocks.' There cannot be more than a few layers of them. We've already gone down seven or eight feet, and I calculated that the lowest part of the fill was less than twelve feet from the surface. We will need ropes, Selim said, to pull the stones up. I want the men roped too, said Emerson. No more than three down there at a time, Selim. Two men holding on to each rope, and tell them if they let go I will break their arms. Emerson would have been one of the three in the pit had I not convinced him his strength and skill would be more useful elsewhere. So the task began, slowly and carefully. The stones were not the massive blocks employed at Giza, but each of them must have weighed several hundred pounds, and it took the men a long time to raise one of them far enough to pass a rope under it. Emerson ordered the men up before the stone was hauled to the surface and dragged away from the edge. 
It's going to take all day at this rate, I said, peering down into the cavity. A week, if need be, said Emerson, wiping his wet forehead with his sleeve. Of course. Shall we stop for a bite of lunch, since there's no hurry? Emerson grudgingly agreed, so we retired to the shelter, and the men went off for a smoke and a rest. Before long, I saw a horseman approaching from the north, and called the attention of the others to him. No one reacted, aside from the fact that an assassin would not approach so openly. It would have been impossible to mistake the slim, graceful form of the rider for that of the burly American. It was Geoffrey, whom Emerson had sent off to Giza to ascertain whether Jack had reported for work. He's not there," were the young man's first words as he hurried toward us. He never turned up this morning, and he hasn't been back to the house. I went there too. Emerson said, "Hm," and went on eating. I said, "Sit down, Geoffrey, and have a glass of tea. You look very warm." Smiling and shaking his head, Geoffrey kissed his wife and sank down at her feet. Your coolness amazes me, Mrs. Aunt Amelia, though I ought to be accustomed to it by now. We are only demonstrating the qualities for which our superior caste is famous. Ramsay drawled, "British phlegm, noblesse oblige, coolness under fire. What have I left out?" Don't be hateful," Nefret snapped. "That's the part I left out," said Ramses. "Hatefulness. May I have another sandwich?" "What did Mr. Reisner say?" I inquired. "He wasn't very happy," Jeffrey admitted. "I told him there was trouble." "What?" Emerson exclaimed in awful tones. "Oh, I didn't go into detail, sir. I assure you." There was no need," he said. "Trouble was your normal condition, and that as soon as you'd settled the business, he would appreciate having at least part of his staff returned to him." Emerson chuckled, and Jeffrey said anxiously, "There's been no sign of Jack here, I suppose. Honestly, I don't mean to be an alarmist, but how can you go on working when you know he's out there somewhere, waiting and watching, and lurking?" Ramsay suggested. I've never yet allowed a criminal to interfere with my excavations," Emerson declared. "We are on the verge of a great discovery here. This will come as a considerable surprise to. Oh, damnation! It won't, will it, Ramses? I wasn't going to say anything," his son protested. "I saw the way you and David looked at one another, so you've reasoned it out, have you? The Third Dynasty royal burial, yes, sir." It was a logical deduction, given the information we've collected, but, Ramsay said hastily, neither of us could come up with an idea as to where it might be. Do you think the shaft, sir? No," said Emerson, somewhat appeased by this disingenuous admission of fallibility. The place must be relatively easy of access, or our friend couldn't have got at it without others knowing. The deposits in the shaft haven't been disturbed for millennia. There are only two possibilities: either there is a hidden entrance to the real burial chamber down below, or the whole pyramid is a blind, and the king was buried in a pit tomb in one of the cemeteries. I favour the former because I felt obliged to interrupt. Geoffrey, are you all right? That cough is quite nasty. A sip of little tea, if you can. The young man straightened. I'm better now. He gasped, smiling at Lefret, whose arm was round his shoulders. It was only, only surprise. Go on, father," Ramsay said. "Why do you think the hidden burial chamber is in the pyramid? What? Oh, well, for one thing, a burial in one of the cemeteries would be rather too accessible to potential thieves as well as to us. The treasure must be inside the pyramid, under the floor of a corridor or storage chamber." Or that of the false burial chamber itself, but I will not send our men down below until the shaft has been cleared. Agreed. He did not wait for an answer, but jumped up. Back to work then. The others followed, leaving me alone with Geoffrey and Lefret. Make him rest a while, I said. Yes, Aunt Amelia. She spoke no more. Seeing her closed lips and remote expression, I felt a pang. Not of self-reproach, but of loss. Would we ever be again? 
what once we had been to one another. As the day wore on, my vigilance began to relax. There'd been no sign of Jack. Perhaps, I thought hopefully, he'd taken flight. When I expressed this possibility to Emerson, he only grunted. His full attention was bent on his work. I am convinced Emerson has a sixth sense for archaeology, as I do for crime. He had read the signs few other excavators would have observed. When the catastrophe occurred, he was the only one of us who was prepared. The men had removed four of the blocking stones, exposing another layer beneath. It was hard, slow work, and the ropes Emerson had insisted they fasten round their bodies kept getting tangled. A certain amount of cursing and complaining accompanied their activities. Finally, a fifth stone was ready to be raised. The men in the pit were hauled up, and then the stone began to rise. It was halfway to the surface when the rope broke, or the knots gave way. I couldn't see which. I only saw the thing fall. One corner of it struck the bottom, and the impact caused the whole understructure to give way, with a crash that echoed like a blast of dynamite. A cloud of sand and dust billowed up from the shaft, and Emerson threw himself across the body of one of the ropemen, who had slipped and was sliding inexorably toward the opening of the pit. Everyone came running. When the dust settled, Emerson sat up, counted heads, and let out a sigh of relief. No harm done, he announced, wiping his mouth on the back of his hand, which did not improve matters greatly, since hand and face were equally dirty. A groan from the man he had saved drew his attention. He lifted the fellow up, inspected him, dusted him off, and handed him over to two of his friends. No harm done, he repeated. That takes care of clearing the shaft, said Ramses, peering down into the depths. Get away from there, Ramses, I ordered. You too, Geoffrey. Gracious, the depth must now be a good sixty feet. Hmm, yes, said Emerson. Just as well. Hauling the stones up by way of the stairs will take longer, but it won't be so dangerous. I'm afraid another of your windlasses has gone, Selim. So long as it was not a man, father of curses. Well said, Emerson clapped him on the back. Let's have a look down there. Can't it wait until tomorrow? I asked. Why wait? There are several hours of daylight left. He had covered less than half the distance between the mouth of the shaft and the entrance to the descending stairs when he came to a stop, for an excellent reason. Jack Reynolds had not been lurking in the vicinity. He had been here all along, out of sight at the bottom of the rough-cut steps. Now he emerged, dusty and red-faced and wild-eyed, with a rifle raised to his shoulder. It was aimed at Emerson. Chapter 14 The Sahib's board not made. The code that governs our class is clear. Uncompromising honesty, unflinching courage, respect for women and other helpless creatures, and that delicate sense of honour only the Anglo-Saxon races can fully understand. Don't do it, Emerson, I shrieked for I'd seen the tensing of that splendid frame and knew it betokened imminent attack. See if you can't reason with him. Emerson said something I couldn't hear. It was undoubtedly a swear word, but he obeyed Jack's gesture and backed slowly away as the younger man advanced toward him. Finally, Jack stopped. That'll do, Professor. Close enough so we needn't shout at one another. Throat's dry. I finished the water a while back. His voice rasped with thirst, but he sounded fairly rational. Taking heart, I said, I have a canteen, Jack. If you will allow me... No, thank you, ma'am. Not until after I've settled my account with Ramses. Ramses? I repeated. Jack, you're not being sensible. All of us know about the treasure. And your present illogical behavior substantiates our theory as to where it must be. It is futile to guard the substructure now. You cannot kill all of us. Kindly refrain from putting ideas into his head, Peabody, said Emerson. Jack's forehead wrinkled. 
I have no idea what you're talking about, Mrs. Emerson. Don't you come any closer. Nor you, Nefret. It's Ramsey's I'm after. I don't want to hurt anyone else. None of us is going to stand quietly by while you shoot him, Jack, Nefret began. Please. Shoot? His voice cracked. Just suppose I would shoot an unarmed man? I only want a square deal. An inkling of the truth had begun to dawn on me, but it was so horrifying, my brain refused to take it in. Emerson was the first to respond to Jack's statement. If you don't intend to shoot anyone, why are you pointing that rifle at me? Put it down, and we will talk. As soon as you promise, you won't interfere. Make it a fair fight. Not everybody jumping me at once. Hold on a minute, father, Ramsay said, as Emerson, sputtering with fury, tried to articulate a reply. What precisely do you have in mind, Reynolds? If this is a challenge, the choice of weapons is mine. Weapons be damned, Jack snarled. Fists are good enough for me. And for me, Ramsay said quickly. Jack, no, Geoffrey cried. You can't win. He doesn't fight like a gentleman. Stay out of this, Jeff. Jack passed his sleeve across his sweating face. He murdered Maud and wants to blame me for it. And I'll kill him if I can, but I'll do it with my bare hands and a fair fight. If he kills me, well, what have I got to live for now? Maud is gone, and you've got the woman I wanted, and he's manufactured enough evidence against me to send me to the gallows. But I won't shoot a man in cold blood. Honesty, the honesty of a decent, rather stupid man, echoed in every word he had uttered. If he had spoken the truth, and I was certain he had, that meant that the evidence against him had been manufactured, and that his actions and beliefs had been subtly manipulated by another. The list of suspects had suddenly shrunk to one. And now that individual knew his schemes had been thwarted by his failure to understand the limits to which a man of honour can be pushed. He could not allow the absurd exchange of fisticuffs to take place, Jack would lose, because Ramses did not fight like a gentleman. And under interrogation, especially of the variety Emerson employs, Jack would point the finger of blame at the real culprit. He had to act instantly, and he did. His hands were in his pockets. He whipped the gun out and fired, with the cold calculation that had always guided him at the only armed man present. The bullet struck poor, gaping Jack in the thigh. He dropped the rifle and fell, writhing to the sand. Ramses, who had sprung forward, jolted to a stop as the pistol turned, not toward him, but toward me. "'Don't bother fumbling for that little pea-shooter of yours, Aunt Amelia,' Geoffrey said. "'And don't any of the rest of you stir so much as an inch. "'I can kill at least three of you before you could reach me.' and I will start with her. You'll have to start with me, said Nefret, in a clear, thin voice. I'm going to see what I can do for Jack. Please yourself, said her husband indifferently. Just don't touch the rifle. She has better sense than that, said Ramses. You could and would fire before she aimed the weapon. You have just demonstrated that you are an excellent shot, and that your squeamishness about guns was part of the facade you presented to us, and to the world. It was a masterful performance. Coming from you, that is indeed a compliment, Geoffrey said. I have heard a number of stories about your skill and the art of disguise. But you caught on to me before this, didn't you? Was it last night, while I was out of the house encouraging Jack to make himself scarce, that you removed the bullets from the coat? Not a bad notion but you underestimated me when you assumed I would not examine the weapon. I replaced the ammunition from Jack's supply when I went back to the house this morning. I took stock of the situation. It was not encouraging. Nefret knelt beside Jack, who was halfway between us and the entrance to the substructure. Fists clenched and brow thunderous, Emerson was almost as far distant, a good ten feet away, with Leah and David behind him. 
The only one who was close enough to present a danger to Geoffrey was my son, and he dared not move because of the threat to me. Behind that mask of his, I knew he was coolly calculating the odds and trying to think of ways of shifting them in our favour. He glanced at his father and then returned his gaze to Geoffrey. I did underestimate you, he admitted. It only goes to show how misleading physiognomy can be, Geoffrey said, with that sweet boyish smile. I have the looks of an aesthete, don't I? When I was younger, I tried to measure up to the family standards. But no matter how skilled I became at hunting and shooting and riding, the old man sneered at my accomplishments and my girlish face. So I decided to go my own way and use my defects to my advantage. I was doing rather well until you came along. You can understand why I will enjoy killing as many of you as possible before I am captured. That is foolish, I said disapprovingly. Your doom is not certain at the present time. If you harm no one else, the possibilities of escaping justice... Peabody, will you please refrain from making suggestions? Emerson shouted. Emerson, will you please be quiet? Nefret got slowly to her feet. Geoffrey, you know I will stand by you if you don't hurt anyone else. For better or worse, do you remember? Give Aunt Amelia... No, give Ramses the gun. His face softened and his eyes turned to her. Emerson had been waiting for just such a moment. With a shout of, Down, Peabody! He leapt forward. Not until later did I fully appreciate the heroic courage of that gesture. It was a deliberate, calculated attempt to draw Geoffrey's fire away from me and from his son. Emerson knew that Ramses would have risked an attack rather than see me shot down in cold blood. And at that range, Geoffrey could not have missed him. We all reacted precisely as my valiant spouse had known we would. The bullet whistled over me as I dropped to hands and knees. I heard a grunt from Emerson and a scream from Nefret. I saw Ramses leap forward, striking the weapon from Geoffrey's hand and simultaneously hitting him very hard on the chin. Geoffrey reeled back. He had been dangerously close to the edge of the shaft. The last step took him over. I had a flashing glimpse of a face, open-mouthed, in a silent scream of terror, and a pair of flailing arms. At the same instant, Ramses flung himself flat onto the ground and reached out. Time seemed to stop, as the cloud of dusty sand settled over Ramses' black head and sweat-soaked shirt, I saw that his arms and half his body, almost to the waist, were over the edge. His hands grasped Geoffrey's right wrist. That grip was the only thing between the miserable creature and a hideous death. The side of the shaft was too smooth to permit him to find a foothold. He appeared to have fainted. His entire dead weight hung limp, and his head was bowed. I could hear Emerson swearing, which relieved my worst fear... Another was almost as acute, for it seemed to me that Ramses was too far off balance to pull himself back, much less help himself and Geoffrey. I took hold of his belt and shouted for help. It was there. Half blinded by sand and in a considerable state of agitation, I hadn't seen David and Selim running toward me. With a cry of alarm, our young rice grasped Ramses round the legs and tried to pull him back. David lay flat and reached down. Geoffrey, give me your other hand, he called. Geoffrey raised his head. He hadn't fainted. He was conscious and aware. Safety lay within his grasp. The man he had tried to murder held him fast, and the hand of the man he had traduced was held out to aid him. His delicate lips curved in a smile. He raised his free arm, but instead of grasping David's hand, he raked his nails viciously across Ramsay's whitened knuckles and twisted himself free of Ramsay's grasp. Like the throat of a monster, the dark shaft swallowed him, and his scream ended in a hideous crunch. Shuddering, I rose to my knees. 
Had I been a lesser woman, I might have remained in that position to render thanks to the Almighty, but I do not waste time in prayer when there are more urgent matters to be attended to. I hastened to Emerson. Blood oozed from his side, but he was on his feet, with Nefret attempting to support him. He pushed her gently away. Only a scratch, Peabody. Knocked me down, though, curse it. Is Ramses unharmed? Ramses replied. He and David had joined us. Both were pale, but not so pale as Nefret. She swayed and would have fallen at Emerson's feet had he not caught her in his arms. Fainted, he said, as her golden head came to rest against his breast. Small wonder. I glanced back at the scene of the tragedy and saw Selim running toward the entrance to the pyramid. I knew what he was doing and blessed him for doing it on his own initiative, but someone must make additional arrangements for the disposal of the remains. And Jack was still unconscious, and Ramses looked as if he were about to be sick, and Emerson's shirt was sticky with blood, and... And in short, the situation was bad enough to tax even my powers. The only other person present who comprehended the nature of the latest emergency was Leah. Bending over in a fret, she exclaimed, Aunt Amelia, she... Yes, Leah, I know. Dowd carried a fret back to the house as quickly and as gently as possible. Leah, go with them. Find Khadijah. She will know what to do. Emerson, remove your shirt and let me have a look at you. But he would allow no other to take his daughter from him. The urgency in my voice had betrayed my concern for her. He knew there was something wrong. Without delaying to ask questions, he strode away, the vigour of his movements assuring me that his injury was not serious. What do you want me to do, Aunt Emilia? David asked. Go with them, Ramses said, before I could reply. Tell father to take Risha. It was a sensible suggestion. The great stallion's strength and speed were the greatest, and his gait the easiest. David hesitated, torn between conflicting duties. Ramses said impatiently, Hurry, damn it, I'll bring mother with me on moonlight. David ran off with a last pleading look at me, which I did not at all need. I unhooked the flask of brandy from my belt. I didn't want any brandy, said Ramses. I hadn't meant for you to drink it. Hold out your hands. There is nothing as dirty as human fingernails, unless it is human teeth. Christ, mother, swearing I must accept at times, but blasphemy I do not permit, I said sternly. Hold out your hands. Father was hit, Ramses muttered. He did not flinch when the alcohol touched the raw lines across the backs of his hands. I thought there was only one shot. What is wrong with Nefret? Nothing that can't be mended, I said, hoping I was right. Let me speak a few words to Selim and Daoud, and then we must hurry on. It came as no surprise when Selim told me Geoffrey was dead. I trust I will not be accused of callousness when I say I had hoped that was the case. I gave him the necessary instructions and then went to have a look at Jack, who had recovered consciousness. Nefret had done a neat job of bandaging the wound, but in my opinion he was too weak to mount a horse, so I gave him a little sip of brandy and told him to stay where he was until Selim could find some means of transportation. Hastening back to Ramses, I found him standing in the exact same spot where I'd left him, staring blankly toward the north. For once, he did as he was told, without arguing, lifting me onto moonlight and mounting Geoffrey's horse. We set out at the quickest possible pace for home. When I came into the sitting room, they were waiting, Emerson and Ramses and David. I was too tired and distressed to mince words, nor would it have been kind to keep them in suspense. She has miscarried. I said. It is over. She is in no danger. Leah is with her and Khadija. Ramses sat down, rather in the manner of Queen Victoria, who never looked to see whether there was a chair to receive her. Fortunately, he was standing in front of a sofa. Don't look like that, I exclaimed. She's perfectly all right. This sort of thing is, is not uncommon. But it rather compounds my offence, don't you think? 
Ramses inquired. Not only her husband, but her... That is morbid and self-indulgent, I said sharply. The wretched man was a murderer, and you risked yourself trying to save his life. Does she know that? My blow knocked him into the shaft. She didn't see what happened afterward. She must know. If she doesn't, I will tell her. As for... as for the other, it was not even... She was only... I am speaking of weeks, not months. Ramses pulled himself to his feet. Excuse me. I will be in my room if I'm wanted. David started after him. Ramses turned on his friend with lowering brows and bared teeth. Never had he so closely resembled his father. For God's sake, leave me alone. Oh, dear, I said. Oh, dear. David? Never mind, Aunt Emilia. I understand. I'll be nearby if you should want me. He followed Ramses out. Emerson took me by the hand. Sit down, my dearest. You are certain the fret is safe. Oh, yes, I said wearily. She is young and strong. She will be herself again in a few days. It is Ramses I'm concerned about. He seems to blame himself, and there is no need, Emerson. Indeed, there is not. It was Geoffrey's doing all of it, from start to finish. I must go to Ramses, Emerson, and tell him. No, sweetheart. Not now. Come and sit by me, Emerson, please. And you might just put your arm round me, if you wouldn't mind. My darling. Holding me close, he rocked me gently as he would have rocked a child. It's all right, Peabody. We'll weather this as we've weathered other troubles. It could be worse, you know. Could be, and has been, I agreed taking heart from his closeness and strength. Does your wound pain you, my dear? Perhaps I ought to have another look at it. I was in something of a hurry when... No, Emerson said emphatically. I feel half a mummy as it is. When I think what horrible harm that wretched man has done, I'm sorry his death was so quick, I said fiercely. It was money he wanted, wasn't it? No crime was too vile if it brought him wealth. Dealing in drugs, robbing a tomb, selling forgeries, even marrying the frat. Emerson shook his head. Her fortune was certainly an attraction. But as you know, Peabody, it is entirely under her control. I think he loved her as much as he was capable of loving anyone, in his own strange way. Strange indeed. How could we have been so obtuse, Emerson? All the evidence that made me suspect Jack applied equally well to Geoffrey. Once I realised that the wretch had been poor Maud's lover, why that possibility did not occur to me long ago, I cannot imagine. Nor can I, said Emerson. Jack would never have had the imagination to think of manufacturing forgeries to cover up his sale of illegal antiquities, I went on. He trusted Geoffrey. It wouldn't have occurred to him that his friend would seduce his sister and use her for his own evil ends. She was putty in his hands, until she lost her heart to another and hoped to win his regard by betraying Geoffrey. Well now, Peabody, that does seem extraordinary, Emerson remarked in his most normal voice. She was a poor, silly little creature, but would she have been fool enough to believe a confession of that sort would win Ramsay's affection? And how did Geoffrey get wind of her intention in time to stop her? She warned him, of course, I said wearily. To a silly romantic girl, that would seem the honourable thing to do. She never realised how ruthless he was. Women can be perfect idiots where a man is concerned. Why, my dear, I believe that is the first time I have ever heard you make a rude generalization about your own gender. It is very good of you to make little jokes in an attempt to cheer me, Emerson. I drew away from him and smoothed my hair. That was not a joke. But his blue eyes shone with mingled amusement and tenderness, and he put his arm round my waist. What is it, Peabody? What troubles you? We've come through another bad time, relatively unscathed, and the ending, 
though dreadful enough, was at least an ending. It was mercifully quick and final, I agreed. Even the, the other business. Cruel as it may sound, one must regard the sad event as a blessing in disguise. Does she regard it as a blessing in disguise? I didn't say that to her, Emerson. What sort of clumsy fool do you take me for? She wept very much, and... Oh, Emerson! My tears could not be restrained. Mumbling incoherent words of affection, Emerson picked me up and took me onto his lap. She didn't want me. I snuffled against his shoulder. Whenever she looked at me, she started crying again. A week later, I met the morning train from Luxor and greeted my dear old friend, Dr. Willoughby. My telegram had said only that he was needed. Good man that he was, he had abandoned his patients and his clinic and come at once. As we proceeded by carriage to the house, I told him the entire story, holding nothing back, for I trusted his discretion, as I trusted his expertise in nervous disorders. Physically, she has fully recovered, Doctor, and she tries to eat and exercise and do all the other things, I ask. It is heartbreaking to see how hard she tries, to see the effort it costs her to smile and pretend she is glad to see me. She doesn't want to see me, Dr. Willoughby. She doesn't want any of us. Most of the time, she lies there without moving or speaking, and when she thinks we're not looking, she starts to cry again. My dear Mrs. Emerson, it is not surprising, the good man said soothingly. I have seldom heard such a tragic story. Wife and widow in the space of only a few weeks, learning that the young husband she had loved was a monster of villainy, seeing him die in such a horrible fashion, and then her hopes of motherhood destroyed. You cannot expect complete emotional recovery in so short a time. Don't apologize for summoning me. I would have been offended if you had not. I hadn't told him the thing that worried me most. Try as she might to hide it, she shrank from me and from Emerson, the very sight of whom brought tears to her eyes. But Ramsay's she would not see at all, and he made no effort to see her. Surely, I told myself, she could not be so unjust as to blame him for what had happened. It was the only interpretation that occurred to me, however, and I dared not ask her point-blank while she was in her present state. Leah, from whom I had hoped to gain additional information, was unable or unwilling to give it. She claimed, and I had no reason to doubt her, that Nefret would not talk to her either. I would have worried about Leah, too, if I hadn't had more pressing matters on my mind. She crept about the house like a little shadow of herself, finding solace only in the company of her husband. I thought I understood the cause of her distress. Did we not all feel the same? Dr. Willoughby stayed with us for two days. On three separate occasions he was alone with Nefret, but he would not discuss his diagnosis until after the final visit. We were all waiting for him in the courtyard that afternoon, and when he joined us, Emerson jumped up and poured whiskey and soda for everyone, including Lear, who never drank whiskey and soda. Willoughby took his glass with a nod of thanks. "'I won't mince words, my friends,' he said gravely. "'The situation is more serious than I thought. "'I believe I have won her confidence up to a point, "'but there is something preying on her mind "'she won't speak of even to me. "'His tired, kindly grey eyes, "'the eyes of a man who has seen too much sorrow, "'moved around the circle of anxious faces. "'One thing you must understand. "'It may help to relieve you.' She holds no one except herself accountable for what happened. The cause of her present illness is not grief, as I supposed, but guilt. Guilt? I cried. About what in heaven's name? That is ridiculous, Dr. Willoughby. No one blames her. How could we? I will tell her so. If it were only that simple. Dr. Willoughby sighed and shook his head. I am not a follower of the new schools of psychological theory, Mrs. Emerson, but years of experience have taught me that the causes of mental illness cannot be countered by rational argument. You cannot cure an individual suffering from melancholia by pointing out that he has many reasons to be happy. 
You cannot remove Nefret's feelings of guilt by telling her they are groundless. She must come to terms with them herself. My own experience told me he was right. But if we could discover why she feels guilty? I persisted. That is a task for an expert, Willoughby replied. Not for me, or even for you. Especially for you, Mrs. Emerson, if I may be so bold as to say so. The power of love is strong, but it can cloud the clinical detachment necessary for diagnosis and cure. In other words, said Emerson heavily, you are telling us to keep out of it. I wouldn't have put it quite that way, Willoughby smiled. Be of good heart, my friends. I gave you the bad news first. The good news is that I feel certain she will make a full recovery in time. Have you any practical suggestions? Emerson inquired. Originally, I intended to suggest you bring her to Luxor, to my clinic. Now I think it would be advisable to remove her altogether from anything that reminds her of the tragedy. Including us? Ramses asked. It was the first time he'd spoken. I don't know, Willoughby admitted wearily. We could hire a nurse to escort her. There is a private sanitarium in Switzerland that specialises in such cases. I will accompany them, I said firmly. Without Nefret's knowledge, if you think it advisable. Willoughby smiled at me. I assumed you would say that. As soon as possible, then. The arrangements were soon underway. With the doctor's concurrence, I told Nefret what had been planned. It had been several days since I had ventured to visit her. I dreaded that interview, and yet I yearned for it. The sympathetic reader will understand those conflicting emotions. Nefret was sitting by the window, wearing one of her pretty dressing gowns. Khadija, who had been with her, slipped out of the room when I entered and I knew it was that silent, loving woman who had helped her to dress and brushed her hair. She looked better, I thought, and she summoned a faint smile of welcome. Dr. Willoughby told you we are sending you to Switzerland? I inquired, taking the chair next to hers. Yes, I am sorry to cause so much trouble. The listless voice struck straight to my heart, destroying my habitual self-control. I reached for her hand. Don't you know that there is no trouble we would not take for you? You, who are as dear as a daughter. She flinched as if I had struck her. The fingers of the hand I held twisted, not in rejection, but in order to clasp mine more tightly. You don't know what I've done. I don't know what you think you've done. It could not make me love you less. Her eyes filled with tears, but she held them back. I'll be better soon, I promise. I am sure you will. Do you want... Will you let me come with you to Switzerland? She was silent for a moment. Then she murmured, as if to herself, I must make a start. I am only hurting them more. I ached with pity, and, yes, with curiosity. But I knew I dared not question her. So, I waited holding her hand in mine, until she nodded. I would like you to come. Thank you, I said warmly. What about the others? Emerson has been so worried about you, he isn't fit to live with. I don't believe I can stand his fits of temper much longer. That brought another smile. Bless him. Would he leave his work, though? He would abandon the richest tomb in Egypt to be with you. Her lips trembled. If that is what he wants. I decided I had better not push my luck by asking about Ramses. I hastened to tell Emerson the good news and came close to tears myself when I saw how his drawn face brightened. For the past week, Emerson had done nothing at the site, not even starting to remove the stones that blocked the passage. We'd been busy enough, heaven knows, telegraphing Geoffrey's family and making the arrangements for a quiet private burial talking with various government officials and Mr. Russell of the police. I made it quite clear to him that Ramses was not to be a policeman. Poor Jack Reynolds had to be consoled and nursed. Carl von Bork had to be lectured and set straight. 
The Vandergelds had rushed back to Cairo as soon as they learned of the tragedy, and Catherine was a great help to me with the last two. It was she who suggested that Carl be given the responsibility for Jack's care, and our German friend's response encouraged me to hope that this would be the saving of both of them. Of Geoffrey's burial, I will not speak. I was there because I felt I ought to be. The only member of the family who accompanied me was Ramsay's. I had told him he could not come, but he came anyhow. I did not know what I was going to do about Ramsay's. Leave him alone, was Emerson's advice. Leave me alone, was the unspoken message I received loud and clear from Ramsay's himself. Now, with his mind more at ease about Nefret, Emerson declared his intention of investigating the substructure of the pyramid. Privately, he explained to me that he was only doing it in the hope of cheering Ramses up. I did not question his motives, not aloud at any rate. When we set out that morning for Zawiat, the weather was perfect. Dawn spread across the eastern sky like a blush on a maiden's cheek. A soft breeze ruffled Leah's hair, we were all present, except Nefret, of course, and half a dozen of our most trusted men were waiting when we arrived. Nothing remained to testify to the tragedy that had occurred. Even the bloodstains had been covered by blowing sand. When Selim advanced to meet us, the look of suppressed excitement on the young man's ingenuous countenance told me that he had news for us. Well, my spouse inquired, all is prepared, O oh father of curses, we have removed the rubble from the corridor and brought brooms. Emerson, I exclaimed indignantly, how could you? Now, Peabody, Emerson began. The others began talking very quickly. I was delighted to see that even Ramses had perked up a bit. He said, what was it you saw, father? Leah said, brooms? Why brooms? And David exclaimed, I thought the passage was completely blocked. Emerson glanced self-consciously at me. It was all Selim's doing, really. He discovered that by shoving some of the fallen stones down into the lower part of the shaft, he could crawl over them into the continuation of the entrance passage. I asked him to have a closer look at the section of the corridor outside the burial chamber. I had just um, happened to notice the floor there was uneven. The surface was dusty and littered and it was too dark to see clearly, and I, um... <clears throat> Why didn't you tell me? I demanded indignantly. Because you would have gone herring down to see for yourself, Emerson snapped, and been mashed by fallen stones or buried alive. I wanted the shaft empty before we continued. And then, well, you know what happened. I still don't know for certain that we've found the right place. Then let us ascertain whether it is so. I cried, starting for the stairs. Emerson insisted on preceding me, of course. Selim had done a good deal more than move a few stones. The way was clear, and we proceeded without mishap into the corridor that ended in the soi-disant burial chamber. As soon as we reached the spot, I saw what had caught Emerson's trained eye. It was more obvious now that the litter of millennia had been partially removed— a section of the floor that was slightly sunken and partially defined by patterns of suspiciously regular cracks. "'Give me a broom!' I cried, snatching it from Selim. My first enthusiastic assault on the surface raised such a cloud of dust that the others retreated, and I burst into a paroxysm of sneezing. Following my husband's profane advice, I moderated my efforts, and before long... The truth of Emerson's assumption was confirmed. A section of the stone had been cut out and replaced by cunningly mortared blocks. Originally, it would have been indistinguishable from the living stone itself, but the passage of time had crumbled the mortar in some sections. That's the one he had up, Ramsay said, indicating one of the blocks. He didn't bother replacing the mortar. Father, shall I... Watch your fingers, Emerson grunted handing him a small chisel. At this demonstration of paternal affection, tears came to my eyes. Or perhaps I should say additional tears, since the irritation of the dusty air had caused all of us to weep like mourners at a funeral. Ramsay soon had the stone up. 
Emerson's superb, I might even say godlike forbearance continued. Under ordinary circumstances, he would have removed bodily anyone, myself included, to get the first look at such a discovery. On this occasion, he handed Ramses the torch and stood back. Lying flat, Ramses pointed the torch down. Well, I cried. Ramses looked up at me. Dust and perspiration had formed a sticky mask over his features. It cracked a little around his mouth. See for yourself, Mother. There's just enough room for you next to me. He held the torch steady as I stretched out prostrate upon the floor and peered into the cavity. At first I saw only a chaotic tumble of shapes, angular and rounded, rough and smooth. Then my astonished eyes and mind sorted them out. There were vessels of alabaster and granite inside a strange framework of crumbling wood and matting, a bed or couch upside down and tilted to one side. Under it was another wooden surface, a coffin, I thought, though I couldn't be sure. All around were other scattered objects. In silence, overwhelmed by what I had beheld, I let my noble spouse haul me to my feet and take my place. Everyone had a turn, including Selim, and then Emerson spoke. He was hoarse with emotion, or possibly with dust, but he spoke in the measured tones of a lecturer. You observed there are no small portable objects within arm's reach. Time was short, and he did not dare remove more than one stone. He took as much as he could get his hands on, including the legs of the funerary couch, meaning to finish the job this season. He avoided using Geoffrey's name. We had all got into that habit. He just grabbed and snatched, didn't he? Leah said. What a mess he's made of it. It wasn't particularly tidy anyhow, Ramsay said. It is obviously a reburial and a hasty one. The thieves who attacked the original burial must have been caught before they finished their ghoulish task, and the pious successor of King Haba, if that was his name, decided to conceal what was left of the funerary equipment more securely. Uh, do you agree, father? Quite, my boy, quite. And secure it remained for over four thousand years, except for the natural processes of decay. They used cedar beams to roof the chamber and support the blocking stones, but the wood of the couch and coffin wasn't as tough. They and any other wooden objects that may be down there will crumble at a touch. Leah began to cough, and David put his arm round her. We are going out, Professor, if that is all right with you. We're all going, said Emerson. Come along, Peabody. When we emerged into the daylight, I felt as if I had traversed not only several hundred metres of space, but forty-five centuries of time. The find was unique. No other royal burial of that remote period had been found. This one, though unquestionably incomplete, would solve the question of the pyramid's owner, shed new light on the artistic and social attitudes of the time, and additional lustre on the name of the greatest Egyptologist of this or any other era. We tidied ourselves up a bit, for Selim, always efficient, had brought jars of water. Emerson gathered our men round. Even before he made his announcement, I knew what he would say. I am leaving it to you, Selim, to replace the stone and conceal it. I know I can trust you to do the job as well as your father would have done, and that I can depend on all of you to say nothing of what we have found today. Selim's countenance betrayed the pride he felt at having such confidence reposed in him. But he said only, Yes, Father of Curses, your wishes are command, but it will be hard to wait. Hard for all of us, said Ramses, glancing at his father, who was chewing fiercely on the stem of his pipe. He spoke Arabic, as Emerson had done. There's at least one season's work there, Selim, if it is carried out as the Father of Curses demands. We have less than a week. I understand. We will guard the secret, and the burial will be here, safe and undisturbed, when you return. So that was settled. I knew I could leave the closing of the house and the storage of our goods to sell him in Fatima. I did not suppose we would ever return to the villa. It held too many unhappy memories. 
The question of what to do with Senia had not occupied my mind for long. She would have to go with us, not only because I was too much of a coward to face the explosion that would ensue, should I attempt to remove Ramses from her, but because Ramses had some notion she would not be entirely safe in Egypt, even in the devoted care of Daoud and Khadija. I doubted Kalan would dare try to harm her. He was still in hiding, and he would not have risked the wrath of Emerson, but I did not try to dissuade Ramses. She was the only person who could make him laugh. A few days before we were to leave for Port Said, we gathered for the last time in the courtyard with Cyrus and Catherine, who had come to say goodbye. Emerson and David were smoking their pipes. Ramses sat on the rim of the fountain, looking down at the water. "'You sure you don't want me to have a crack at the pyramid?' Cyrus asked, without much hope. "'Bah!' said Emerson, amiably. "'I didn't suppose so. "'Oh, well, looks as if Maspero may give me part of Abyssir next year. "'So, if you folks are going to be at Zawayat, we'll be neighbors again.' "'We will drink to that,' I proclaimed, and Emerson passed round the whiskey. "'Why Ramses should have delayed his announcement until that particular evening I did not know. "'It could hardly have been delayed much longer.' "'I won't be going back with you.' "'What did you say?' I demanded, "'observing that Emerson was staring fixedly at a potted plant. "'The news was obviously not news to him. "'I'm going to work with Mr. Reisner for another month or so,' Ramsay said. "'He's been left short-handed by the loss of two of his staff members.' "'Nonsense!' I exclaimed. "'We owe him nothing. I strictly forbid. "'It will be excellent experience,' said Emerson giving me a meaningful look. We talked about it later when we were alone, and I was forced to agree that I could not change Ramsay's mind. I never had been able to. Senia would remain with him on the Amelia, attended, I did not doubt, by all the women in the family, and return with him and Basima in early April. By then? Who knew what might have happened by then? For once... Not even I had the answer. The following is an excerpt from Manuscript H. Ramses had not told David of his decision either. He had expected an argument, but he had not expected to lose it. There is no way you can prevent me from staying, David pointed out with infuriating calmness and even more infuriating accuracy. What a pity you aren't the original Ramses the Great. You could have me bound in chains and carried on board ship by your royal guards. They had retired to Ramses' room after dinner, supposedly to pack. Clothes were strewn all over the place, and both of them were sitting on the floor, glaring at one another. Marriage hasn't improved your manners, Ramses said rudely, or your sense of humor. What will Leah have to say about this? She is staying too, of course. She agrees you should not be left alone. Oh, for God's sake, I'm quite capable. David's quizzical, affectionate, amused look made him break off with a half-hearted laugh. I'm not, am I? You needn't remind me of how many times you've pulled me out of a sticky situation. But there's nobody trying to murder me just now, David. Are you sure? After a brief, breathless pause, Ramsay said... How much do you know? And how do you know? About your cousin? It doesn't require great intelligence to deduce it was he who produced Senia and her mother at a particularly strategic moment. He was trying to humiliate and hurt you. And he succeeded, didn't he? Beyond his wildest dreams. You may as well tell me the rest of it. You have no idea, David added. How much I enjoy saying that instead of hearing Aunt Amelia say it to me. If you saw it too, then it's not just my imagination. I began to wonder if I was going crazy. David, you can't know how much I... I don't have to say it, do I? No. You are too English, David said, smiling. Ramses was silent for a time, trying to get his thoughts in order. There was a certain irony in the fact that his conclusions were based almost entirely on what his mother would have called intuition. 
In this case, it was knowledge of a man's character, the way his mind worked. It left a track through the world. In Percy's case, the track was like that of a snail, slimy and sticky. I don't know how Percy found out about Senia, but he'd have gone back to the brothels as soon as he returned to Cairo. They are his natural habitat. The sight of her probably amused him a great deal. A little image of mother growing up in the slums of Cairo and destined for the same life as Rashida. An inarticulate murmur of revulsion from David interrupted him. His lips twisted. He hates mother almost as much as he does me. It was she who saw through his childish schemes all those years ago and told him precisely what she thought of him. Percy arranged that meeting in the souk, I've no doubt of it. What happened after that was my own fault. I should have gone straight to mother and father. But I thought it would be better. I would have done the same. No, you wouldn't. You aren't as stubborn and accustomed to going your own way. As it happened, I played straight into Percy's hands. At that time, of course, I hadn't the faintest inkling that he knew about Senia, or any reason to anticipate what he would do with that knowledge. It was only hindsight that enabled me to put the pieces together. No one else knows, David. Even Mother doesn't suspect, and I see no reason to tell her. There's no danger of his taking her in again. She despises him enough as it is. David nodded gravely. How did Kalan come into it? He owns those girls as a herder owns his cattle. If Rashida didn't tell him, one of the others did, about the Inglisi who had been coming round rather more often than usual. Kalan would assume there was profit to be made from that. But if he tried to blackmail Percy, he was sadly disappointed. They were brothers under the skin, the Cairo procurer and the fine English gentleman, and they struck up an alliance. Rashida would never have had the courage to approach mother and father on her own. Percy needed Kalan for that, and Kalan, of course, assumed he could get money from us. That was a serious miscalculation on his part. And perhaps on Percy's. Not that it mattered to him. He didn't care what happened to Senia. His aim was to shame me in front of mother and father and the fret. He knew what she thought of men who use women like Rashida. The morning we ran into him in El Wassa, she... You know about that, don't you? Nefret must have written Leah. David nodded. He avoided his friend's eyes, though, and Ramsay said, What else did she tell Leah? Well, uh, quite a number of things. Go on, Ramses. I'll stop you if you uh, cover ground that is already familiar to me. Did Nefret mention to Leah that Percy had been after her? Yes, of course she would. She never admitted it to me. She always thinks she can deal with everything single-handedly. But there must have been several encounters. She may not have told you about them because she was afraid of what you would do, David murmured. Possibly. Anyhow, what brought matters to her head was the day I came home and found Percy with Nefret. He was watching David closely, and he knew his friend too well to miss the signs of self-consciousness. Do stop me if this is familiar ground he said gently. David shook his head. He looked so miserable, Ramses took pity on him. Divided loyalties were hellishly unpleasant, and David must have been sworn to secrecy by Leah. About what, though? Surely Nefret would not have confessed, even to her best friend, that she had given herself to a man she didn't love. Surely Leah wouldn't repeat that painfully personal confidence even to her husband. At any rate, he had no right to speak of it. Choosing his words with care, Ramses went on. Well, there they were, you see. When I walked in, he had hold of her, and he was trying to kiss her. It would have annoyed me a bit to see anyone forcing himself on any girl, but knowing what I knew about Percy's habits, I rather lost my head. I knocked him across the room, and... Then Nefret grabbed hold of me and hung on. It was the only way she could have stopped me from murdering the bastard. But he wouldn't have understood that. He assumed she and I were... David waited for him to go on. Then he said, That would be a logical deduction, wouldn't it? 
to Percy it would. He doesn't understand friendship or disinterested affection. You could imagine the effect of that touching scene on a man so blindly vain and self-centred. He must have gone raging back to Kalan and set up the encounter for the following day. It's a pity you missed it. This family is good at melodrama, and that was a stellar performance by all concerned. David was not deceived by the mocking tone. Tell me, if you can bring yourself to do so. Mother didn't give you a word-for-word -word account? He couldn't keep up the pretense. Reaching for a cigarette, he was ashamed to see that his hand was shaking. David, she was wonderful. So was father. They believed me. How in God's name they could, I don't know. I must have looked guilty as hell when I saw Senia. And Kalan blandly announced she was my daughter. The resemblance was strong enough to carry conviction in itself. And then the little thing ran to me, holding out her arms and calling me father, and I... He tossed the unlit cigarette aside and hid his face in his hands. I know how poor old cowardly St. Peter must have felt, he said in a muffled voice. David put a comforting hand on his shoulder. You denied she was your child. It was the truth. Yes, but she trusted me, you see. And I, at least, I only denied her once. He passed his hand over his eyes and tried to smile. Some day I may be able to forgive myself for that. Lefret never will. It was the denial, almost as much as the accusation, that made her despise me. But, my brother, just let me finish, please. I had to claim Senia, to keep her from Kalan. Only a male relative could do that. Even then, mother and father never doubted me. But Nefret did. And you will never forgive her for that? Ramses did not reply. After a moment, David said, If she made a mistake, she has paid dearly for it. There is a reason, perhaps, why it was harder for her than for your parents. I wouldn't know about that. She always told me I didn't understand women. There's no question of forgiveness. How could I blame her for anything when she's so unhappy? I'd tell her so if she would let me. I don't even blame her for not wanting to see me. In a way, I was responsible for Geoffrey's death. And she loved him. I don't believe it, David said. She was fond of him. She was sorry for him. She was furious with you. And Percy. No, that's going too far. Ramsay shook his head vehemently. If Percy couldn't have her himself, he might settle for the lesser satisfaction of keeping her from me. But there is no way he could have known Geoffrey had a chance with Nefret. None of us did. And what about Rashida's death? You wondered too, did you? Ramses got to his feet and began pacing. I keep thinking I've plumbed the depths of Percy's swamp of a mind. Sounds like mother, doesn't it? But I've been wrong every time. I didn't even realize he hated me so much, or that he would go to so much effort to damage me. The business with Senia was weeks in the making. He must have begun planning it long before I found him with Nefret that afternoon. What put the idea into his head? Did something happen to set him off? Something I don't know about? Ramses, my brother. David was on his feet, his hand outstretched, his face distorted by emotion. It's all right, Ramses said quickly. Don't distress yourself. That was a rhetorical question. You can't comprehend Percy's motives any more than I can. He went to the window and stood looking out. The truth is, I'm afraid of him, David. He's got a mind so devious and dirty, it's impossible for me to anticipate what he might do. However, I'm taking no chances with Senia. Kalan wouldn't dare injure someone who is under father's protection. But Percy... Her father... That word had a new and painful poignancy for him now, and not only because of the little girl who had given him the love her natural father didn't want or deserve. His mother's blunt announcement about Nefret's condition had literally knocked him off his feet. 
a blessing in disguise, she had called it. I'll never know for certain, I suppose, Ramses thought. Perhaps it's better that way. But he was glad David couldn't see his face. Thus ends this excerpt from Manuscript H. I do not often trouble the Almighty with petitions, since I am sure there are others far more in need of supernatural assistance than I. I prayed that night, however, as I lay awake beside the sleeping form of my husband. His presence comforted me, as it always does, but my aching heart demanded further reassurance, hope that the future would be brighter than the sad present. There was no answer to my wordless request, but I soon fell asleep, and I dreamed. Well, Abdallah, I said, you warned me of storms ahead. If I had known how bad they would be, I might not have been able to face them. I don't know that I can face them now. The rising sun illumined his handsome, hawk-like features and the strong white teeth that shone in the blackness of his beard. Do you remember the snake, Sitakim? He who stole Emerson away and kept him prisoner so that we did not know whether he lived or not. I remember. As I remember, it was you who saved him, Abdallah. You did not lose heart then. Oh, but I did, I said remembering the night I had wept uncontrollably, huddled on the floor with a towel pressed to my face so that no one would hear. And then you went to the window, and after your long night of weeping, you saw the dawn. So you know about that too? Really, Abdallah, I'm not sure I appreciate this omniscience of yours. Is there anything about me you don't know? Very little. His black eyes shone with laughter. Hmm. What can I do to help them? Abdallah shook his head. How can a woman be so wise and yet so blind? It is well, perhaps, that you do not know everything. You would try to help, and you would blunder, Sit. You are not always careful. It was such a comfort to hear his old joking complaint and see the twinkle in his eyes. He took my hand in his. It was as warm and firm as that of a living man. The worst of the storm is yet to come, Sit. You will need all your courage to survive. But your heart will not fail you. And in the end, the clouds will blow away, and the falcon will fly through the portal of the dawn. The End You've been listening to The Falcon at the Portal by Elizabeth Peters, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends Other Worlds by Barbara Michaels, also narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalogue, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories and more. So to order another recorded book or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the telephone number on the back of the book. You can order by phone with any major credit card or by writing to us or by faxing us. 
don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse the catalogue, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune in to narrator profiles and author interviews. So visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader.